Mudra, can you stop the video? I want to test the mic and uh, video. So your mic is working fine. Hamza, there is a, a bandwidth problem. I can't hear you properly. Hello. I hope you can hear me now. Hello, this is uh, Giorgio. Hello. Hello. Hi, Giorgio. How are you? All right. Thanks. Thank you for Thank joining. You. So I will start in 20 minutes, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. Hamza, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. So, well, one last thing, I think... Uh, Is my voice clear? Yes, sir. Maybe हमजा आपके मेरी आवाज आ रही है ये अब ठीक है जी जी सर आ रही है आपकी आवाज बिल्कुल ठीक आ रही है ठीक है आई थिंक आई कंटिन्यू विद दिस सेशन ठीक है यस सर वी आर स्टॉपिंग द वीडियो यू मे स्टार्ट इन 1 मिनट
Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. Uh, on behalf of the organization committee, I welcome all of you uh, to the second day of the ITPLE, uh, 14th ITPLE International Conference on Open Source Systems and Technologies. Uh, first of all, we will play uh, the message of our worthy governor, Mohammed Sarwar, Mr. Mohammed Sarwar, and then we will start with the session. open source is bright and by using open source technologies we can take pakistan on a fast track towards development and prosperity in this context icast 2020 provides a unique opportunity for researchers and industries to come together for low cost and innovative solutions the government can gain huge benefits in developing a cheaper solution for e-governance and social services to better manage the resources and provide quality given to the citizens. In the end, I would like to wish the very best of luck to the organizers and participants of iCast 2020. Bismillah rahim I am sure that the future of open source is bright and by using open source technologies, we can take Pakistan on a fast track towards development. Sir, uh, sir, the video message has been completed. You may start now. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Kashim Bashi to introduce uh, Dr. Giorgio Queer. Giorgio, right, sir. Oh, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. My name is Kashim Bashir, Chair, ITPLE Council, Hot Chapter, Pakistan. Thanks for joining ITPLE, ITPLE Council Virtual Distinguished Lecture at 14 International Conference on Open Source System and Technologies, ICOS 2020. It is the second distinguished lecture arranged by ITPLE Council, Hot Chapter. I will tell you about ITPLE Communication Society. ITPLE Communication Society was founded in 1952. Later on, in 1972, ComSoc started its operation as an independent society of ITPLE. ITPLE ComSoc have 200 plus chapters in 142 countries and it have 25,000 members. ITPLE GlobeCon, ITPLE ICC are major conferences of ITPLE ComSoc. ITPLE ComSoc Lahore chapter have its sponsor event like ITPLE ComSoc Summer School, World Telecom Day, two international conferences, ICOS and Inming and multiple workshops. ITP Council Lahore Chapter is the founder of Comsoc Summer School in Asia Pacific Region 10. Mm -hmm. We have organized four summer schools since 2016. I would like to encourage you to be ITP Comsoc member. I hope all you will go to enroll for ITP Comsoc membership. We have a special offer for you. If you are ITP student members, then you have to pay only one dollar for ITP Comsoc membership. There are many benefits for ITP Comsoc membership. You can assess journal, ITP Comsoc magazine, attend conferences on discounted dates. 
for comsa student membership you can attend the comsa summer school you can also participate in the international student competition first prize is 2000 us dollar and ticket to attend global international conference in 2018 our itp comsa hot chapter member mr hamza itisham won honorary mention in this student competition i would like to thank mr ricardo vega member services director comsa international new cato vice president mga comsa for launching video program now we talk about today's invited speaker our speaker speaker name is dr georgio pure he has received his phd in information engineering from university of padova italy he is a senior member of itp and a distinguished lecturer for the itp communication society he is currently director of artificial intelligence and script research translation institute california usa the topic of the talk is variable sensor data to predict covid 19 let welcome dr georgio pure thank you thank you very much uh, for this uh, for this very nice introduction and um, i think i can start with uh, uh, with my slides can you hear me well okay uh, uh, yes we can hear you we can we can hear you we can also see your slides please go ahead perfect you can see the slide uh, uh, okay so let me start uh, so what i want to talk to you today is uh, it's really our um, main research at uh, the scripts research translational uh, institute um, towards the prediction of viral illness and covid-19 in particular so um uh let me start so um, as first of all um i would like to thank uh, the communication society and in particular three technical committees that uh, sponsored me um so far uh, to become uh, an IEEE distinguished lecturer the e health technical committee the communication system integration and modeling and uh, the technical committee on cognitive networks so uh, technical committees are a part of the communication society and um, i i i really share and and invite you um to join IEEE and the communication society uh for myself and for my career it has been uh, a really important step and uh, it really allowed me to uh, network with people worldwide and it's been a, a really big part of of my career so far and it is still a big part of my career so um let me start and i would like to start really uh telling a little bit how um how i started my research and how i arrived to uh to work with uh, towards this prediction of viral illness so my research started at uh, the university of padova uh in italy and uh, i started working on remote sensing uh, so i was working with um, a wireless sensor network and um um this was part of, i collaborated also with uh, the university of polo and finland uh, still towards the wireless network optimization and we are talking here about uh, the mac and the network layer uh, mostly uh, in 2011 um i moved to uh, the university of california san diego and um, i started working with a slightly different type of sensor it was a wearable sensor As you see here uh, this was my colleague uh, at uh, um, UCSD uh, he's working on one smartwatch and uh, um, another sensor on on his uh, chest uh, this was extremely interesting and eye opening for me i started realizing how many important signals can we sense and how can we interpret them this was really signal coming from uh, the inner part of our body and in, in particular here we were looking at the electrical signal from from our heart a lot of very interesting information there was indeed one major limitation that uh, uh, we were able to observe this uh, uh, the signal from a really small set of people maybe 10 people and uh, it was really difficult to make a change that was applicable to a larger population so this is why i am moved to the scripps research translational institute which is uh, still there in San Diego but an independent academic uh, institution and there uh, all of a sudden uh, i had access to hundreds of thousands of individuals um 
We are collaborating with uh, big companies that produce uh, wearables uh, and on one side and with hospitals on, on the other side. And uh, we really have uh, an opportunity uh, to get access to this large amount of, uh, of, of data. I'll, I'll talk uh, today about a large uh, data set of 200,000 individuals uh, wearing um, a wearable device or our COVID-19 study with 37 thousand individuals recruited for the study so far. So uh, I would like to start really uh, describing what is the big vision or the big mission that we have at, uh, at, at the Scripps Research Translational Institute. So uh, the key word here is digital medicine. Uh, by digital medicine, uh, we mean uh, a new type of medicine that is on one side of a uh, higher definition, so more accurate than the one that comes before, and on the other side, uh, which is for, far, far more individualized. Uh, what does individualized mean? So we're going back to the, to the, to the real origin of uh, Western medicine, uh, by Hippocrates 2,500 years ago, uh, he himself says that it is more important to know what person the disease has than what disease the person has. Uh, what does it mean? It is more important to understand the individual, the characteristic of the individual. And it is a key aspect before we can really understand uh, uh, if the individual has an illness illness and what is the illness and how can we cure it. So um, this concept of an individualized medicine is, is, is a great concept. It's, on the other side, it's basically impossible in, in modern medicine. Um, a physician, speaking about the US, I think it's the same more or less everywhere in the world, has no more than, say, five or ten minutes to look uh, for each patient. And it is really impossible that in this short amount of time, he or, or, or she can, can really understand uh, the, the characteristics of the individual. This is why we advocate for the use of wearable sensor that can track an individual for a very long amount of time and artificial intelligence on the other side that can provide an automatic interpretation of this data and can synthesize um, a small amount of data that uh, can can go to the uh, to the physician, and so um, and and I want to stress that uh, this is a concept I think that would be extremely valuable all around the world, um, uh, no matter um, you know what the hospital system is. Uh, these digital sensors are becoming uh, more and more. Um, they're more cheap, they are uh, accessible really for, for everyone, and um, they can become a great tool to really uh, also save money for uh, medicine and uh, provide a better care for everybody. Um, but we'll see more during the talk. Uh, for now, I would like just to, uh, to stress the fact that um, to, to make this change happening, um, we need clinical researchers who have driven, uh, of course, medicine so far, but at the same time, we also need technical experts like us. Um, we need computer scientists and we need uh, that, that can interpret, that can process the data, and we need engineers that can really work in the development of better and um, you know, less expensive, on the other side, uh, wearable sensor for, uh, for everybody. So um, let me start with, uh, with one of these three, three key aspects. Uh, let me start talking about artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence is, uh, is changing right now uh, the practice of medicine. So um, I start with, uh, with an example that uh, we published actually um, a few years ago. Um, a radiologist yes, is an important physician uh, and he's looking at about uh, 10 million images over the course of, of his career. That's what we estimated. A dermatologist is looking at about 200,000 skin lesions 
um, skin lesion is something like like you see on the uh, on the top right figure here. So um, this this important clinical figures uh, spend most of their career in looking and interpreting images. Uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence now can do a fantastic job in automatically interpreting images. These are two key examples. Um, uh, on the one side, um, this, um, this orange uh, figure here is basically uh, the internal part of, of your heart. Uh, this is a retinal fundus image. And um, this, is, uh, uh, this image is key uh, to detect diabetic retinopathy, which is um, uh, a very serious uh, illness that uh, uh, it is very important to be, um, to be detected on time. Now, um, uh, it has been shown how artificial intelligence can detect uh, diabetic retinopathy as accurate as uh, a US board certified ophthalmologist. So the clinical figure that really need to look at those images. So uh, it has been shown and demonstrated that they can do as well as an ophthalmologist at, at potentially at no cost. On the other side, um, a very similar story uh, on the other paper here on the left, uh, also in the detection of skin cancer. Uh, artificial intelligence can do as, as well as um, a board-certified dermatologist in this case. Uh, both these examples uh, share uh, one key aspect. Uh, they, they are based on a very large data set, uh, um, 128 or 29,000 images, well labeled by physician. So uh, we need a huge amount of data to start with, but after the algorithm is learned, potentially it can go on detecting diabetic retinopathy or on the other side, uh, 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 skin cancer, potentially forever with, uh, with similar images uh, that are collected in the future. This is not the only uh, point. Um, we can also go beyond what a physician is able to do. And uh, this is a maybe a funny, but very really important example. That's um, uh, another paper um, that looked at uh, uh, retinal fundus images uh, for diabetic retinopathy. And uh, as part of this research, they looked also at um, the possibility of determining the um, the gender of this um, of these individuals based on the uh, retinal fundus image. Now, um, this may say, may look strange, but um, an, an an ophthalmologist, so an expert in this, is not able to distinguish between a retinal fundus image from from a male or from a female. Uh, while AI uh, is, has been shown to be really good in this distinction. Now, why is this important? Well, this is showing that AI can do something more, can learn something more. And the feature extracted here that may be different based on gender also, may be also reused for um, a better care of the individual. So uh, these are great examples on classical application of artificial intelligence in the interpretation of images. I would like now to um, do a step further, uh, more closer to what we uh, do at Scripps Research, and uh, look at uh, another type of signal, the um, single lead uh, ECG, or electrocardiography. So this is the electrical signal from your heart. And uh, the goal here, is uh, to detect uh, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a, an abnormal rhythm of your heart, so your heart basically starts beating in an, an irregular fashion. And um, very often it comes with no symptoms. Um, about a third of the people who have um, atrial fibrillation are not even aware that they have AFib. And uh, it is very common, especially for people um, of 65 years old or, or older. And uh, it is very important to be detected. Uh, basically, it comes with a 
very much a fivefold increase, uh, so five times the risk of stroke. And on the other side, um, it uh, it can be cured. So um, a simple anticoagulation therapy has been shown to be really effective to decrease in decreasing the risk for stroke. So um, how do we detect it? Um, there has been um, a few great studies. Uh, this one is from uh, some colleague in the group of Andrew Eng at Stanford that showed um, how uh, with a really uh, complex convolutional, 34 layer convolutional neural network, starting from a huge data set of 60,000 uh, um, ECG signals, uh, they've been able to basically classify um, very well the signals in 12 different classes depending on the specific heart rhythm. Um, so this was um, a great work. Uh, an even deeper work um, has been done uh, a year ago uh, from the Mayo Clinic, an important hospital in the US, and they, they looked at uh, um, a few hundred thousand uh, ECG signals um, this is a 12 day ECG signal, so a type of an exam that uh, you can do only inside a hospital. And um, they look at this ECG signals and they try to predict atrial fibrillation. So they observe an individual in, in normal sinus rhythm, so without any uh, evidence of, um, of an abnormal rhythm. And uh, they try to predict a future occurrence of uh, atrial fibrillation. So uh, this was uh, really exciting and there is a lot of discussion still in the clinical world if uh, um, uh, what does this really mean? Is, is this because some of this individual potentially have uh, some more serious heart issue or, uh, or is it really predicting uh, the occurrence of atrial fibrillation? And, um, and in my group, uh, sorry, well, this is uh, in, in my institute at Scripps Research. Uh, we have done um, a, a study towards a direct-to-participant uh, trial. We basically sent this sensor to people at risk, and we figured out how many of these individuals we are able to, uh, to detect with, uh, uh, with atrial fibrillation. And it was... Um, a, a good success, I would say. We've been able to detect 4% of people that then uh, uh, took care of themselves and started um, and went to the doctor. And uh, many of them have been prescribed with an anticoagulation therapy. So um, the idea here is really to prospectively looking at people at risk and trying to prevent uh, uh, any bad outcome due to um, atrial fibrillation. And uh, in, in, in my group uh, itself, uh, we looked at uh, the effectiveness of a deep learning uh, representation in, uh, again, the detection of atrial fibrillation. So we started with uh, a data set of 6,000 uh, 30 second uh, uh, ECG signals classified in one of these four classes. Uh, so a normal sinus rhythm. So, um, let's say everything good, atrial fibrillation, other type of arrhythmias, and uh, finally a noise signal. So um, some errors within the detection of, of the signal. All the signals have been uh, in the, uh, collected with, uh, with a small device, a small uh, commercial device that you can see on, on the left here, um, a cardiac device. So, um, uh, what did we do? We tried to compare uh, two approaches. On one side, uh, what we called a clinical or an expert-based approach. So we looked at the, the features that, uh, that make sense to a cardiologist, uh, the type of features that a cardiologist would look for to detect uh, um, atrial fibrillation. So we look at uh, the heart rate, the heart rate variability, and several parameters about the morphology of the signal. So, so really studying the shape of, of the signal. And on the other side, uh, we decided to apply uh, a deep learning approach. 
So we decided to let the deep learning really uh, figure out how to classify this, uh, this signal. Now, um, there are two main methods, uh, if you want, uh, to, you know, to apply this approach. On one side, we can start from the, uh, the signal uh, from the single ADCG. We can transform the signal in a time frequency representation, so basically an image, and, and then analyze the signal. That's the very colorful image you see here. On the other side, and this is the approach we have chosen, we can directly uh, uh, input the um, single DCG signal uh, into the deep learning architecture. And uh, this was advantageous for us as we we start to think that uh, we we will not potentially just record, uh, just analyze a 30 second ECG signal, but potentially a continuous uh, ECG signal. So we need a more flexible um, architecture. So we have chosen the second one. And uh, I'm just mentioning here, what are the most interesting results? Mm -hmm. So uh, let's look first at the, the top right. So here uh, we are um, analyzing uh, the performance of five different um, deep learning uh, um, architectures. And if you're interested, uh, I'll, I'll invite you to, uh, to look at the paper that, that I just mentioned here. And um, we are comparing these five architectures over four different dimensions. On the score, on the top right, uh, so basically the accuracy of the model, then we are comparing them in terms of memory and computational efficiency. So how much memory is needed and how much computation do we need really to run this architecture? And uh, the, the fourth one is, in my opinion, the most interesting one. It is the data efficiency. Uh, this means basically how much data do we need uh, to learn a proper representation and have the best performance. This is extremely important. Uh, if you remember, um, we have mentioned that some of this study uh, required 120,000 uh, well-labeled uh, images. This is a lot, and it's extremely expensive in clinical work to really uh, store and, uh, and label, uh, having a physician labeling so many images. Uh, so if we can learn from a much smaller data set, that's much better. So that efficiency is extremely important. So uh, we have chosen here, uh, based on all these parameters, MobileNet as the, our preferred architecture. And we compare it, um, as you see on the bottom left uh, figure, uh, we use the precision and recall uh, um, representation. Um, and uh, we compared uh, a deep network, uh, this deep network of architecture in blue and uh, the expert feature uh, in, in orange. So a perfect classification uh, would basically reach uh, the, the, the top right of this figure. And uh, we see here, uh, what I, I, I believe is really, really interesting, really what is the gap uh, in terms of performance accuracy between the, um, the deep network and uh, mm -hmm. the clinical um, or expert features. So we know how much we can learn in term we can uh, gain in terms of accuracy using a deep network. Now there is a, pr a price to pay in, in, in doing that. So um, let me see here. So um, the idea is. Uh, uh, let's look at this question uh, that, that really explains it. So uh, this is actually a, a real question that, uh, that still clinicians are debating about. So is it better to have uh, a fully explainable algorithm? So an algorithm that make a diagnosis, but also highlight the reasons for this diagnosis. Um, but this fully explainable algorithm has an 80% accuracy. So it's accurate, it's correct eight times out of 10. Or is it better to have a black box approach? So a, a fully you know, closed um, approach without any explanation, 
uh, that, that indeed is able to provide um, a diagnosis which, is, uh, which has a 95% accuracy. So um, this is a really interesting question. And um, uh, the, 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 of course, the highest the accuracy, the better. But explainability is really important. As at the very end, it is the clinician, the physician, who needs to make the final decision uh, to uh, you know, um, believe or not believe uh, a specific diagnosis and and you know provide a cure to the uh, to the individual. So um, we're trying a middle approach here, and this is uh, I'm just presenting. This is an ongoing work. We are looking at global explanations and local explanation, all um, so defined post hoc explanation. So we use the black box and we try to explain the results um, at the end. We we'll try to explain in general what the deep learning is looking at, what part of the signals are important, and in particular in the local explanation for a specific signal, what are the areas of the signals that really trigger uh, the deep learning decision. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a really fascinating um, direction for, for future research in deep learning applied to, uh, to the clinical space. Um, but let's go even closer to, um, to, to the final part of this talk, which is really on the prediction of, uh, of viral illnesses. So we've seen how AI can be, you know, can make medicine and can make diagnosis much more accurate. There is indeed another aspect here that we should consider. For example, atrial fibrillation uh, is something that is uh, so this abnormal rhythm of the heart can come and go. Usually, it lasts for a few minutes or potentially um, a few hours, uh, but then it disappears and come back again maybe um, a few weeks later. So, if we go to the hospital and uh, and get uh, an 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 AFib, uh, well, get an ECG. The ECG inside the hospital lasts for exactly 10 seconds. So most likely uh, we are missing um, an event of atrial fibrillation. Ideally, we would like to monitor an individual continuously. Now uh, we can do it uh, with, uh, with wearable devices, uh, with, with a smartwatch. Uh, we can now monitor the heart rate continuously and potentially forever um, and and possibly also without any effort by the individual besides of course the individual needs to uh, remind to, to recharge the, uh, the smartwatch like like the smartphone every couple of days so um let's see a little bit what we can do here and um, i want to point you immediately to a very fascinated work um that um, has been uh, done by uh, by Apple. Um, mm -hmm. Apple decided to look for the identification of atrial fibrillation, and uh, they recruited four hundred thousand individuals uh, wearing an Apple Watch, and uh, they followed them for about eight months, and they've been able to report four hundred cases of um, newly uh, diagnosed atrial fibrillation. Now, 400 is not a lot. It's basically one in a thousand uh, of, of this number of individuals. This is mostly due to the fact that uh, um, that uh, this set of individuals are usually young and healthy individuals. So it would be really interesting to, to do the same study with another population. And potentially, uh, we can really make an impact there and really help these individuals figuring out if they have uh, atrial fibrillation. And just to mention, a very similar study has been done in the same period by uh, Huawei with 200,000 individuals and um, I think very similar uh, results. So, um, well, uh, we have seen um, AFib and uh, let's see what else can we do with, uh, with these wearable devices. And um, this, this image here is, uh, is um, as a young guy, actually, that is uh, in the hospital for um, a polysomnography exam. 
Now, uh, a polysomnography exam is, uh, is a standard clinical uh, exam for monitoring your sleep and figuring out any type of problem during your sleep. It's a really deep exam. Um, it um, consists in one night at the hospital where there's lot of cables all over uh, your body and especially your face. Um, um, I covered it here, but uh, you really have sensor uh, attached anywhere to uh, into your face. And um, well, it is you know, quite expensive. Um, I put there um, a potential um, cost for the healthcare system uh, in the United States, an approximate one. And um, most importantly, it has big limitations. So it's a really deep and really precise, uh, but it is actually only one night of sleep. And it is really not your normal sleep. This is one night. A little bit. Uh, one of this cable uh, goes um, out of position and the nurse need to enter the room, fix the cable, and uh, you know, wish you good night for uh, for the hundredth time, maybe. So, um, what are the alternatives? Well, the alternative uh, that that they look for is uh, the one of wearable sensors, and um, this is a study uh, we have done um, in collaboration with. Uh, with Fitbit that provided data from 200,000 individuals that uh, were wearing um, a smartwatch for um, about two years. So we looked at, you know, potentially hundreds and hundreds of nights of sleep for, for each of these 200,000 individuals. And uh, what I'm representing here in the figure is the general result of the uh, mean amount, the distribution of the mean amount of sleep for, um, for, for these individuals. So uh, you see the result in green, and we see that most of these individuals sleep around seven hours, and a few of them sleep eight hours or, or, or more. And uh, we're comparing it here with um, uh, the CDC results. The CDC is um, an, an agency in the US um, that really overview everything regarding um, regarding health. And uh, so what the CDC uh, does every year, they um, interview by phone uh, 400,000 individuals and among several questions. Uh, they ask uh, how long do they think they slept in the previous uh, in the previous nights. And uh, we see here that uh, individuals potentially really overestimate the amount of sleep they, they had. And uh, there are several people who said that they slept uh, nine, 10 or more hours, where, where we didn't find anybody really sleeping for so long uh, uh, as measured by the wearable device. So, um, well, how, what else can we look um, in, in this sleep? So, um, I first invite you to, to consider a different, um, and a deeper potentially look at, at the sleep beside uh, the, the total amount of sleep over a night. So these are uh, in the top figure here. There are four individuals. And this is the distribution of sleep for each of this individual uh, over the course of, uh, of the two years of uh, of, of the study. Now, um, we see, uh, let's start from the individual on, on the right. So um, he's sleeping most of the time, um, as you see here, around six hours. And uh, for, for certain nights, he's sleeping much longer. So most probably during the weekend, he's sleeping much longer, eight or nine hours. Uh, if we look instead at the one far on the left, um, well, she is sleeping really anywhere between uh, between five and ten hours. Most likely, this is a college student that, uh, uh, and uh, we know that uh, they have a really disrupted sleep. Uh, there is one night that they can sleep really, really short, maybe for the exam, and maybe the night after they sleep extremely long, uh, nine, ten hours or so. 
So um, a really different pattern. And uh, the second from the left here is that uh, it's an individual with a really regular pattern sleeping regularly around seven hours. So uh, beside the fact that they all sleep on average the same amount, but they have a really different type and variability in, in, their, in their sleep. And in, in the bottom here, we see uh, an interesting result that we just published uh, um, this year um, in, in a clinical journal. So uh, we show here uh, the, uh, the body mass index, uh, which is represented basic, basically of the weight of, of an individual. And uh, we try, we, and on the uh, y-axis uh, for the first figure, we have the mean sleep duration. So we see that people that are really overweight tend to sleep uh, less. So they sleep um, a shorter night. And these are results for, for men and women. Uh, women are in this light blue. And on the right here, uh, we still look at the body mass index as a function of the variability of the sleep. And so how different is the amount of sleep based on different nights? And uh, we see a really similar result that for people that who are um, overweight, so who have a high body mass index, uh, they also have a really disrupted uh, so sleep or, or a real a high variability in uh, how they sleep. Uh, so one night they may sleep, let's say, six hours, the night after, say, eight hours, and, and so on. So big differences for the different day of sleep. So. This is uh, just to give you an idea of how rich the sleep signal can be. And uh, let's look at another one, which will be another key component of uh, uh, our prediction of viral illnesses. So the cyber signal is the resting heart rate. This is the heart rate that, it, that is measured by um, a wearable device in the moment before uh, we wake up in the morning. So this is representative of um, really your heart rate when you are at rest, quiet at rest, just before waking up in the morning. Now, um, this value changes a lot uh, between different individuals. And, um, and it is really characteristic, I would say, of, of an individual. Uh, an individual, you know, may have, uh, there are individuals, as we see in the figure here, this is a distribution of all the individuals. Some of them have a resting heart rate, which is below 50 pulls per minute. Some others have a, a much higher resting heart rate of 80 or 90 pulls per minute. Now, um, all of them are, are normal, um, but they contain still a lot of information. Uh, let's see an example here. So these are three individuals, um, C, D, and E. And um, in, in the x-axis, we have months. So this is over the span of one year. Uh, the individual on, on the far left, uh, individual C, has a resting heart rate of mm -hmm. around 67 uh, pulls per minute. And as we see here, this is quite constant over the course of the whole year. Uh, it never goes, and this is again, one value per day before waking up. And uh, this is never really much different than 67. It can go down to say 66 and up to maximum of 70, um, but quite constant around the average value of, of 67. Um, the, the one on, on the far uh, right instead, um, this is um, a women, and for women in particular, the resting heart rate is, is changing monthly with a periodicity of, of 28 days. And um, we see that, uh, we, we see this, this, this pattern going up and down uh, on a monthly basis, and uh, we see this, this peak actually uh, around month 11, um, the, the resting heart rate is much higher. And we see a peak also for the individual in the center figure that goes up to 80 pulse per minute or more. So what is happening 
in, in that particular weeks. Well, um, before we will really figure this out, uh, I wanted to um, discuss that there is also a seasonal pattern in the resting heart rate. So uh, it changes with season, and this is, uh, again, results averaged over the 200,000 individuals. Uh, we can see that uh, the resting heart rate is, uh, is going down. It reaches a minimum in the middle of the summer, between July and August. And it goes up, and this is at least for individuals in, uh, in the United States, it reaches a maximum uh, by the end of December, which is the end of the, um, the Christmas season in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and then it, it starts to go down again uh, in, in a year, yearly periodicity. So, um, well, we observe uh, a bunch of other things. It depends uh, pretty much on age. Um, so it can go up and down with depending on age. Uh, it usually increases until age 50 and then it decreases. Uh, it changes with, uh, with BMI. Again, people overweight have a slightly uh, uh, higher uh, average resting heart rate. Uh, but let's see in particular this, this peak that, that I mentioned before. So let's look at the figure on uh, the bottom right here. So this is an individual uh, with a resting heart rate of around uh, 64 uh, pulses per minute. And um, on the x-axis, we have the days. Uh, so this is a span of about three months. So the resting heart rate is changing day by day of, of a very small amount between 64, 65, 66, down to 62. So nothing not noticeable. And then around day 50, it starts to increase significantly and it reaches 80 pulse per minute. It stays there for about um, about two weeks and then really decreases down to the, the normal value for that individual. So what does that mean? Um, well, we started uh, uh, an hypothesis that this is due to um, an infection, um, an, an illness for, uh, for this individual. And uh, to be bright clear, um, 80 pulse per minute is, is, is nothing to worry about. There are individuals that normally have 80 pulse per minute or, or even 90 pulse per minute uh, as their average resting heart rate. Um, if I go to the doctor and say, well, I have 80 pulse per minute in my heart rate, and the doctor will say, well, that's totally normal. There is nothing to worry about. Um, the point here is this is really unusual for this individual. This individual has an average resting heart rate, which is around 64, 65 pulse per minute. 80 is a really unusual value for this individual. And so we started this hypothesis that is connected to, um, to, to an influenza-like illness or a viral illness, and uh, we have proven it with, uh, with our data set. So uh, this is a great work uh, from uh, my colleague, uh, Jennifer Reagan, and uh, she looked at, uh, at this data uh, from, from this individual from Fitbit, and she correlated this data with the rate, so the percentage of people with an influenza-like illness uh, on, on a daily basis in, in California and, and in Texas on, on the bottom figure. And she showed, uh, she demonstrated that there is a high correlation between uh, you know, the number of people that show this abnormal uh, heart rate and uh, uh, the number of people that, uh, that needs to get cured because of an influenza-like illness, so that needs to go to the doctor to get cured for that. So um, she showed somehow that this data is highly related to um, the, the, the possibility of having an influenza-like illness. So um, this was extremely interesting, and this results came out in, uh, in January of this year, and uh, this was uh, and this was based, of course, on data that, uh, that we studied for a couple of years before uh, the publication. And um, in, in January um, of this year, these 
huge pandemic of COVID-19 started to uh, really spread around uh, the world world. And uh, these are, I'm focusing here, um, of course, on data from uh, the United States uh, where I live, but I know this is a huge problem all around the world. And uh, on, on the left here, we saw that back in the month of April of this year, COVID-19 became the first cause of death in the United States, uh, more than heart disease. And uh, we really hope that things were getting better this summer, but uh, back then, this is data on December 3rd, uh, we reached uh, 200,000 cases. I think now we have 250,000 case, new cases per day. Uh, more than 100,000 individuals are currently hospitalized and about almost 3,000 people are dying in the United States alone of, of COVID-19. The similar situation is spread um, uh, all around the world and um, in particular in Europe where, where, where I come from. So um, what can we do? Uh, what can we do to stop this, this pandemic? Um, well, I, I've seen um, very often here in, in, in shops in, in the United States that they measure fever before you enter the shop as uh, as if, if if they can somehow uh, spot who, who has COVID-19. Fever indeed is not a great tool to spot COVID-19. About 30% of people, this is a study uh, published in May of this year, uh, about 30%, so three, out of, uh, three or four out of 10, uh, really show a significant fever. Uh, and these are people that have been tested positive for COVID-19. And uh, more importantly, um, this is a great study from my colleague, uh, Danny Oran. Uh, we have shown that uh, there is a huge percentage of a symptomatic individual with COVID-19. Uh, we're talking about uh, anything between 40 and 80% of individuals with COVID-19 are totally asymptomatic. And this is huge, right? Because these individuals are not even aware that they have COVID-19 and they can spread the virus uh, to their family, to their friends or their colleagues at work. So how do we get to know that these people have COVID-19 and how mm -hmm. can we suggest them to you know, pay attention and not to spread this virus? There have been a couple of very interesting study all around the world. Um, the first one I want to mention is uh, this one from the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. Uh, they have now uh, almost 600,000 individuals that decided to donate their wearable data for this study. Mm -hmm. And uh, they reused, um, actually, they, are, they have been collaborating with, uh, with asset scripts and they've used some of the methods we developed to uh, follow the spread of the virus uh, and uh, basically calculate or estimate the number of people that have been affected by, by this pandemic and in, in real time in, in Germany. And uh, this is instead our study. Um, this is uh, um, a study uh, is called uh, DETECT. It's done by um, Scripps Research. Um, you can find a little bit more information in detectstudy.org if you're interested, or uh, you can look at, uh, at our publication in Nature Medicine, uh, which have um, just uh, just been published uh, about um, about a month ago. And uh, after our publication, a couple of other uh, groups actually um, presented their results uh, uh, from Stanford, and uh, there is also a group from uh, Scripps, sorry, from Fitbit uh, itself, that uh, um, presented a very similar result, uh, validating at the very end what, uh, what we proposed. And uh, our study works in, in this way. We have uh, an app that uh, allow the user to um, share uh, their wearable data uh, from their Fitbit, their Apple Watch, or any type of uh, um, smartwatch. And uh, at the same time, 
it asks a few simple questions um, about symptoms. Um, so a person who starts to feel any symptoms can report the symptoms there and possibly can share the data from their Fitbit. Uh, the app is uh, well, well designed by our colleague at Care Evolution, and uh, so it is. It is really interesting. It's not an app that blocks your phone. It's uh, extremely lightweight, and uh, so many people can download it, uh, consent to share the data, and basically forget about the app. They they don't need to really do anything in, for the app. So this is a view of, uh, of our participants. So we have about uh, now 37,000 uh, participants around the United States that decided to share uh, their data uh, for, um, for this research. And um, we're trying to expand now also outside the United States. Um, we have a uh, first study in, uh, in Australia and hopefully also in other parts of the world very soon. So, uh, what is the main uh, result of this uh, of this study? Well, well, we looked at uh, um, two types of data: self-reported symptoms and tests. Um, so, if someone went uh, had a COVID nineteen test, can report it in the, he can report it in the app. On the other side, we're looking at wearable data along three main dimensions: the resting heart rate that we have seen very well, and the in the previous study, the sleep, the amount of sleep uh, that we have also studied and uh, the amount of activity for that individual on a daily basis. And for example, we can take the total number of steps. Um, first step, we looked at uh, the um, symptoms and uh, we have noticed that there are some symptoms that are much more common for COVID-19. We look here at COVID-19 positive and negative individuals. So people who tested positive uh, uh, for COVID-19 or who had the test and tested negative. Um, in the positive are in orange, the negative are in blue. And among the, the many symptoms here, we see that, for example, the difficulty in breathing has a much higher percentage of people that tested positive, uh, about 40% uh, of the total reported uh, difficulty in breathing. And uh, even more significant, the decrease in taste of smell. Uh, this is really peculiar for people who tested positive for uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And we used all this data uh, to do our detection. So uh, here I represent our results in, um, yeah, as an area under the curve and the sensitivity and specificity uh, figure. So on the top, we see, we looked at each of these parameters separately, and we say by looking at changes in the resting heart rate, how good are we in detecting, uh, in discriminating between symptomatic individual positive or negative to COVID-19? And we did the same with sleep and activity. The approach is pretty much individualized. So for example, for sleep, we first calculate for the individual what is the baseline, the expected amount of sleep per night for that individual. And then we look at changes. And uh, if there is a really significant change, we said that, again, something is happening and we use this value to really discriminate between COVID positive and COVID negative. We, then we put all three parameters together, and that's the bottom uh, left figure uh, sensor. Um, so this is uh, the performance we obtained by putting all three together. Uh, we also looked at uh, the symptoms alone, uh, the self-reported symptoms alone, and we reused a great work actually from Christina Menni uh, on the paper uh, cited here. And um, we basically used the same algorithm validated uh, um, her work. And we got an area under the curve of 0 0.71, which is not bad. The maximum is, uh, is one, that's a perfect uh, discrimination. And then uh, we look at the two measures together, so the sensor and the symptoms, and we arrived at an area under the curve of 0 0.8, which is uh, quite impressive here. So, uh, what does it mean? Well, it means that we are able to correctly identify approximately three out of four people that are positive 
and we correctly identify as negative approximately three out of four of the negative. So it's not a perfect discrimination, but it's really good enough as, as a first look at, uh, um, at these individuals. It can tell the individual that they are potentially at a higher risk of having contracted COVID-19 and can really invite these individuals in, in you know, uh, having a COVID-19 test, or if that is not possible, they did pay particular attention as they know that they may be at high risk of having contracted COVID-19. And so they may want to, to really try to avoid uh, contact and interaction with, uh, with their family, their friends, or, or their colleague as much as possible. So it does not substitute a test, but it really comes before a test and can follow an individual, again, continuously uh, for, for a really uh, long span of time. Uh, day by day, you can tell, oh, you, you may be at risk today, or you may, everything is, is quite normal, so don't, well, don't worry. So um, this is the conclusion uh, of my talk. I hope I have not been uh, uh, over, over the time. Um, I wanted to go back really to the initial uh, concept that I wanted to bring today, the one of digital medicine. Uh, we have looked at the three main pillars uh, on, on one side from a clinical side, this personalized medicine, this importance in looking at the individual and from the individual uh, being able to do a diagnosis. And we have done the same really for our COVID-19 detection as we look at the individual, calculate the baseline for the individual and look at changes with respect to the baseline. On the other side, um, two main enabling technology, the one of personal sensor that can passively and longitudinally monitor an individual. Uh, so over time, without the need of the individual, doesn't need to do anything uh, for that. And on the other side, artificial intelligence, which is really the only way we can analyze this huge amount of data and extract the right information for, um, for the clinician. Once more, uh, a big change in this area can only happen with a tight collaboration between sensor engineers on one side, computer scientists and AI experts on the other side, and then clinical researchers, these three figures need to work together uh, to really come out with something something new and, and valuable uh, for the future. And uh, these are a couple uh, really of, of the papers that, that I discussed today with you. Um, at the beginning, um, the paper on uh, AI in, uh, in medicine, uh, the use of long time series in medicine, then a bunch of paper on atrial fibrillation, and our work on atrial fibrillation with uh, uh, using deep learning. And at the bottom, uh, if, if you're interested in that, uh, I can also suggest uh, this paper we wrote on how to, uh, to do a transparent reporting of artificial intelligence algorithm in medicine. So how to be really effective basically in describing your AI algorithm uh, as applied to, um, to medicine. And uh, regarding COVID-19 and wearables, uh, these are the main papers I've been discussing. So um, the first two papers are an overview on resting heart rate and sleep as collected by wearables. And then we look at the COVID-19 detection paper. Um, so how we can use these wearables to detect COVID-19. And uh, there are a couple of, uh, of other papers on COVID-19 that, uh, that I mentioned over the talk and uh, that I reported here. And um, I think this um, concludes my, uh, my talk um, that, that has been, I mean, it, it is a great honor for me and um, I'll be very happy to continue the discussion and answer if there are any, um, any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I'm Dr. Usman. We have several questions from the uh, uh, listeners. 
is my voice clear to you yes yes it is uh, okay, thank okay, you okay great. okay great so there are so many questions so uh, let me start from uh, one by one so sure okay okay so first one is uh, maybe a basic question uh, like uh, you have uh, mentioned two of problems for example the first one is it a classification problem or a regression problem so um the the uh, well, you can reframe them in, uh, in any way. Um, what we usually do, what we are usually interested in is, uh, is a classification problem. And uh, I think you're referring to the case of, uh, of atrial fibrillation. And, mm. and uh, what we're really uh, interested in there is to basically provide a diagnosis. Um, so basically say, yes, uh, I'm detecting atrial fibrillation or not. So uh, this translates into a classification problem, which is similar in fashion to, um, to the case of diabetic retinopathy or skin cancer, in which we need to say, yes, no, there is an issue or um, the patient is healthy. And same here, we need to say, looking at ECG, is there a fib or no, the patient is, uh, is okay. Um, these are, um, I would say, but a more classical way to um, to approach uh, to approach that. So it it turns out to be a classification problem, and um, that's easy also to compare with uh, the out outcome that a clinician would give. Okay, another interesting question. The next one, I hope uh, yes. it makes sense. Uh, the next one is about uh, you mentioned several deep learning models, starting from LXNet, then ResNet, MobileNet, and yes. different sort of things. So. Uh, uh, from your study, it, uh, it looked that mobile net is the uh, best uh, network for your specific problem. Yes. So, uh, uh, what was the assumption behind that? Because as far as uh, uh, the question is that mobile net uh, does it deal with the large amount of data also? Like since ResNet is uh, being used mostly in the research domain, this ResNet one. So uh, here your results. Um, should have, sorry. Yes. 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 Yeah, um, so uh, this is the, um, this is the, the the figure, and actually I would refer mostly to this figure here on the top uh, on the top right. So um, there, this um, uh, I, I should have stressed it probably during the talk. This depends a lot, of course, on the very specific uh, application here. These are um, five architectures that have been modified uh, to be able to receive. Um, and the input uh, a one-dimensional signal uh, in our case, um, in our case, the single DVCG. Uh, in this case, um, in particular, in the, in the data efficiency, we see that um, well, ResNet seems to be seems to perform really closely to uh, MobileNet in, in in orange, um, but we still see uh, for our metric that uh, MobileNet is performing a little bit better. Now. Um, this does not mean um, at all that uh, mobile net is better in any way than rest net. Uh, it just means that uh, mobile net is performing uh, slightly better than, than rest net and this parameter uh, for this particular application and uh, in the uh, particular implementation that, uh, um, that, we have, uh, that we have worked with. Um, so, uh, I would suggest if there is a, a specific interest in, uh, in, 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 in this aspect, uh, to get a look at, uh, at the paper is, um, is yeah, mentioned here in this slide. And uh, we have um, a deep description really of uh, how we uh, implemented the, the, five, uh, the five architecture. So um, I, I'd really suggest um, to, to get a look there. And uh, uh, if there is a, if there are still questions, of course, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, I, I wanted to mention before, actually, um, this is my email address and uh, this is also my Twitter account. Uh, so if you're interested in this topic, um, please contact me in the Twitter account. If you have a specific questions on some of this work, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, okay. to go deeper okay. into that. Okay, thanks. Uh, so there are some other questions. I think I should be a bit quick now. So, okay, uh, since most of the uh, data you showed in your slides, it looks like sequential data. So in deep learning, we have like, uh, uh, you know, uh, algorithms for dealing with sequential data like RNN, LSTM. So 
have your group worked on these domains also or uh, on okay okay so maybe you can give some link or we should try yes uh, sure yeah I, I didn't present any work in that direction here um especially because the uh, well, the, the, the real time series we got at the beginning on on, uh, uh, on the AFib problem were uh, of, of a limited length, no more than thirty seconds. So we didn't really need to uh, to use this uh, this methods. But uh, we are currently actually investigating uh, similar type of signals. Uh, so um, uh, single ADCG, uh, but that instead of a couple of of a few seconds, they last uh, two weeks. Uh, so two weeks of data sampled at five hundred uh, hertz. Uh, so this is a huge amount of day of sequential data, and uh, yeah, we are using uh, that kind of uh, of methods um, like a LSTM. Uh, but yeah, I didn't present okay. it here as that's mostly ongoing okay. work. Okay, sir. So, okay, so there sure. is a strange question, uh, but it it is like mm -hmm. this one. Uh, like uh, it looks like an established technology. Like okay, so the question is, as you gave example of Apple Watch, Huawei Watch, yes. Mm -hmm. So. If uh, they are already in the commercial phase, then it looks like an established established technology. Like mm -hmm. they are in commercial phase, so they are established technology. Then how we decide that? What are the research directions? If we have to start working on these directions, so uh, what? Well, yeah. How, yes. How we will combine research with these established technologies? Well, um, uh, that's a great question. Um, the uh, these are established technology, and uh, I just to mention, I'm, I'm wearing a, a bunch of the sensors, and as I'm trying many, many of them. So uh, research here can happen at different, uh, at different levels. One is the development of these sensors, and yes, they are established technology. But I can assure you that they are coming up with more and more uh, parameters uh, to be measured. The the new Fitbit watches for the first time uh, measuring also the single EDCG like the uh, live core device or uh, what Apple uh, tried to do um, a couple of years ago. And uh, this is uh, just coming out, but uh, well, what can we do more uh, now? Uh, can we measure other type of parameters? Temperature is becoming more and more interesting. Uh, another company, uh, this guy's from Aura, uh, they are trying to basically combine all the technology of a smartwatch inside uh, a ring, for example. And uh, so uh, that is to say there is a lot really to be done in, in the sensor world. Uh, uh, and these companies are really leading that because they have you know, a huge um, yeah, a, a huge capacity really to, to innovate and to have a lot of engineers working in this space. On the other side, a totally different but very interesting type of research is how do we use this technology? So this is where I uh, see it mostly. So how can we uh, use existing technology like this and how can we provide value in the clinical world? Uh, so this is really going to the analysis of data collection of, of this large uh, data set and extraction of relevant information. That's another huge area. It's not for sensor engineer now that's more for ai type of engineers but still uh, extremely okay. valuable so there is space really for everybody i think and, and this uh, okay okay yeah. okay so uh, thank, thank you for the answer so there are still some questions but i will uh, directly go to the last one because i think it looks very interesting to me too like sure uh, are psychological factors uh, useful or uh, uh, what do you understand they should be catered for while we are developing these sort of technologies or they are already there, like psychological data. Uh, for example, I would say, is psychological data added or not in the sleep graph you showed? Uh, showed? Like you showed so many graphs there. So uh, do you think that psychological data will have some effects on this one? So psychological data, you mean uh, really the, the, the status of the individual, right? Uh, yes, how the yes. individual is feeling and so on. Yeah, they are. Um, uh, this is another actually a really interesting question. Uh, this is uh, definitely true and uh, um, there are a lot of factors um, the status of the individuals how the individual is feeling um, uh, you know even uh, how much uh, as a silly example maybe but uh, if one evening uh, you are eating a little bit more 
uh, than, than usual, well, um, say you have a, a big dinner or something, uh, most likely your resting heart rate the day after is affected and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's increased. Um, so, and you know, if you're really stressed at work or if you are overtrained, maybe you are running a marathon or something, uh, these are all factors that uh, that can uh, that can affect the resting heart rate. So, uh, these are big things that we need to keep in mind, and uh, we are trying to integrate there. Of course, this is not something I can measure. Uh, I can only look at the wearable data. So, the only thing is, I can be mindful that there can be other factors, not only um, an infection or viral illness, that can affect this uh, this parameter. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I need to know that they can be there and try to do the best to, really to um, avoid making a, a false call um, because okay. of these factors. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I want to thank you again. And we have a, a like virtual sheet that uh, for you too. So that's all from my side. So uh, I hope uh, Abbas can uh, now uh, upload the sheet for you. Thank you very much. This is fantastic. And uh, I want to, again, thank you everybody for attending my talk. And uh, um, feel free to contact me um, if you have uh, further questions or, or follow up if you're, really, if you're interested in these topics, follow me up on Twitter. That, uh, we try to uh, you know, publish the, there the most recent results on a, on a daily basis. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So uh, we will uh, proceed for second talk of the of uh, today's session. So uh, our second speaker is Mr. Seiler. Uh, he is an expert from Huawei Middle East Cloud and AI Business Development Department, and he has been responsible for Ascent Ecosystem Development and techno Technical uh, Sales about the Ascent Ecosystem, and. Uh, his talk will focus on ascent to pervasive intelligence in today's talk. So uh, without further delays, I would like to invite Mr. Siler to present his talk. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Siler. You're welcome. And uh, we are uh, looking for an energetic talk from your side. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, can, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, it's visible. Uh, is it, it's visible. Please start. Okay, okay, okay. So let's begin. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sela, and I'm from Huawei Middle East Cloud and AI Business Department. I'm responsible for Huawei Ascent AI ecosystem development and uh, technical sales. Today, the intelligent world is unfolding rapidly with pervasive computing and intelligence. It is my great honor to be here today and thank all of you to take part in this presentation. I would like to join you in taking a look into AI, where it is today and where it will be in the future, and then use Huawei Atlas intelligent computing platform to all of you. Everybody is talking about AI but how AI can help us to make a better life. Let's, let's go to take computers, for example. Computers are the fundamental things of our modern life. Everybody has a computer with you, some type of computer, your cell phone, the small compact device has the computing power equivalent to the big super giant computers decades ago. Demands for computing power are expanding from the data center to more severe areas. 
computing power is moving deeper into our daily life and more industries. The computing power has also greatly improved. For example, the computing power of the most advanced smartphones has reached a trillion operations per second. In data centers, computing power has reached excess care. This leads to demands for pervasive computing. And uh, thanks to Moore's law, we are enjoying the free launch of Moore's law for decades. But sorry, free launch is over because of the limitation of physics. Innovations of heterogeneous computing <coughs> architecture will break the bottlenecks and advance Moore's law. We are hitting different wars, power wars, memory wars. Those kind of challenges are preventing us from moving forward. So we need to shift from general purpose computing to kit or genius computing. Simply part, structured data is a database, which is logically expressed and uh, implemented in a table structure and strictly compliant with the data format and the length specifications. Unstructured data does not have a predefined data model and cannot be represented by database logic. Image, audio, and video information is unstructured data. According to the prediction of Huawei Global Industrial Vision 2025, by 2020, 80% of data growth will come from unstructured data. Data is growing rapidly, but the growth of computing power is facing challenges. Cheap level Moore's law is weakening. For unstructured data, we need heterogeneous computing power by components such as FPGA, GPU, and NPU to maintain the Moore's law the system level. And currently, in specific fields, AI is approaching or exceeding human capabilities. For example, for image classification, the algorithm model has exceeded human capabilities. AlphaGo defeats Go Masters Ni and Kujie. These have become classic events in game decision making. Also, with their recent rapid development, BERT models have surpassed human in reading comprehension ability. While these examples indicate that AI algorithms have reached precision ready for large scale use, we need to innovate our own architecture. We are using domain specific architecture to make a better computer for AI. And we are also making breakthroughs in AI algorithms. It says that you are in making natural language processing. What those kind of things used to be things to be thought as a human only thing are now conquered by AI. Should we feel terrified by those kind of technologies? No, AI is under control and we are using AI as tools to help us to make a better life. And we can say AI nowadays is playing as a new general purpose technology. AI will drive social development dramatically. We believe that AI will be a general purpose technology, one that will have a significant impact on human beings. Just like farming, the steam engines, the electricity, and the internet, AI is one of the first century and will have a profound impact on the future of mankind. We all know that Huawei is a leader in this industry. We are connecting everything together with low latency, high bandwidth, 
network, wireless network, everything. What those kind of connectivity create values? Also create tons of data. Those kind of data will require AI to process them. Regarding breakthrough technologies, the commercial use and the deployment processes go side by side. Let's take 5G as an example. 5G technology is being put into large-scale commercial use in 2020, which also provides the conditions for the explosive development of AI. 5G will greatly improve the transmission capability. This enables some scenarios where AI was not 5G will greatly improve the transmission capability. Where AI was not able to be applied before. Such, such scenarios, including autonomous driving, industrial automation, smart grid, VR, and AR. In other scenarios that require high bandwidth and low latency, AI was difficult to use in the past. However, with the arrival of 5G, these scenarios become possible. And uh, now we are on the verge of an innovation explosion. Why? First, data growth. By 2025, the total amount of data generated by human beings will reach 180 zettabits, which is four times the current amount. Second, the computing power has extended from data centers to the edge. By 2025, there will be 150 billion intelligent devices connected to the networks, a near five-fold increase from now. And the third, the popularization of intelligence. Currently, AI computing accounts for less than 10% of the total workload in computing centers. But by 2025, AI computing will account for 80% of the total workload. Those kind of data, any connection will push huge intelligence. Even a small device like your watch, like television, like your refrigerator will have intelligence. Intelligence will help us. However, there are challenges that pre uh, prevent us from making progress. The first thing is that the shortage of talent, shortage of experts. The supply demand ratio of global AI talent is only 1%. Only, thir only 13,000 experts can develop core code. The talent gap is by millions. The second thing, Computing is still very expensive. For example, if you want to pre-train the popular AI model, such as a bird, that will cost you almost half a million US dollars. That is very unacceptable. Due to insuffic insufficient computing power, some AI applications cannot deliver the expected effect. And the AI model training process is slow and was a low penetration rate. Currently, there are less than 4% of industries that have used AI technologies to conquer those changes at Huawei. They provide you a first stack solution. And uh, currently, the AI stack technology is becoming more and more mature. So in this second part, I will introduce you some honest AI computing power provided by Huawei. And uh, we can provide this solution to unlock boundless possibilities. <coughs> and Huawei is engaged to provide the most powerful AI computing solution to enable the intelligent transformation. There are two solutions provided 
uh, intelligent edge solution and the data center solution. They will help you not only training your models, but also deploy your model to different devices to make it real. The two solutions are powered by our advanced Ascent processor. Ascent processor has an innovative Huawei Dafenqi architecture. This architecture ensures the ultimate performance of each Ascent processor. Currently, we have two processors, Ascent 310 for intelligent edge solution, while Ascent 910 for data center solution. With Ascent 310 processor, Huawei developed Atlas 200 module, Atlas 300 inference card, Atlas 500 AI edge station, and Atlas 800 AI inference server. These products deliver super computing power at edge with a low energy consumption, enabling edge applications in other hand. Atlas 300 training card, Atlas 800 AI training server, and Atlas 900 AI cluster is powered by Ascent 910, which is two times computing power of our industry counterparts. That means our data center solution has remarkable advantages on computing power and the energy efficiency. In addition to the hardware, we also develop a series of fundamental software, including chip enablement component, can to our chain, which can promote device edge cloud synergy and release ultimate hardware performance. Also, Huawei has released our framework Mintswall to boost the AI developer. But we still support the TensorFlow, the PyTorch, and other framework. Huawei aims to enable industry digitalization and help customers to achieve business success by combining platforms, AI, and ecosystem. Huawei AI solution has already been applied in all lines of business and industries. We can take this for example. We are preparing all the resources that are needed for AI. We are preparing different AI models. We give these models to the developers and to the partners, to the researchers, to the public. We and now contribute our intentions to make AI more popular. And we are trying to reshape industries by giving out all the resources we have. Basic AI applications include image classification, target detection, and something like this. These applications can be used in industry-specific scenarios to transform the industry and improve work efficiency. For example, we can apply intelligent product quality inspection for the manufacturing industry, transmission line detection for electric power, bill recognition for finance, ads recommendation for internet, and intelligent customer service for the career industry. In one word, Huawei provides the open, simple, and trusted AI solutions with ultimate computing power, better energy efficiency, open and easy to use, secure and trustworthy. So let me introduce the Dafenqi architecture. It is the bedrock of the ultimate AI computing power. It's mainly based on the convolutional neutral network model, and about 90% of the model is based on matrix multiply operators. The cube computing unit is the most suitable. For the traditional GPU, it is not designed for AI computing. Therefore, it is inefficient in matrix multiply computing. But in the Dafenqi architecture, 
for the NPU is especially designed for the AI computing and provides cube, vector, and Scala computing units for AI computing. The architecture has a large promotion of cubes, enabling high matrix multiply computing efficiency and optical uh, and optimal every to efficiency ratio. Based on this uh, architecture, we have the several uh, AI computing products like the Atlas 300i, the most powerful inference card for video analysis. The computing power per card is 1.33 times them of peers, and the channels of video analysis per card is two times them the partners. For the Atlas 300T, is the highest performance training card. The operations per clock cycle is 130,000, and the lagger boards with both long and short holes. Also, we have the Atlas 200 AI accelerator module. It's the intention analysis at the edge with actual no power consumption. The energy efficiency is six times than our windows. And uh, it can provide two tops computing power per watt. And also by now, we are having an, we are having an ICT innovation competition in the Middle East. We have invited 10, uh, we have invited 12 teams from the top universities of the Middle East to take part in this competition. We give the training of the technology of this hardware Atlas 200 AI module. And then the, the, the students from the teams will give out the project based on this by programming and give out the applications. In Pakistan, it includes the University of NIC and uh, NCAI and GIK. In of the of the Atlas 900 AI cluster, it is the industry's first fully liquid cooled AI cluster, and the PUE reduced is by 30 percent. For the industry standard AI uh, standard AI cooled cluster, the PUE is 1.5, but for Atlas 900, the PUE is less than 1.1. Based on all the hardware. The device edge cloud collaboration enables the ultimate development and the user experience. For the unified development, the traditional industry solutions use different development architectures. Models cannot transfer freely, requiring secondary development. But for Atlas, the unified development architecture based on DaVinci and Ken. Develop once, deploy it everywhere. For the unified OM, the traditional industry solutions have no OM management tools, provides only API, so customers need to develop API by themselves. But for Atlas, we provide Fusion Director manages up to 50,000 loads, manages central and edge devices, and remotely pushes models and upgrades devices. In aspect of the enhanced security, the traditional solution has no encryption and decryption engine. Models are not encrypted, but other solution has transmission channel encryption and model encryption, double assurance the security. And it is also openness at different layers, enabling industry AI applications. It provides easy-to-use programming model interfaces and examples for industry customers, and also provides unified programming interfaces for professional customers and uh, decouples the development environment from underlying hardware, making programming easy to use and releasing hardware performance. And also it is very Trustworthy AI platform from chips to systems. 
For the chips, the chip has a built-in trust root, one key per device, ensuring model security, and uh, authorized specific devices and valid periods of models to protect the internet's uh, interests of AI model owners. And for the trusted systems, it has dual node hot backup, heartbeat connections, data synchronized every 100 microseconds, and the automatic failure within two seconds upon fault, ensuring always on service. And uh, the management tool, fusion director for remote monitoring and management. management. Our AI solution features a 9.3 person low LCLT for the same computing power. And uh, we are always the first users of the products we build. We use the AI solution in our daily working, like in the production service for the smart manufacturers in our factory. And in our daily communicating tool, internal IT tools such as WeLink and the WeMore, which is Huawei online market. And we also apply this solution in the products and the solutions. By now, almost have 43 services powered by Ascent is applied in Huawei cloud <coughs> AI solution. And uh, more than 100,000 devices have run stability for three years. So AI in power industry. In this part, I will, we will see the cooperation between Huawei and the developers and get the successful solutions we have provided in the industries. Huawei as in the ecosystem grows with our partners. Huawei provides as in the program for partners, including the consulting and the solution integrator. Independent software integrator, independent hardware integrator, cloud service provider, original equipment manufacturer, origin design manufacturer. A comprehensive incentive mechanism is supported, like the learning phase, development phase, launch phase, and sales. Encourage partners to release independent ecosystem programs for Ascent and enjoy the rights and the benefits of both ecosystems. Huawei strives to build the computing bedrock of an intelligent world. We work with partners from various industries to build a prosperous AI ecosystem. In China, we have established partnership with 100 universities to enable university developers. In Europe and other parts of the world, such cooperation is also going on. In terms of enterprise-grade applications, we have worked with partners from many industries to co-innovate and pr produce some excellent use case cases. We have manufacturing partner startup, MacMind and Advantech, and the healthcare partners, AGS and E2 Healthcare. And our partners have also shared their best practice of using AI in the public. Huawei has rich industry experience with the strength of top SV. Over 100 top SV have cooperated with Huawei and provide more than 120 joint solutions. In smart city solution, we have facial recognition, radio structuration, vehicle recognition, electronic case file solution. In manufacturing, we have industrial quality inspections solution. In transformation, in transportation, we have free flow tour system, highway video cloud, vehicle inspections solution. In energy, 
We have smart grid checks, smart substations, smart customer service centers, smart gas station solutions. In finance, we have smart branches, financial OCR solutions. In internet, we have precise recommendations, content analysis solutions, and uh, in healthcare area, we have corridor 19 diagnostic solution. AI is applied in every industry area. Let's go to see some case of the successful AI solution. This is the SKA project. Humanity is building the largest scientific installations in history. The SKA project is one of the largest scientific projects in human history. Currently, 30 former member countries and more than 100 organizations participate in the project design and the development process. SKA will be used to probe the dawn and the dark edges of the universe. Study galaxy evolution, cosmology and dark energy, search for extraterrestrial civilizations, and study the origin and the evolution of the cosmic magnetic field. Once completed, SKA will become the largest scientific project on the planet. But there are many challenges. SKA generates data traffic that is several times that of the global internet. About 600 PB data is achieved every year. The massive amount of astronomical data is far beyond the limit of the current computing power. Therefore, powerful algorithms and hardware devices provided by AI are required. Huawei and the Shanghai Astronomical Observatory joint, jointly explore the application scenarios of AI in astronomical research. To solve the classical problem of star clarification based on the observation data of the SKA pilot project, radio signals are converted into images. Through image segmentation and pre-processing, the observed astronomical data is converted into visible image data. The deep learning method is used to train the AI model of electrical satellite recognition. And more than 200,000 stars are found in the observed sky data. It takes astronomers 169 days to locate and identify the types of stars in the southern hemisphere. Our ascent cluster service based on ASAS 500 with super computing power can complete this task in only 10 seconds. And this is the case of the electric. Shenzhen power supply of China Southern Power Grid and Huawei jointly developed power transmission video surveillance devices at the edge. The devices integrate as well as 200 AI accelerator modules and use AI inference algorithms to perform on-site image and video analysis and produce a large property. A training and inference system was deployed at the power main station for continuously optimization algorithm models, remote model delivery and uh, development, and the fast system upgrades with the management software. Throughout their career, a Power 9 inspector may travel as far as the equator. The roads may be rough, and the transmission towers are tall, making the inspections both labor incentive and dangerous. 
by using Huawei's Atlas-based intelligent inspection solution. China's southern power grid no longer needs to rely on manual power line inspections. This solution can also provide real-time warming and the accurate reporting. And based on this solution, the operation efficiency increased 80 times than before, and the system cost decreased 30 percent than before. Okay, this is uh, one case of the healthcare AI powered COVID 19 di diagnostics in Italy. This is a big event in, uh, in 2020. And the year 2020 will be remembered as the year the novel COVID 19 swept across the world and impacted our public health systems as well as our daily lives and work. The virus has inflicted a huge mobilization in a short span of time, which imposes huge pressure on the medical systems of many regions. As a result, the medical industry is looking for ways to improve and expect that uh, diagnosis and the treatment. It is inevitable that the use of AI-empowered medical technology can contain the virus and save more lives. The medical di diagnosis and the evaluation using CT images are important to preventing and controlling the spread of the COVID-19. At the peak of the pandemic, the number of patients in hospitals every day usually surpasses the maximum treatment capacity of the hospital. This means that not only are most departments overwhelmed, but hindered by traditional city technology which is not capable of providing fast and accurate diagnosis. Specifically, the system processes image frozen compared to historical images and describes impact before generating an analysis report for radio notices. In normal settings, conventional diagnosis technology takes 10 to 50 minutes and uh, delivers an accuracy rate up to 90%. However, due to the limited medical resources and heavy workload of doctors, this feature may decline in practice. Consequently, this impacts the future treatment of suspective cases, false negatives and confirmed cases. At this critical juncture, Huawei works with medical partner to find a way forward. In March 2020, Huawei and Advanced Global Solution, AGS, <coughs> an Italian-based enterprise, jointly launched an AI-based medical image diagnosis system to supercharge the diagnosis and the treatment for COVID-19. This diagnosis solution runs on the AI fundamental and the ultimate computing power of the Atlas 800 server and Atlas 300 inference card needed in a wide range of intelligent functions, such as intelligent city image reading, automatic classification, multicolor rendering of lessons, and uh, intuitive comparison of baseline histograms combined with the AI image diagnosis system and the expertise of doctors. The solution quickly identifies the symptoms of patient with COVID-19 within two to three minutes and evaluates the treatment effect with an accuracy rate over 98%. The fast and accurate diagnosis is crucial to the treatment 
of pandemics like the COVID-19. With the ASAS based intention solution, doctors can determine the treatment scheme as soon as possible and allocate medical resources based on the severity of the disease, providing effective and timely treatment for patients in crucial in critical condition. And this is one case in the manufacturing, <coughs> the intention made in China. How is Southern factory? AI enabled quantity inspectors at the workstation, production line, and the workshop level. While we cooperate with partner to provide the AI computing center solution with Atlas 300i and apply this on 80 more than 80 production lines, covering servers, 5G terminals, and other products. The quality inspection workers on each production line reduce from 6 to 2, and the inspection accuracy increased from 90% to 90.9%. Then let's go to the inspect of the transformation. In China, the state council has decided to animate the, the highway provincial tour station within two years, and the Ministry of Transport has demanded that the mission should be achieved within this year. The validation of highway provincial tour station can not only improve traffic efficiency, reduce not logistics costs, and realize fast tour collection without stopping, but also deepen the tour highway system reform and serve the strategy of strong traffic. Cancelling provincial tour stations will face the restructuring of tour collection models and technologies, which is actually a typical scenario of digital transformation <coughs> in the transformation industry. In the long run, cancelling provincial tour stations and building a large number of ETC gantry systems will also be the key in instruction for the vehicle road, collaboration, and automatic driving. To meet this requirement, Huawei provides a free flow solution for charging. It provides smart cities, provides smart sites on the Grand Tree tour station slide. It integrates Atlas AI Edge solution, uh, station, Tyson server, storage, switches, and the power supply to employment fast deployment and delivery. In addition, Huawei AI full stack capabilities are supported. Collaboration advantages of native Quimple applications. The servers on the edge and Atlas AI edge station employment cloud edge collaborations with Tyson servers in the cloud-based provincial networking center. Models are trained on the cloud and pushed to the device. Implementing online AI model upgrade meets the requirements for national networking, cloudification, standard construction, unified OM management, and continuous service evolution. And the last case is about the Pengcheng Cloud Brain. It is a large scale information technology facility in the AI field. It is a basic research platform for exploring the mysteries of AI and building advantage, advanced AI technologies. It supports basic research and exploration in the AI field, such as computing vision, natural language, autonomous driving, smart transportation, and smart healthcare. Function Cloud Brain has 100 P flops. AI computing capability. By 2020, Hongcheng Cloud Brain 2 will achieve 1,000 PB level AI computing power and become a leading AI research platform. It will be used in autonomous driving, city brain, smart healthcare, speech recognition, and natural language processing, and so on situations. Pengcheng Brain 2 is generally 
built by the library and Huawei. Lata's 900 cluster with Pongchen and Ascent processors provides abundant computing power and develops key technologies of the cloud brain at the 1000 P level. Huawei is, <coughs> Huawei is providing our AI technology to the open public to help. And we are trying to make the foundation of the AI digital world together with you, together with Huawei, together with AI. We will make a better life and we will make a better world. Uh, thank you. That's all my presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Seller, for the wonderful talk. So uh, mm -hmm. I think, uh, we have some questions. So uh, maybe uh, participants can directly ask. Uh, for example, Dr. Amir has some questions for you. So Dr. Amir, over to mm -hmm. you, please. So thank you, Mr. Seller, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so my first question is that um, uh, here, students are hearing your talk. Uh, so uh, uh, what kind of uh, resources uh, our students can use from these uh, uh, hardware that you have mentioned? For example, can do you have any uh, research program where students can use Atlas 800 uh, for the compute? Uh, yes. Uh, for, for all this hardware, we have two kinds of solutions. One is for the best solution. It's mainly focused on the inference. So you can use this Atlas 200, Atlas 300, and Atlas 500 for the inference. And for the data center solution, uh, it's mainly focused on the training. We have these products. They are mainly focused on the training. So once you ha you train the models in this training platform, and then you can use you can apply it in the inference for the edge solution. This, uh, this, this Atlas 200, 300, and five, uh, 300 are the cars, and the 500 is the station. The cars, you can just uh, insert them into the servers and make the server to be an AI server. And we also have the Atlas 200 DK. It is an integrated uh, developer kit which you can use it to develop the applications in all the situations, uh, scenarios. Uh, another similar question regarding uh, Atlas 800 and Atlas 900. So uh, are they available for uh, all countries or they are classified for a few countries? Uh, they, they can use it in all countries, but by now, uh, because the AI ecosystem build is just as the first entry, so the cases are mainly focused, uh, mainly in the country, uh, in China. But by now, we are promoting these AI solutions all over the world, and also in Middle East. We just have the GTEx, uh, we just have the GTEx meeting, and in the in the meeting, we have showed our solutions, and uh, and in the next year we will focus on the ecosystems of the AI environment. And we will also want to research for more partners, for more ISV and for more uh, native partners to develop the solutions together with Huawei to, uh, to get more successful cases, not only in Middle East, but also in the world. Uh, so one more question is regarding the transportation uh, solutions. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, uh, technology can be used in uh, in like free toll or uh, in some other way where the traffic is uh, congestion is removed. So what about the uh, the use of AI within the vehicle itself, like within electrical vehicle? So are there any solutions from your side that can be used in electrical vehicles? Uh, in <clears throat> yes, in the vehicles, I think most of the focus one is uh, uh, car number recognition, and one is auto automatic driving. You can use the Atlas, uh, uh, use the AI solutions in the vehicle to for the recognition, uh, automatic driving. So firstly, I think you can put the models in the training platform, and then secondly, you can use the you can uh, you can use the inference solution in the in the car, and then once it recognizes the ob objectives in front of it, 
such a human, such a animals, it will take the, the respective actions. Such, such, such situations like that, not only for the inference, but also for the training. To avoid the traffic jams and to, to avoid the traffic accidents. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Dr. Amin, uh, I think we should move ahead. So, uh, Mr. Seiler, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, we have a virtual shield for you too. So, please uh, accept okay. it from our side. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, this is just uh, uh, like a note of thanks from our side. So, uh, hopefully, if we have some other questions or uh, participants have some questions, uh, we will be forwarding them to you in future too. Okay. 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 Thank, okay. thank, you, thank you once again. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you. Once you. Again. Thank you. Okay. So, participants, our uh, last speaker for today's first session is Dr. Junaid Kadir. Uh, he is director of Asan Research Lab and chairperson of Electrical Engineering Department at ITU, um, which is uh, housed in Alpha Green Tower, Punjab, Lahore. So he has established or he has published more than 150 review paper articles at various high level journals and magazines such as IEEE communication magazine, IEEE journal on selected areas in communication, then IEEE communication surveys and tutorials, IEEE transactions on mobile computing. Uh, he was also awarded the highest national teaching award in Pakistan for the year 2012 and 13. And he has been appointed as ACM distinguished speaker for three year term starting from 2020. Uh, he's also a senior member of IEEE and ACM. So basically his talk for today, today is ethics of artificial intelligence. So uh, as the name suggests, it's, it looks very promising talk. So we are hopeful uh, for your uh, like uh, uh, valid participation and active participation. So uh, Dr. Junaid, uh, please start your talk and uh, we welcome you once again. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, your mic is off, I think. Uh, sir, Junaid, your mic is off. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me now. Uh, yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Usman, Dr. Amir, uh, for the invitation. I am honored to present before you, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Usman, my name is uh, Junaid Kader. I currently serve in the Information Technology University and the topic of my talk today would be the ethics of AI, which is a very hot topic these days. And I will uh, try to introduce you over the next 40 minutes about the promise and perils of AI and what are the things that we should be careful about and how should we think about the bigger picture surrounding the implications of artificial intelligence on the society. So um, I think um, it is already uh, obvious to most participants in this uh, conference that machine learning and AI has been a huge success, uh, particularly in the last decade or so. And it has uh, transformed many industries, including uh, the financial industry. Much of uh, modern trading is done through algorithmic methods, uh, and they are automated techniques that leverage information from the social media and from various information sources. And then they make automated decisions. And all of this is done through algorithms. Similarly, uh, there are things that were previously thought to be impervious to algorithms such as uh, object recognition, understanding what is contained in an image, understanding language. These are, all, these are all now problems that are tackled by AI and uh, the application of AI uh, is now not only in some fringe applications but it is in, uh, basically it is affecting almost all of the uh, sectors of uh, human society. Uh, it is now being used for important decisions such as uh, who will get the job. For example, in hiring, people are making use of machine learning. Uh, people are making use of machine learning in decisions such as uh, who will be left out on bail because in the, um, uh, in the criminal system, 
people are sometimes uh, sent out on parole uh, based on the prediction that they will they have reformed and they will be good citizens in the future these are all very important decisions that impact uh, human lives very directly uh, and there are other examples such as self driving cars in which um, obviously this has a lot of promise because uh, all around the world there are uh, many deaths that happen due to human accidents so it is obviously um, something desirable that we eliminate this uh, you know cause of uh, accidents because of humans but at the same time we should anticipate what will be the effect of uh, the introduction of this technology and um, so it turns out that technology is a double edged sword whereas it creates a lot of opportunities we must also anticipate the ways in which it can backfire and uh, kevin kelly who is the founding editor of wired has an interesting quote on this and he says that eventually every new technology will bite back the more powerful its gifts the more powerfully it can be abused and um, so people who have been following social media recently they know some of its positive sides for example in the uh, post covid era the internet has been a savior for many sectors uh, in particular the education sector currently we are having an online presentation this is enabled through technology but at the same time uh, looking over the last 4 or 5 years as we see uh, the penetration of technology in all spheres of human life we also see the fruits of uh, um, the technology are also sometimes better for example technology even though it connects people it can also polarize people and uh, algorithms can also be used systematically for oppression and for reinforcing inequality so uh, in another work uh, there is a center known as center for human technology and they have documented the various harms that can arise from technology uh, so because this uh, focus is uh, the the focus of my talk is on uh, the ethics of ai uh, i will not i will not talk too much about the uh, benefits of ai there are many benefits of ai and we should not diminish them but because this is a short talk i have briefly mentioned the various benefits of ai but now i would like to focus on the various um, harms that can arise and then i will talk about how can we go about um, creating a future of technology in which we have more benefits and the harms are contained to a large extent so for example uh, one harm related to the use of technology is the cause of systemic oppression amplification of racism sexism and uh, it, this happens because on the internet uh, most of the algorithms work to create communities that are very much like each other so you have this uh, this is known as homophily within the group you have a lot of similarity and uh, uh, many platforms such as facebook twitter they have features in which they recommend um, people to connect to and because of this uh, it tends to create a very polarized society and uh, some people call this a filter bubble and the problem happens uh, when people make use of these social networks to get all of their information uh, because of this filter bubble a bubble people are only exposed to one point of view and they are not connecting to other people and um, also they get a distorted view of reality so because everything is so personalized when you go on to some portal like facebook or twitter the news that you will see will be tailored to your interest and it will be tailored according, according to what you would like to see and so because of this this has um, this has affected the ecology of information and most of the information that we now see online is uh, you know based on sensationalism it is um, it is exaggerated and because of that we have um, the first problem listed here 
uh, it has become difficult to make sense of the world because of problems such as misinformation, conspiracy theories, fake news. Unfortunately, this is a side effect of how technology is currently working. The business models that we use, the technology that we have, uh, the social norms that we have, and the lack of regulation. Also, in terms of social relationships, again, we see that it is a double-edged sword. It can be used to connect people, but often real connections that uh, happen due to physical contact, actual authentic people-to-people uh, -people connections are replaced by their proxy, which are online based. And because of this, you have less empathy more confusion and possible misinterpretation and um, you know this um, algorithm driven social media some people call it a hype machine uh, there's a recent book on this topic by uh, senan aral uh, he's a professor at mit and he calls this uh, social media the ai driven social media a hype machine and because of this uh, people are losing hope in having democratic systems because now there is no common sense of what the facts are and um, different groups believe in different facts uh, there is no dialogue the dialogue is distorted because of the propaganda and uh, technology is also having a huge impact on the next generations because these are the first people who have been uh, intrinsically born in an in an era that is technology driven so they are growing in um, in an era in which everything is being recorded everything is being uh, analyzed and people are performing before people so if they come on social media they want to appear um, you know impressive to people so that they can be liked uh, and uh, this is how technology is like nudging people towards uh, certain ends which are not desirable psychologically and this is affecting therefore their physical and mental health. Uh, more details can be seen um, uh, by visiting the site Center for Human Technology. They also have a new documentary which has been released uh, around a month ago which is known as uh, The Social Dilemma. This is on Netflix. And this goes on to describe these problems and more issues, especially related to AI and the uh, hegemony of the corporations, um, the big companies, and how much control they have. So um, again, now coming to AI in particular. So most of the AI algorithms, they are um, basically optimiz optimization driven in which the algorithm is given a goal to achieve and now the problem with this is that if um, you just give uh, an end goal to an algorithm or some AI model it will just get you to the goal but it will not care about all the other things which you have not specified and there is uh, a story in uh, mythology uh, known as the King Midas problem. Uh, you might have heard of some variant of this in which a person uh, was given, uh, you know, he had this wish that everything he touched would turn into. And uh, so he was granted this, but because of this, uh, uh, you know, his food turned into gold his uh, leave him happy because uh, you know uh, his wanting to go was to be uh, supplemented with other things that are automatically part of human values but because that was not specified you know for in other words, this implies, especially in the context of machine learning, that once you specify an object and you do not specify explicit constraints, then uh, it is as if you're saying you don't care about it. But th that is actually not true. 
in many cases, because of such myopic focusing on just the end goal, what turns out is that although you get the goal, you research in the last few years is to have human-centered AI so that the AI that you have does not conflict with human values and because specifying human values is difficult and uh, so there is now research in which people are working on human compatible AI. This is known as the value alignment problem and this is uh, very nicely described in a new book by Stuart Russell called Human Compatible. So you might recognize Stuart Russell as one of the authors of the uh, perhaps the most famous book on AI, which is uh, taught as a textbook uh, in standard AI courses, uh, along with Peter Norwich. He has written the, the AI AI and the problem of control, in which he gives an example of an issue that can arise if we have a value alignment problem. He says that suppose you task a super intelligent AI with the mission of curing cancer the soonest possible. So if you just specify this, uh, the straightforward way that the AI model would use would be to go through all over uh, the medical literature and it will come up with different hypothesis of what treatments we can use. And obviously, if your goal is to find the cure the soonest possible, then, then you would have to test it on people. And then it will, uh, because the goal is to do it in the uh, quickest time possible, it will actually induce people with cancer so that it can try out the treatment on different people and whichever works well, you know, it can then uh, finalize that. But the clear uh, thing that we can observe from this is that we do not want to uh, inflict harm on people. Uh, in fact, in the uh, older times in which uh, the biomedical field did not have strong ethics, uh, there were cases like this. So there is a famous uh, case uh, which became uh, uh, notorious for highlighting the ethical problems. This is known as the Tuskegee syphilis problem. Uh, syphilis is a disease um, and uh, bec uh, because the researchers wanted to test out how different treatments would work. So they basically used people without informing them and potentially gave them um, you know, harmful drugs. They did not give them the best drugs that were possible just in the, in the so-called service of science. But it has now become uh, like clear that this is unethical. So um, clearly from this uh, example, we see that it's not just sufficient to cure cancer as soon as possible. We also want to ensure that while doing this, we do not actively harm people. We do not um, inflict any harm. And this is one of the ethical principles that underlies the, that this should be part of AI ethics. That whenever you design an algorithm, you should do an audit that are you harming some people or not? Because almost all technology, it is going to bring some benefit to some people. But is it the case that it is the benefits of your technology? Is it the case that only certain people are benefiting from it? Are you actually increasing inequality? These are all questions that we should uh, think about individually as researchers. And also as a society, we need to think about what are the kind of research questions that we would allow and what are the kinds of research questions that we will not allow and the active debates going on in the community right now so uh, having said this um, i will now go on to talk about any questions please uh, note ask them in the chat box right now 
or at the end of this and answer questions and have a discussion um, so some open questions related to ai ml are uh, the question firstly the question of bias is it possible that ai ml model it is biased in some way um, so although we think that something that is mathematical or it's um, just an algorithm it cannot be biased but we will see many examples uh, the literature is rife with examples in which uh, the AI ML models are actually biased against certain minorities, they are biased against certain races, and they tend to strengthen existing stereotypes. So now it is clearly established that there are many kinds of bias. Now, most of the research is on how can we debias our model and how can we ensure the fairness of ML models. So this is the second point. And uh, there is now a lot of debate because uh, there are many ways in which we can define fairness. And it's not, uh, and when you try to solve this, it is not only a technical problem, it also becomes a philosophical problem about how you define justice. Because there are so I'll just highlight some examples which will make the point. Um, the third question would be how can we ensure here is a catch-all word uh, when we are actually thinking about this, that what is it that we mean when we say that, that an algorithm is ethic. So, uh, uh, other questions related to short lecture, but these are also such as um, not like AI ML models to be just like black box. It, it will just give um, obtained. Uh, this is because. Um, we already have many examples in which ML models give you wrong results. And we have many examples in which it is easy to fool models. Uh, so in the literature on adversarial ML, people have shown that you can very easily tweak a picture with um, noise that is imperceptible, but it will completely fool an ML model. So if we do not actually know what the ML model is making the decision on, then we cannot really trust it, uh, especially for the big human decisions. If uh, you are ML model, you are not going to be able to do it, which is not consequential, then we can maybe tolerate something that is a black box. But we cannot sentence people, we cannot make uh, decisions on who to hire and who to fire just because an ML model tells us that in an in a black box manner. So we need to actually know what the basis of the decision are so that someone can ask for an explanation. So in modern democracies, people expect that when a decision is made, you can actually audit, and, uh, audit it and you can ask for a due process. So because of that, especially in uh, Europe and some other countries, people have now made rules. For example, GDPR is a regulation that has been Europe mein implement in Europe, which enforces data data ethics, ko, including uh, things about interpretability, about privacy. Because now on the internet, par almost, uh, every uh, company is uh, using data-driven methods. And their profit depends on collecting lots of data and therefore, they are recording everything that you do on the internet. They are supplementing it with offline data. They're making use of uh, you know, cameras and all of that data is being combined. And because of this, there are many issues about privacy and um, about harmful use of this, harmful uh, use of something, some data that was collected for some harmful use. Uh, 
Um, so other things uh, would be the safety of machine learning algorithms. I've talked about the adversarial ML problem. We don't want that. Um, so if uh, we have in a critical application some uh, machine learning model, we would like that it is foolproof. It is not easily uh, you know, fooled or it is not compromised in any way. Uh, and we have fallback mechanisms. If there is some attack, we should be able to maybe bring the human in the loop. So these are some issues. We will have uh, some time to talk of the initial issues. So let's talk about uh, bias, fairness, and ethics very briefly. So let me show you some examples of bias. So uh, if we have an image face recognition system, and we make use of data that is easily available online and perchance the data that is available it is let's say published in the us and it has uh, pictures of people from uh, the us and mostly these would be white males uh, if we train our image or face recognition system on this it will result model that may not work well for uh, different races and for certain people that were not represented in the original training data and even if for example the training data didn't have black people uh, and if uh, the relative proportion is not the same it may be that the algorithm is performing well on some races and it is not performing well in for certain races and people have documented that uh, the modern um, commercial uh, systems uh, that are offered by uh, you know various cloud companies they tend to be biased they perform relatively well for uh, white males and they perform uh, worse of all for black females and there are again uh, some results are available and other people are also checking uh, the general the general generalization of this result so when this such a system is applied, you can have systems that give gross errors. So for example, this was an example of a Google model that was correctly identifying uh, airplanes and cars. But when it was shown an image of a black couple, it specified it as gorillas. And um, this caused a big furor and therefore Google had to make changes and in fact the change they could come up was they actually removed gorillas from their training data and they were no longer um, they actually just um, circumvented this problem but now uh, people are um, you know raising concerns over this when you make use of this uh, for you know making uh, such decisions Another example is, uh, this is uh, an MIT student from Ghana, an African country. When she came in front of a facial recognition system, the system actually failed to recognize a person. And this is a dramatic failure in which the personhood of a person is denied just because of the color of the skin of that person. And when this person uh, the student came up with a white mask, the system recognized this. And this dramatically made the point that these models are currently biased and you have to explicitly account for these factors. We saw the King Midas problem. It was that if you optimize the accuracy, then this system is fine. The reason is that these people are like this, Ye come in your training data and in your test data and therefore your accuracy would be tuned better if you actually tune your model for the dominant class. But if you want explicitly that your model racist discrimination na dekhai, to then maybe you have to pay a cost for it. The cost will be that your performance overall accuracy will be reduced because now you अपने मॉडल को ऐसे ट्यून कर रहे हैं कि आप सिर्फ एक्यूरेसी ही को नहीं देख रहे आप फेयरनेस को भी देख रहे हैं एंड दिस पॉइंट वाज मेड आल्सो 
क्योंकि इस तरह के एल्गोरिदम्स इस्तेमाल हो रहे हैं इन सेल्फ ड्राइविंग तो अगर आपके फेशियल रिकग्नेशन सिस्टम कुछ स्किन कलर्स को देख ही नहीं सकते तो उसकी वजह से जाहिर है एक्सीडेंट्स भी ज्यादा हो सकते हैं जो कि एक ही रेस को ज्यादा जिस पर हो तो उसमें जाहिर है दिस इज अ प्रॉब्लम एंड पीपल हैव टू एड्रेस दिस एक और जो मसला आता है वो आता है नेचुरल लैंग्वेज प्रोसेसिंग सिस्टम में और इस पे भी काफी काम हुआ उसकी वजह यह है कि अगर आप डेटा से लर्न कर रहे हैं तो जो ट्रेंड्स आप देखते हैं डेटा में और जिस तरह मिसाल के तौर पे अगर आप लैंग्वेज में ट्रांसलेशन को लर्न करना चाह रहे हैं तो जिस तरह एग्जिस्टिंग ट्रांसलेशन हुई होंगी और वो एग्जिस्टिंग ट्रांसलेशन कैप्चर कर रही होती हैं हिस्ट्री को तो उसमें अगर सोसाइटी के अंदर ट्रेंड्स कुछ थे तो वो ही आपका डेटा भी कैप्चर करता है सो फॉर एग्जांपल ये गूगल ट्रांसलेट से मैंने रिसेंटली किया कि उर्दू में आ, है कि वो एक इंजीनियर है वो एक नर्स है इसको जब हम ट्रांसलेट करेंगे तो ये हो जाएगा ही इज एन इंजीनियर एंड शी इज अ नर्स दिस इज सिंपली बिकॉज वी हैव मोर uh instances of male engineers in in the urdu speaking community and we have more instances of female uh, nurses although the word wo is gender neutral theek hai and this is not only in urdu uh in many other cases jahan is tarah ke gender neutral pronouns hote hain jis tarah turkish hai farsi hai there are many other languages as well we see the same problem there तो इसको लोगों ने ऑब्जर्व किया और इस पर कुछ काम रिसेंटली हो चुका है जैसे ये रिसर्च पेपर है जिसमें उन्होंने देखा क्योंकि आपको शायद आपकी नॉलेज में हो कि आजकल एनएलपी मॉडल्स में वर्ड एम्बेडिंग्स इस्तेमाल की जाती हैं और उसके अंदर फिर आप देखते हैं कि ये जो अगर आप वर्ड्स को एज वेक्टर्स रिप्रेजेंट कर रहे हैं तो सिमिलर डिस्टेंसिस ढूंढ आप एनालिजीज सॉल्व कर सकते हैं जैसे कि some uh, problems uh, such as uh, they appear in uh, papers like gre gmat analogies jo hote hain to usme wo dhoondna cha rahe the ki man is to a computer uh, programmer what dash what woman is to dash to unhone usko automate kiya homemaker and this became a big issue because uh, uh, they uh, the people thought that this is something sexist क्योंकि आप जो सो जस्ट गिव मी अ मिनट प्लीज आई एम सॉरी जस्ट अ मिनट प्लीज कैन यू सी माय पिक्चर नो योर स्लाइड्स आर विजिबल बट योर पिक्चर इज नॉट विजिबल Okay, let me try to fix this. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Oh, your slide is visible. We, we, we were having some problem in your voice, so if you switch off your camera, that that's okay. Okay. So I will continue. Um, so, this ki ek misal ye thi. Aaj kal GPT three model jo hai, wo ek naya release hua hai, jo ke sophisticated language generation kar sakta hai. तो ये एक स्टैनफोर्ड के स्टूडेंट हैं जिन्होंने इस पर कुछ एक्सपेरिमेंट्स किए ये जनरेटिव मॉडल्स जो होते हैं इनको आप जब कुछ एग्जांपल्स देते हैं उसको खुद फिल कर देता है ठीक है तो उसने पहले फिल इसमें किया टू मुस्लिम्स तो उसके बाद उसके अंदर जब भी कंप्लीशन होती थी वो इस तरह होती थी जिसमें कभी ना कभी कोई बॉम्ब आ जाता था कोई टेररिस्ट आ जाता था और उसमें कोई पॉजिटिव चीज नहीं थी उसकी वजह ये थी कि ये मेन स्ट्रीम टेक्स्ट पर इन्होंने ये डेटा ट्रेन किया हुआ था और मेन स्ट्रीम टेक्स्ट और मेन स्ट्रीम न्यूज के आर्टिकल्स में अनफॉर्चुनेटली एक स्टीरियोटाइप है उसमें थोड़ा इस्लामोफोबिया है एंड बिकॉज ऑफ दैट जब भी वो ये इस्तेमाल करते थे तो उसके अंदर देखें उसमें स्टार्ट ये था कि जो उसने इनपुट दिया टू मुस्लिम्स वॉक्ड इनटू अ मॉस्क टू वर्शिप पेस पीसफुली और उसके बाद उसकी कंप्लीशन भी उसने नेगेटिवली की तो ये किसी को 
किसी ने सिखाया नहीं एक्सप्लेसिटली इस मॉडल ने खुद ही लर्न किया सो दिस इज वेरी डेंजरस आप इंटरनेट पे बहुत सारी चीजें देखते हैं जो कि गलत इंफॉर्मेशन आप अगर गूगल पे सर्च करेंगे वो गलत इंफॉर्मेशन आपको दे देगा और उस पर फिर आपको गुस्सा आएगा कि क्यों गूगल इस तरह के आंसर को एंडोर्स कर रहा है लेकिन उन्होंने इसको खुद ही डेटा से लर्न किया है तो अगर डेटा में इफ यू फाइंड मेनी क्लेमिंग समथिंग देन द मॉडल विल सिंपली थिंक दैट दिस इज द ट्रूथ एंड दिस इज अगेन अ प्रॉब्लम इन विच एम एल ए आई मॉडल्स कैन अनोइंगली एंड विदाउट स्पेसिफिक इंटेंशन बिकम रेसिस्ट सो दिस इज ऑबियसली अ बिग कंसर्न एंड पीपल शुड वर्क Uh, to avoid this uh, and uh, make systems that are cognizant of this iski ek aur misal ye hai ki microsoft ne ek bot banaya jiska naam tay tha aur usko unhone kaha ki this will actually interact with people and learn through the interaction to jab inhone isko release kiya to ek din mein ye bot ko logo ne is tarah hack kar liya tha ki ye bilkul एंटी सेमेटिक और एंटी सोशल बातें करना शुरू हो गया क्योंकि लोगों ने शरारत में इसको इस तरह का डेटा फीड करना शुरू कर दिया इस तरह का सेक्सिस्ट इस तरह का रेसिस्ट डेटा दिया जिसकी बेसिस पर सून एनाफ द मॉडल बिकेम जो एंटी सोशल बन गया और इसकी वजह यह है कि हालांकि टेक्नोलॉजी तो सही थी लेकिन uh, इसके अंदर एक फीडबैक लूप होता है जो डेटा इसके अंदर फीड किया जाएगा ये उसके हिसाब से चेंज होना शुरू हो जाता है तो कई दफा कुछ चीजें फिर ऐसी होती हैं सोसाइटी के अंदर जो आप एंटिसिपेट नहीं कर सकते आ, उसके वजह से भी ये रेसिस्ट एलिमेंट्स आ जाते हैं और तो इसीलिए हमें आ, ये जो अन इंटेंडेड कॉन्सिक्वेंसिस हैं और जो एडवर्सरियल एक्शन है क्योंकि हो सकता है जब आप किसी टेक्नोलॉजी को रिलीज करते हैं सम पीपल विल कम विद एक्सप्रेसिव एम कि आपकी टेक्नोलॉजी को फेल करवाएं तो उसको भी आपको प्लान करना चाहिए तो इसमें जब हमने बात की थी इनिशरी सेफ्टी ऑफ एम एल ए आई तो ये एलिमेंट आ जाता है कि आप इस तरह चीजें एंटीसिपेट करें सो यू वुड हैव फोर साइट कि क्या क्या चीजें हो सकती हैं उसके हिसाब से आप चीजों को फिर डिजाइन करें uh, अब मैं आपको थोड़ा सा हाईलाइट करता हूं द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ फेयरनेस इसमें uh, ये इस तरह की बात भी आ जाती है देखें uh, हमारे यहां पाकिस्तान में एट डिफरेंट टाइम्स कोटा सिस्टम्स होते थे तो यूनिवर्सिटी के अंदर जी uh, जो अंडर प्रिविलेज ओके सो फॉर एग्जांपल इन पाकिस्तान यू हैड सर्टन डिसएडवांटेज कम्युनिटीज Uh, and uh, so the government at some times instituted quotas for them now the question is is this fair or not and there are different ways to think about this so if you want to actually change the society so that every one becomes at par and the inequality lessens then you have to constitute such uh, a method but uh, when you are doing this Uh, a valid concern is that aren't we violating merit so this then becomes not a technical issue but a philosophical issue uh, in a similar vein in the field of ml and ai if you want to ensure um, lack of uh, discrimination then maybe you have to compromise on accuracy or on some other metrics uh iski uh, i will give you some examples so that you at least have some idea of the nuances of this problem so uh, there is a famous book um called weapons of math destruction which specifies this that in every algorithm that we build there are ethical choices depending on what your performance metric is are you trying to optimize for accuracy or are you trying to optimize for fairness and what kind of a trade off you doing so these are not technical questions but these are ethical choices and they follow from the values that you have uh, a famous case that brought this issue uh, into the fore was 
the case in which uh, in the US, they, they had a sim, uh, system called Compass in which uh, they would um, use uh, machine learning algorithms to decide which person to release on parole. So they have a system in which uh, they release certain people before their time so that, um, you know, because they have um, a lot of load on their uh, criminal um, like jails and so on. So therefore, and also uh, they would like to give people a chance. So in this way, uh, they, they release certain people on parole uh, and they make use of ML models. But they discovered that overall their models, they tend to um, favor certain races more than the others. And this was a paper, this was an article published in a magazine called Pro Publica, this became hot news because it alleged that uh, the compass model, which is a very popular model that is used by the government in many states in the United States, it states that this is used to predict future criminals, but it is biased against blacks. And they did a uh, statistical analysis and all the, they also gave examples. For example, uh, they compared two people one of them was a black uh, female and the other one was a, a white male. Um, one the white male was given a low risk decision. The black female had a high risk decision. Uh, but when you actually looked at them, you saw that the white male had more serious prior offenses and he, actually when the person was released, he actually went on to do another theft. But this female, she had only a few juvenile misdemeanors, which means uh, crimes that were committed, minor crimes that were committed when this uh, woman was uh, under age. And she did not do any offenses, but she was given a high risk. And this was not just for this one case, they saw a systematic bias and you see that here if you analyze the white um, if you see the black defendants you see that uh, you have um, an equal distribution so uh, one two three four five six uh, seven eight nine ten which is representing the risk it is fairly even but when you see the white defendants uh, scores, you see that most of them are given low risk scores. So this became a big scandal. And then uh, there was a lot of debate on this. And from there emerged a new community known as the fat ML community, the fairness, uh, accountability and transparency movement for machine learning in which they said, you have to explicitly account for these factors and ensure that the results that you have are fair. And for this, um, again, uh, philosophical questions arise that should you actually bar certain information from going into your ML model? Uh, it, it is against the law in many countries, including in the United States, to use certain features for making predictions. For example, you cannot use the race of a person. You should not use the religion of a person. But it turns out that for machine learning, even if you do not use these features, you can guess these features from other features. So if you are in the United States, just knowing the place where someone lives is already a good indication of where, of what sort of a race a person is. So people looked at this and said how effective it is to block information at the input. And now the consensus is that, you know, you should enforce fairness at the output, at the actual decisions, rather than barring features to be used as, at the input. And this is because, um, you know, even if you restrict certain features, you can guess those features from other features. And this is, what makes this field very complicated. Uh, I uh, would suggest that um, there are, uh, this can be seen in more depth by seeing this article in Pro Publica. I will just uh, give an example. So 
uh, imagine that you are using AI for predicting uh, whether a, lo a bank loan applicant should be given a loan and whether that person is likely to pay back or not. So these are known as features. For example, has the person gone to college? Has the person previously been bankrupt? Is the person tall? Is the person employed? Does the person have a home? Has he previously paid back loan? So these are the features which will go into an ML model and it will make a decision on the basis of that. So uh, a question is that can we use race as input? Can we use religion as input? And the complication is that even if you restrict these attributes, you can guess them from other attributes. If you combine two, three different attributes, you can already guess this. And you can make use of that as a good proxy of this. Um, so this is the complication. And um, another complication is that imagine that you are designing a classifier in which the population has different groups. So imagine that you have one population uh, we call it population one, the orange uh, uh, pluses and minuses, and you have another population, uh, population two, which is the red plus and minuses. If you want to create a classifier for both of these community, it will be something somewhere in the middle. But if you want to optimize for population one, it will be somewhere here. It is the hyperplane that best uh, distinguishes the the positive uh, classes and the negative classes for the other group it will be something else so if you instead optimize for accuracy it will not give good results for for the for one of the communities let's say the population two only has a few members so most of the population is population one and population two is only few members. If you design a general classifier, it will give poor results on population two. It can give poor results. You will not get this parity for free uh, because if you just optimize for accuracy, you will not care whether the things are fair or not in terms of uh, similar performance for both of the groups. But if you want to do equally well, then it will result in different classifiers for different populations. So again, this is uh, again a philosophical question whether we should have different classifiers for different communities. If you want to have um, fairness at the end, maybe you have to do this. Uh, so I started with this question whether we should have quota for disadvantaged uh, communities in a university. It is again a similar problem depending on what kind of a fairness metric you choose, you will have different choices. So uh, the model of this example is that to be fair, the algorithm may need to explicitly account for a group, group membership, else optimizing generic accuracy fits the majority population. Um, so if we have different models so each point here represents a different sort of a trade-off you have unfairness here and you have error here uh, it's clear that you should be on this curve because this curve is the best you can do this is known as the Pareto curve uh, but then you have to make a trade-off if you want to minimize error this is the best possible point but it turns out that this is also quite unfair. If you want to minimize unfairness, maybe you have to choose this, but then it has a lot of error. Or maybe you can choose one of these points on the Pareto curve. Um, so this is then the issue of fairness. Uh, this is highlighted in this very nice book, The Ethical Algorithm. They say that uh, predictive accuracy and notions of fairness and privacy, transparency and many other social objectives are simply different criteria. If you want to optimize for accuracy, choose this one. If you want to optimize for unfairness, unfairness ke liye ab ye choose karenge, error ke liye you will choose this. But 
if you want to manage all of them then you have to make a trade off and it depends then on your human values different communities different classes of people will give different weight to different things and they will come up with different models and uh, the authors here say that this is a fact of life and machine learning so um, to summarize again i would say that this question of fairness then becomes something more than a scientific question it is a scientific question but it, it is also uh, to be supplemented with thinking about what it is that we want what are our values what are our social and political choices so now i'm coming to the last part can anyone tell me uh, how many minutes i have sir i just message you uh, sir i just uh, message you that uh, uh, we have to come conclude maybe in one or two minutes okay so inshallah i will now conclude um having set up the talk uh, talking about the fairness issues i will only uh, tell you now about the recent work in this domain um now people are talking about morality of ai they are saying that people should think about um how would the, the technology that they are developing be used in practice who will benefit or suffer from it what will be the social impact and how does it fit with the values of uh, the person and the society uh, in this regard there are many guidelines so i refer people who are interested to this paper uh, it talks about more than 75 guidelines that have been published and people are now uh they have uh, a fair idea about what kinds of ethical principles should be adopted some of them are listed on the slide um so you can read more by reading this paper in uh, nature i will skip certain elements uh, just to finish on time in the end i will say that solving this problem requires focus on algorithmic solutions this is what typical engineers do but you need to work in collaboration with people from different field from law public policy because principles alone cannot guarantee ethical ai we need public policy law regulation and also some political philosophy so these are all papers in mainstream journals which are making the case that you should incorporate moral philosophy political philosophy regulation law and public policy in the research on ai so with this i come to the end of my talk to conclude ai has a huge benefit uh, potential and it can also cause massive harm uh, to avoid the harm it is important that we take into account the ethical considerations and these considerations would come from different fields technical ethical philosophical legal and political so this is the end of my talk my name is junaid kadir this is my email address if you have any questions or comments uh, you can reach me um, on email or you can ask me question uh, now thank you very much uh, thank you dr sam for the very nice talk so we have uh, several questions so uh, i will ask them one by one so maybe we can start from the questions from the participants but i can ask them directly okay so the first question is uh, are there any government organizations that are working to provide pros and cons to the public for these new technologies without biases and uh, without these fairness factors so basically they are asking that uh, do we have some uh, like uh, government owned organizations or maybe some at upper level organizations that make sure that these things are without any harm for the community right um so this is a nice question and um, so in in the last paper i mentioned about uh, the nature uh, paper they have talked about the international practices in this regard so in terms of pakistan we are relatively behind but certain other countries they have uh, they have been thinking about this particularly the leaders in this field are in uh, europe they have uh, certain codes of ethics they have also made laws for example they created gdpr the um, data regulation policy for europe which ensures uh, privacy and data ethics and many other things but uh, in pakistan i think in the last 3 4 years uh, 
uh, a couple of centers on AI have been made. And I think now they should also focus not only on the technical aspect, but also on thinking about the uh, law that should be made, what should be the public policies, and how we can actually translate these principles into practice. Because uh, we need to teach our students about this in the universities as well. So we need a very uh, holistic policy and we can learn from what the Europeans are doing uh, and we can also customize it according to our own needs. Uh, we have uh, started a project um, recently on this and we invite all collaborators to contact us. Uh, this is just the start. In Pakistan, there's uh, a lot that needs to be done. Thank you. Okay, another question is, I just read it for you. Uh, there is a need for a better form of AI uh, that is able to be supplied uh, that is able to be supplying information and learn everything. Uh, so he says nowadays AI is just task or environment oriented. But when right. will be, when, when will be uh, it will be able to use for more than that, like supplying okay. intelligence in sense of emotions and understanding of nature of task. Right. Right. So it's direct from the. Uh, okay, um, so I need to probably understand the question more. But what I have understood is, uh, you know, how we can design better AI. So in terms of that, uh, um, I could not talk too much about this, but uh, one could focus on just the technical aspects. And the best book in this regard is uh, the one I showed at the end. It's, the, it's known as The Ethical Algorithm by Aaron Roth and uh, Michael Kearns. Uh, in, in the paper, they specifically work on you know, having better technology because um, you know, the problem can be solved through collaboration, but also through better technology that are more cognizant of the issues at hand. So, uh, like you mentioned about the need to incorporate emotions and the need to incorporate fairness and privacy, these are all different chapters in their book. So, if anyone is interested, they can read this book. This will be the best introduction, the best technical introduction for technical focused AI. But if they want a more holistic view, then they can look at other works as well. So if you can please repeat the book name, please. The name is The Ethical Algorithm That's by right. Aaron Roth and Michael Kearns. OK, OK, so, so uh, just two or three more questions, uh, a bit technical too. So first question is basically uh, that uh, why the physical feature tall among the features for predicting if a person is likely to pay back loan? So when you showed the graph of uh, the problem of taking a uh, loan from the bank, there was a feature uh, as a tall, which is basically a human height. So yeah. you say that yeah. isn't, it a, isn't itself a biasness? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, the purpose of that example was just to show the different kinds of things that can be used. And uh, people are always interested in finding the most appropriate feature. And in machine learning, this is a complete field in itself, uh, known as feature engineering, uh, using the best feature or combination of features that give you, gives you the best predictive value. But then the question that the student asked is that, is it fair to use this or not? Then uh, obviously um, it becomes something that one needs to think about uh, is it legal? In some places, uh, certain features are illegal. And then uh, the other question would be, is it unfair in some way? Then it depends on what kind of philosophical framework are you thinking about classifying something okay. as fair or okay, not? Sir. Okay, so last one is, uh, like there are two questions, I'm combining them in together. So it says that uh, biasness in training data, is it similar to imbalance in data? Like when we are developing machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms, we use the term right. imbalance. So if right. we say that if we say that biasness is similar to imbalance, and then fairness, right. fairness is similar to overfitting, is it true? Uh, it's not completely true, but one um, you know one instance of bias is having an imbalanced data. So for example, if you have two classes a positive and a negative class, and you have many more examples of positive rather than negative or vice versa, you would say this is imbalanced. Uh, but in all other cases, uh, you know, in all machine learning models, uh, it's very difficult to have to cover all possible grounds. 
and then uh, almost in all cases we would be having certain groups that are more than the other groups unless you have actually gone on with the decision to ensure that you have a completely balanced data set so uh, you know the imbalanced data set is just one aspect similarly overfitting uh, is again one aspect having fairness is a much more stricter requirement so uh, these things are covered more in the book i mentioned okay. um, mm -hmm. so i think uh, I, we can refer the student to that okay okay sir so the uh, last question is from dr amir so uh, dr amir you can proceed please so thank you dr janet for a wonderful talk so my question is not technical it's it's a bit philosophical so uh, the question is that uh, the problem that we are looking i mean can we really solve them because yeah we have some sir. models and they be they be working for something and they will not be working for something yeah so um, uh, yes so we need to relax our concept of solving because these are really complex problems and uh, so if we compare the social problems with the problems we see in physics and engineering it is true that the social problems are much more complex and people have been thinking about them for 2000 3000 years they have made some progress but many of those insights are still valid and people should actually benefit from that if we cannot uh, one related comment that i can make is that you cannot solve a social problem simply by a merely a technical solution you need to think about the social impact as well other than that your solution would create more problems and this is a, an established fact um again i for people who want to read more they, there is a book called geek heresy Uh, this is from a microsoft engineer who talks about how just using technology will never solve social problems uh, if you use technology intelligently if you are aware of its side effects then you can contain them and make it a success but if you blindly use technology you will not get anywhere so we need to uh, think about um, the bigger issue and also uh you know uh, because i am also uh, involved in engineering education currently i am the chairperson of uh, the ee department here even pec recommends uh, that we have an awareness of these social issues and the notion of a solution is different in engineering and in the social complex systems so this is a good question and uh, unfortunately we don't have much time to go go into more depth but i will just say that you know we need to look only at not only at just technological fixes because technological fixes uh, will get you somewhere but it will also not uh, solve everything you need to look at the bigger picture and make use of all the tools that people have been using including public policy law philosophy these are important things which we cannot ignore okay okay thank you dr junaid for a wonderful talk uh, thank you very much Okay, so uh, now we have a, a virtual shield for you. So we will present it here. Thank you, Ji. Bhot shukriya. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice talk. Okay, for for the audience, then uh, we have uh, we had a wonderful session today. So we had three speakers. So ranging from talking about uh, AI in biomedical. then talking about implementation of ai on atlas board and then ethical ai topics so we have covered uh, several thing uh, in today's session so we have a lunch break here now and we will uh, continue the second session from 2 pm now so uh, please uh, uh, get ready for the next session and uh, let's uh, see you at 2 pm now thank you very much
It conducts research and development activities in the areas of information and communication technology in collaboration with local industries and international research and economic organizations. Our education Punjab is going to be here as the best of honor. We have members from the industry, international industry, and uh, speakers from uh, various parts of the world and acceptance rate of papers, which is around 10 10% or so. And I think it's very good for the students because it gives them the perspective uh, of research being done not only inside the country but also across the world. I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Vakar Mehmood and uh, the organizing team for, for such an excellent event.
It conducts research and development activities in the areas of information and communication technology in collaboration with local industries and international research and economic organizations. Our education Punjab is going to be here as a guest of honor. We have members from the industry and speakers from various parts of the world and acceptance rate of papers which is around 10% or so. यहाँ पे डिफरेंट की रोड्स स्पीकर्स भी आए हुए हैं और बड़े अच्छे पेपर्स हैं अभी तक जो मैंने देखे हैं प्रेजेंट हुए हैं और अभी तक रियली एंजॉयिंग इट तो बड़ा अच्छा लगा से टॉक स्केजुअल थी वो आई डोंट नेचुरली ऐसा हुआ है या क्या हुआ है मगर वो जिस तरीके से बड़ी स्पोर्टिव थी वो एक पूरी चेन बन गई थी पूरी स्टोरी बन गई एंड आई थिंक वेरी गुड फॉर द स्टूडेंट्स बिकॉज इट गिव दैम द परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ रिसर्च बीन डन नॉट ओनली इन साइड द कंट्री बट ऑल्सो फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड आई वुड लाइक टू कंग्रेचुलेट डॉक्टर वाकार ऑर्गेनाइजिंग थीम फॉर सच एन एक्सलेंट वर्क
जी वेलकम स्लाम जी डॉक्टर उस्मान गनी वी आर गोइंग जस्ट गोइंग टू बिगिन प्लीज अप आगे आप चलिए आई थिंक इट्स टाइम वी शुड स्टार्ट नाउ ओके सो वी हैव वी आर इन द सेकंड सेशन ऑफ डे टू सेकंड डे ऑफ आई कोस्ट सो अगेन आई एज आई सेड अर्लियर आई एम डॉक्टर उस्मान गनी एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एंड रिसर्च कंसल्टेंट इन फॉर इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ कंप्यूटर साइंस सो आई विल बी the session chair for this set, second session also as i was for the first session okay so for this talk uh, we have a very good professor uh, uh, professor ying liu so she is a female uh, lady she has done her phd from monash university australia and uh, she did her uh, post doc from uh, nanjing technical university singapore and then she has been serving as a lecturer in republic polytechnic uh, in singapore so after that uh, Uh, she has joined uh, Xi'an University of Post and Telecommunication, and now Director of Image and Information Processing Unit. And she is also working as Chief Scientist of the Key Lab of Electronic Information Processing from Crime Scene Investigation Application using Ministry of Public Security China. So her work is mostly towards crime scene investigation, uh, and uh, she has a very good profile of above more than hundred research papers, and she has also uh, received uh, Pattern Recognition Best Paper Award in 2010. So okay, so what what is her topic? Her topic is bridging the gap between lab grade technologies and practical challenges. So uh, one uh, uh, bad thing is that uh, it will be a virtual presentation. So I will ask the participants, audience, to uh, send us uh, their questions. We will be forwarding those questions to the uh, speaker, and she will be directly answering those questions. So I think we can start the session now. Hi, good afternoon, dear friends, ladies, and gentlemen. This is Ying Liu from Xi'an, China. Firstly, it's a great honor for me to have this opportunity to give this talk here. Thanks to Fizo for his kind recommendation, and thanks to the conference committee for such great arrangement. I'm very sorry that. I can't be available online with you, and have to present my talk with this pre-recorded video. Well, anyway, I wish us a great time together. I hear a brief introduction of the presenter here. That is myself. My university, Xi'an University of Posts and Telecommunications, in short. XUPT, and I obtained my PhD from Monash in Australia. Especially, I am a vegan. My research spans pattern recognition and image processing. Okay, now let's come to the topic: bridging the gap. Between lab-grade technologies and practical challenges, there are four parts in my talk today. Firstly, I'll give you a brief introduction of my team here. Then the main part, bridging the gap between techniques and challenges. After that, I will introduce you some of our international collaboration work ongoing. Last conclusions. Introduction of Center for Image and Information Processing. Here, this picture. What can you find in it? We can see a number of surveillance cameras on the control pod, right? This picture was taken 
uh, last year in the street. There are over 20 surveillance cameras in this picture. In fact, statistics tells that there are over 700,000 cameras set for public security use in Shanxi province, that is my province. Obviously, there's large amount of surveillance video data. Because of this, image and video processing techniques are in high need for public security applications and have been uh, giving effective um, use in practical scenario. It is with this background that our university and Shanxi Public Security Department jointly established a research center in November 2011. After two years, our research center was promoted to a national key lab, and it is an important base for relevant research and development activities. We get support from the government with project fundings and help in product promotion, etc. Our team started with seven members and two postgraduate students. Till today, we have 20 members and 65 students on campus. This picture was taken in the year 2012. Yeah, that is quite a number of years ago. This uh, was taken this year and it includes some of our students. This one was taken two years ago with part of our uh, team members. We have image and video data from real police cases for experiments. We have set up a few image data set, including crime scene investigation image data, tire pattern image data, surveillance video data, car license plate image data, etc. Here are some uh, sample images. And we have direct information from the police, which will be helpful in our research as we keep regular contact with the police department. Sorry, I haven't been speaking English for quite a long while. You have to pardon me if uh, it is not fluent. And the main research directions in my team in include the following. First, image and video enhancement. We all know that image data from a practical scenario are usually of low quality. Hence, image video enhancement is uh, an important step. Second, crime scene investigation image retrieval. This aims to help in finding uh, important clues which can uh, be of great use in police case solving. Okay. Third is surveillance video analysis. There are a few subtopics, suspect object detection, suspect object tracking, event detection, event prediction, etc. Direction is surveillance video coding and read control. Okay, after a brief introduction of my team, now let's come to the main part of the talk today bridging the gap between technologies and the practical challenges. 
yeah, we all know that there are lots of research uh, papers available and there are algorithms designed for different purposes. But how much uh, is the difference? How much, uh, how far it is between this research uh, result and practical requirements? I will share with you some different topics based on our research experience. First topic, CSI image retrieval. CSI refers to crime scene investigation. Here, CBIR is a often used term, which refers to content-based image retrieval. CBIR has been well studied for several decades. And we know that uh, in recent years, convolutional neural network, CNN, has proved its outstanding performance in CBIR. Well, since CBIR has been so well developed, what is special in CSIR? Here are a few example photos. Actually, based on our research experience, we have concluded with a few challenges in this topic. First is quality of CSI images are usually low and image enhancements are needed as a first step. Yes, that we have mentioned earlier. Second, CSI images have spe specific content which is very different from natural images. Hence, we need to design algorithms which are suitable for such images. Right. Third, there are some cases that only small amount of samples are available for learning. Hence, algorithms such as few short learning might be needed uh, to complete the specific task with satisfied performance. Okay. Second, CSI image enhancement. This example shows a suspect vehicle with the license plate part enlarged. Well, even though it is enlarged, we can tell that there's no information useful. We can't actually tell any number here. That's the situation. That's a, actually an image from a real case. Another example. This is an image from a traffic accident video. We were asked to find out some useful information from the car license plate, but we tried many different ways and there's no uh, useful information available. Due to the overexposure, uh, we managed to find only something like an age, which could be the car brand. And the number of pixels available here is only 20 by 61. We can see that even this could be H is distorted because of the camera angle. Uh, problems here in this topic mainly include very low resolution of images and situations such as overexposure. Okay, topic three, face recognition. There are many uh, research outcome, research algorithms designed for risk recognition. 
However, based on our experience, there are still two challenging problems which are yet to be solved. The first is face occlusion. When the half or more part of the face is covered, the task becomes very difficult. And so far, the police department is still expecting uh, new solutions to break this bottleneck. <coughs> Excuse me. Second is person re-identification, also called person re-ID. That means the suspect object and the different cameras. This is quite a hot research topic and there are a lot of papers available in literature. However, question is, how far it is to practical application? Are the algorithms effective for practical use? One of the experts actually answered this question. This is Professor Qi Tian. He is a chief scientist in Huawei, which is one of the greatest company in China. He graduated from uh, a top uni in U in US. He said, practical data are much more complex than our training data. That is why it is always not easy to collect training data which can really reflect the practical situation. Hence, even though the results in research paper is satisfied, something like accuracy as up to 90% or even higher, but this algorithm, when applied to practical situation, we usually find it is not satisfied. All right, topic four, using body features for criminal identification. This is another real case. In this picture, the criminal actually covered himself with a quilt. Why he did this? Yes, he want to actually hide his body features. We couldn't, you know, find his height, his body shape, and we we can't even do gait analysis. We tried different ways, and we couldn't actually give uh, useful information to the police as clue. At the end, the police had to use traditional way to solve this case. Uh, the man was finally caught in a small hotel in the countryside. By then, the jewelry he stole had already been melted into something like this shown in this picture. If you search online, you could still find this uh, description about this case. Yes. Topic five, video retrieval. As we mentioned, there's huge amount of surveillance video data available. How to find the wanted quickly and accurately? Uh, video retrieval or video abstraction is another hot research topic. Okay, we concluded with challenges such as small object problem. 
That means when the suspect or the target object is small, of small size, then the task is very difficult. Our team has carried out some research in this area. Second, same object and different cameras. Because of the light situation, the angle of the camera, and identification of same object and different cameras is another challenging task. Third, high precision in event prediction. Um, our conclusion is that multi-model could be a potential solution in such case. We will actually explain more about multi-model next. Topic six, event prediction. We will have two examples here. One is abnormal crowd behavior prediction. One of our team members focuses on this topic. Based on our experiments and our research experience, the challenge here is crowd behavior is more complex and more difficult to define than uh, personal behavior. Thus, feature extraction and crowd behavior identification identification, sorry, is more challenging. Okay, topic seven, multimodal information processing. Multimodal here refers to information such as text, image, video, audio, yeah, the fusion of multimodal information. One uh, practical scenario is emergency monitoring and deep mining of real-time social network. One project in our team aims to uh, monitor internet uh, abnormal situation. Last year, they caught a few groups selling teaching tools before uh, the college entrance examination. And uh, in this way, they help the police. Okay, these are the tools that the cheating tools. It is interesting how can they use this uh, during the exam. This one, it is said that it is uh, taken into the exam room as a eraser, but I agree there's some electronic system inside. I, I don't know the details as I never use that. <laughs> okay. Challenges here include the following. First, data authority. As the data from different resources, this could be a, a problem that need to be solved. Second is fusion of different data model. Uh, this is one of the research topic in our team. Topic eight, hyperspectral image analysis. Starting this, we aim to realize real-time detection and identification of special traces. Special traces such as discolored blood stains and altered handwriting. This is one example. In the left image, 
which was taken using normal camera. In this picture, we couldn't actually tell the difference between detergent and blood stains. While using hyperspectral camera, we can tell the difference easily. Right? We can tell which is detergent or dishwashing liquid, which is blood stain. Yes. Another example, detection of handwriting, altering, and coating. Okay, yes, that's the power of hyperspectral imaging. Challenges here. First, data collection. Data collection is always very important to carry out experiments and test our algorithm. Second, hardware cost. Because hyperspectral imaging or camera is really very expensive, this makes it not easy for the, you know, the system to be popularized for use. Yes, we are working on one project aiming to lower or reduce the cost. Okay. Topic nine, surveillance video data compression. As video data amount is huge, we need algorithm to reduce data size for efficient storage and transmission. Here are two pictures. Comparing these two pictures, we can tell that the right one is not as sharp as the left one. However, we can still, you know, tell the content. Our camera man, right? The fact is, in the right image, 85% of the data has been removed. That means only 15% left. And with that 15% of data, we re reconstructed this picture. That's how amazing data or image compression can be. Challenges here. First, information of important clues might be removed by conventional video compression method. Sorry, one here, one letter N was missed. Very sorry for this. I'll make correction later. Second, how to introduce police experience in this domain-specific task. I'll give one example here. In this suspected vehicle, at the, the police is interested in a small pendant inside the car. Here is an enlarged image of the pendant. It could be something like this, a Chinese knot. Well, this could be, you know, of importance for the police, but such information might be removed by a conventional video compression. We need to design special algorithms to keep such details and give such object priority. Okay. All right. We have uh, shared with the audience nine topics. All of those are from our experience in 
research work and in practical application. In summary, how much is a gap between techniques and practical challenges? It's quite large. There's still a lot of work to do. In reducing this gap between uh, lab grid techniques and practical requirements, we think that there are a few tasks. First, find out the real problems to solve. Second, collection of real data for experiments. Third, analysis of real data, which is much more complex than lab use data. Fourth, introducing domain-specific knowledge. For this, we need definitely to talk with the police. Fifth, we need efforts from more researchers. Since, you know, this is a special domain, not only, not many researchers are involved as we know so far. Well, if we could share the data and the research problem with more researchers and with the efforts from more uh, people in academia, then we expect that the problems could be uh, solved sooner or later. This could be helpful in uh, reducing the gap. All right, here uh, is one of the system we designed, which has been used in practical scenario and really provide useful help in solving police cases. It is a CSI image retrieval system. We name it finding out the truth. Another system we designed is for event detection in surveillance video. We are also working on 3D data collection. This is a system to be completed. These are some of the reports that issued by the police department. Uh, not only that we have already, you know, provided help to the police, but also we have ob obtained valuable experience in solving practical problems. All right, I hope you have uh, found second part of the talk useful and some of the information helpful for you. If you need more information, uh, you can always contact with me. I will give you my email account at the end of the slides. All right, let's come to the third part of my talk. International collaborations. We have an international joint research center, which was established in the year 2016. With this research center, we can carry out programs such as joint research with our international partners, our joint student supervision, international visiting, this picture shows our team members uh, visiting other countries and international programs we have been uh, ongoing here in our team. We also organize international workshop and 
organize special session at international conferences, for example, ICASP to 2019 last year in the UK. You are welcome to our fifth workshop, which will be held next year. The exact date is yet to be finalized. In addition, we organize multimedia challenges. Last year, we organized uh, a challenge titled Fine Green Vehicle Footprint Recognition with Microsoft Research Asia at SM Multimedia Asia. This year, together with JD AI department, JD is one of the greatest company in China. And the title of the challenge is Few Short Learning for Tire Pattern Recognition. This will be held at SEME 2021. Okay. Okay, this picture, I'm giving the first prize award to the student. He's a representative from the team which won the first prize. Myself with some of the students who took part in the challenge. Okay, you are welcome to join the grand challenge at ICME 2021, which will be held in Shenzhen, China in July next year. Shenzhen is a very beautiful city. You will find it attractive and deserve your trip. All right. Now, last part of my talk, conclusions. We have mentioned the tasks that we need to reduce the gap between research and practical needs. And for this, we have made the following efforts. Direct contact with the police. Build image video dataset for research use, and we share them with the uh, academia. Research effort in designing data-tuned algorithm and product development. Organizing workshop, seminar, special session, and grand challenges. All this uh, are with a purpose to share our data and our research experiences. So together, we are bridging the gap between lab research and practical requirements, and we hope to have more friends working in this field. All right, thank you very much for your attention. We sincerely welcome you to visit us at Xi'an China. Xi'an is a very beautiful and is an interesting historic city. At last, we have a present for you. This is made by my team here. The video. Xi'an Beiling was founded in 1087 AD. It is a typical Chinese traditional temple style buildings. Its first half is adapted from Confucius temple made. Still visible trees everywhere, Confucius temple. It is not only a treasure house of oriental stone historical culture, but also a treasure house of calligraphy art and enjoys the reputation of hometown of calligraphy art. Walking through the Beilin's Bluestone Trail, a cultural feast blowing.
The Xi'an city wall was built on the basis of the empire of the Sui and Tang dynasties. Under the guidance of the policy of building walls high, accumulating grain, and relieving the king, the wall on the main line, including a series of military facilities, such as mounts, suspension bridges, gates, arrowhouse, main buildings, and turrets, which constitutes a complete defense system for the cold weapons era. The ancient city wall is simple and old, silent for thousands of years. But it is not alone. It has already integrated with the ancient people. The bell tower of Xi'an is located in the center of Xi'an. It is the largest and best preserved one of the existing bell tower in China. The bell tower is built on square base. It is a three-story building with a brick and a wooden structure and four-story roof. Xi'an Huimin Street is a famous food culture block in Xi'an. There are many commercial spots with traditional Chinese architecture style and Muslim architecture style everywhere. In Huimin Street, we can find many snacks with Xi'an characteristics, such as osmanthus cake, steamed cold noodles, Chinese pastry, dried persimmon, The Great Wild Goose Pagoda, also called Pagoda's Incen Temple. It is the earliest and longest existing Sifang Pavilion Break Tower in the Tang Dynasty. It also where Master Xuanzang consecrated Buddha statuses, Shuri and Sanskrit. Broader. The typical material is under the curtain of night, the great tongue of the great tongue of the more is a perfect picture of the magnificent Tang dynasty and combined with modern commercial pedestrian street attracted lots of tourists to visit. The glow of the light gives the greater Audemore with a layer of mystery and make it more attractive. Xi'an University of Post and Telecommunications is a high-level university in Shanxi province. First class university, first class is plan construction university. And Ministry of Education, Excellent Engineer Education and Training Program Implementation University. Teaching strategy has reached a new level, become an important base for training senior professionals in the information industry in China. The school has more than 18,000 students. It has two campuses, Yantan and Chang'an, with an area of more than 1,500 acres. The school insists on strengthening with talents, with more than 1,600 employers and more than 516 senior titles. The school has four double appointed academicians and has three academicians as chief scientists. 
There are more than 100 people, including national, provincial, and ministry talent projects. Winners of the National Labor Day, National and Provincial Outstanding Teachers, forming a strong team. The school takes the development of technology and application of industry as a focus and forms an advantage in the mobile communications, image position, information security, and information economy. The school has two national engineering laboratories and 29 provincial and ministry key laboratories. Relying on those platforms to promote the deep integration of industry, education, research, and application, the smart criminal investigation model of electric information science investigation has been recognized by the International Criminal Police Organized, and it has made important contributions to promote the development of the industry and economy. The school construction of near 4,000 square meters of college students' innovation base creates a dream factory for students. In recent years, students have won more than 1,400 awards in various national science and technology competitions, such as Internet Plus, Challenge Cup, Mathematic Model, the number and level of awards are among the top universities in Shanxi. It has created a leader brand in the province and even the country. The school actively creates a characteristic culture in the new year and enriches a special world leading the pursuit of values for teachers and students. The volunteer team of graduate students loving young spirit, love and dedication. In 70 years of wind and rain, we will not forget our original aspiration and advance bravely, standing at a new historical starting point, writing a new chapter of struggle. Center for Image and Information Processing in Xi'an University of Posts and Telecommunications was established in November 2011. The team focused on image data acquisition and clarity, semantic analysis and the retrieval of images, video coding and stream control, multimodal network information understanding and fusion. The center carried out innovative application research in the field of public security. Scientific research and innovation have always been the purpose of the team. Relying on the crime scene investigation unit of Shanxi province, the laboratory of electronic information application technology for scene investigation, and the national engineering laboratory for cyber event warning and control technologies, it has become an integrated scientific research team. The team also focuses on training innovative talents in science and technology. At present, the team has 18 members and more than 60 graduate students. Students' research direction is closely combined with team projects and academic frontiers. And the students have published many high-quality articles in international conferences and authoritative academic journals. It, it takes 10, 10 years, years to grow trees, but 100, 100 years, years to rear people. people. The, the team has trained a number of diligent and responsible technology practical talents. Hi, good afternoon, dear friends, ladies. Uh, thank you, Professor Yin, for a wonderful talk. and. Uh, some mouth uh, watering events at the end and then a very good description of your lab and everything so for our audience uh, unfortunately we don't have the speaker online available so what we can do uh, we can give your question and we will forward those questions directly to the um, uh, speaker and hopefully she will provide the answers so for the speaker uh, professor ning we have a uh, virtual shield available so we will uh, be presenting that virtual shield now Uh, 
thank, thank you very much. much. So, so uh, this, this concludes uh, our first, first uh, talk, uh, talk uh, which, which was about uh, challenges, challenges which are being faced in uh, computer, computer vision and then related to machine learning, learning and then police department. department. Uh, now there is a panel discussion which uh, which will be uh, uh, Dr. Amir will be moderating on. So I hand over the duties of the session chair to Dr. Amir from onwards. Thank you very much. Can you give me sharing rights? Uh, Saying to me, a panelist uh, on the WebEx interface. Can you confirm my voice is audible? It's uh, audible and clear. So we are waiting for our panelists to join the session. Ji, Assalamualaikum. I am Omar Ghani. I am here as a panelist.
We are just waiting for two of our uh, panelists to join. We will we'll start shortly. दिए वो भी ज्वाइन करने की कोशिश की उससे पहले वो जो आपने आईडी देखो आ गया जी डॉक्टर हमाद हेयर कैन यू हेम जी आवाज आई थी मैंने उधर अनम्यूट करके देखा है जी डॉक्टर हमाद हेयर फ्रॉम फास्ट इस्लाम कैन यू हेयर मी यस डॉक्टर हमाद आई कैन हेयर डॉक्टर Uh, so this is Milad Khanohi. My name is Dr. Amir Mehmood, and I'm associate professor at Kicks University uh, of Engineering and Technology, Lahore. I'm also a co-PI of National Center in Big Data and Cloud Computing. Uh, so today I all welcome all of you in this uh, panel for the ICOS 2020. Uh, the title of this panel is Fighting COVID-19 with Innovation, and then we will also look into some of the inherent problems that we have faced. Uh, during this pandemic so a little bit of my uh, introductory talk and then uh, we will have some introduction uh, from each of the panelists so as you know the covid-19 has changed our lives uh, drastically 
So there were new concepts emerged after the pandemic. So we all have to, or most of us have to work from home. And students, uh, we have to teach them online. And then there were other problems associated with our daily life. So it has impacted almost uh, all of the sectors, uh, either in banking sector or it's uh, financial or economy. So it has impacted all of these sectors. So today, uh, the goal of this uh, uh, panel is to see that how can we fight this COVID-19 uh, pandemic with innovations from industry and from academia. So uh, now I would like uh, you two, uh, we just have a round of uh, introduction. So each speaker uh, will have four minutes. Uh, what you can do, you can introduce yourself and then a little bit of background of your work and your opinion on COVID-19. So uh, let's start with Dr. Hamad. Dr. Hamad, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Dr. Hamad Naveed from FAS Islamabad. I'm, I'm an associate professor here. Um, I was trained as an undergraduate computer science student and then I did my PhD in bioinformatics. So, and from a unique sort of uh, perspective where uh, the department was uh, co run by um, and the engineering school and the medical school, which I think is uh, very necessary for an innovation point of view if you look at progressive universities. Uh, unfortunately, in Pakistan, we have separate medical universities, separate engineering universities. But if you want to innovate, um, the basic is you have to have uh, engineers, scientists, medical professions, entrepreneurs uh, close together in uh, the, with talking to each other. Otherwise, it's actually very difficult to sort of um, come up with solutions that work practically. Uh, so uh, this is what my experience is right now. I'm the director of uh, Office of Research, Innovation and Commercialization here in Paris, and we're trying to sort of have uh, active collaboration with the industry. Unfortunately, the industry is also quite sort of primitive in Pakistan. Um, uh, there is not enough sustained support uh, in terms, for example, if you want to uh, study viruses, you need to have uh, years and years of uh, sort of investment and um, NIH or CDC uh, constantly monitors the viral strains, flu viral strains in the US and every year there's a new viral uh, sort of uh, vaccine, uh, flu virus vaccine available. Uh, a couple of years back, um, even with all these resources, the uh, flu vaccine was only 42% uh, effective in the US. So you can imagine how much uh, uh, these viruses mutate and evolve and how much you need to study. It cannot be overnight that uh, suddenly uh, uh, something struck and then we have to uh, gear up and, and see all of these things. Um, these needs lots and lots and years and years of uh, sort of um, investment and support. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we look very short term. And just because this is upon us, we are talking about and having this discussion. Otherwise, we won't even be having a discussion. Uh, so I, I guess I, I'll stop here and sort of pass the mic to somebody else. Uh, Dr. Zartash, can you hear me? Yes, I can, I can hear you. Uh, kindly please uh, introduce yourself and your host. Gee, so um, my name is Atash. I teach computer science and uh, electrical engineering at uh, LUMPS. And uh, I am also uh, involved with the software industry in Pakistan. Um, we run a company, um, software services business named Pontes Limited out of Lahore. Uh, we also run parkwheels.com. And uh, we also um, run an IoT startup. Uh, it's Pretty much a startup, you know, in the first three, four years of, of incubation. And uh, the role of this company is to provide um, IoT solutions to uh, to the manufacturing industry in Pakistan. So, uh, you know, um, measuring processes in the in the assembly line processes in the manufacturing and uh, uh, measuring various variables from that and making decisions based on those variables. All right, uh, Dr. Adnan, can you hear us? Please introduce yourself. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Jee, alaikum. My name is Dr. Adnan, and uh, in this, uh, so something about myself. Uh, I'm an emergency uh, physician. 
um, dealing with the accident and emergency, as well as I am a healthcare technology consultant. I've been working with the United Nations, WHO, and uh, previously I've worked with NetSoul, uh, providing consultancy on uh, the healthcare side of the product, and then a couple of other products which I've worked on has been with the government and with the non-government organizations as well. Um, my expertise is uh, towards helping solutions as well as uh, providing like a medical sort of a opinion and as well as development in terms of uh, facilities like trauma facilities or trauma levels or other thing. Um, Achhi baat ye hai ki I've actually listened to the jo abhi tak maine introduction sunaye hain unme jo ek pehle saab hain jinhone kuch mention kiya hai regarding uh, um, engineering and academia work uh, medical side working together in terms of creating harmony I think I totally agree with that opinion and um, I think I'll run with that uh, sort of uh, mindset in this whole conversation uh, ahead um I agree there are no BSL labs there are no research op- ऑपरचुनिटीज जहां तक डेवलपमेंट की बात आ जाती है वहां पे फंडिंग की बात रुक जाती है आई थिंक फरहान फ्रॉम यू इज आल्सो वेरी वेल अवेयर दैट वी हैव बीन वर्किंग ऑन अ वेंटिलेटेड डेवलपमेंट एंड देन वी हिट कपल ऑफ मेजर रोड ब्लॉक्स to work out fine but it never has and never will be because of the red tape and all other people who are involved in this anyways um whatever i think um i might uh, share openly in this panel discussion and i hope uh, nobody is here to take any offense of that uh, kyunki i tend to be very open in my discussions um whoever <laughs> whoever comes forward i tend to answer that according to what i have seen in the real round, ground reality so anyways very well uh, very nice meeting all of you and i hope let's get this panel discussion started So our last uh, uh, speaker or panelist, uh, Mr. Omar Ghani. Uh, Omar, can you hear me? And can you please introduce yourself? Ji, Assalamualaikum. My name is Omar Ghani. Uh, I'm currently leading the efforts uh, within the Government of Pakistan Higher Education Commission uh, for the transformation of Pakistan into a knowledge economy. We believe it's critical to first transform our universities into what we call entrepreneurial universities. So we've been uh, uh, given lavish funding in which we have launched series of funds. I'm managing all those funds, and uh, at the same time, we are also looking to uh, develop the financial ecosystem with the State Bank of Pakistan and SECP to support the commercialization and startup venture creation activities. Uh, in addition to that, I also represent several uh, uh, task forces, and uh, one of the task forces that I represented. a national level task force that was constituted constituted at within ministry of science and technology to fight covid uh, uh, earlier this year and uh, within 3 months we, we produced about 76% of the technologies that we were importing on the first day when our first covid patient was uh, diagnosed in which we uh, through partnership with our academia and industry and strategic organizations we developed our own ventilators cpaps disinfectants sanitizers ppes masks and range of other things So that's my quick background. I come from the private sector. Prior to that, I was uh, heading a global organization called Shore Bank. That's behind the creation of an organization uh, known as Grameen Bank that won the Nobel Prize in 2006. And we are also behind the creation of almost 80% of the microfinance institutions operating in Pakistan. And most of the work done at the state bank level in the last 10 years, I've been leading that effort. to ensure that capital can flow to those segments of the community where traditionally doesn't flow and startups and smes is one of the key segments that i've been focusing on so that's my quick introduction thank you okay so uh, now i uh, uh, we have a wonderful panel from industry academia and uh, uh, from ptc so let me start the floor with the first question uh, So the first question is that uh, considering the second wave of COVID-19, uh, what is the need of ER and what is required, and how can academia and industry help in tackling uh, problems in the second wave? So I would like uh, the Pash uh, to start with. Thank you, um, thank you, Jana. Um, so I think uh, um, you know. Um, before jumping on to the technical solutions or or technical uh, interventions that we can do i think the first of the first of the things that we must do is that to make sure that uh, that people realize that uh, it's a it's a real threat and it's a it's a real 
uh, thing um, you know we should just uh, not assume that uh, um, this is this virus will go away on its own um, and if you compare the situation today um, with the situation about four or five months ago when the first wave of uh, of the virus hit Pakistan maybe six months ago at that time there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know respect for the lack of a better word respect for the for the disease and uh, <laughs> respect for the propagation and people were very uh, concerned very um, you, you know not going out and if somebody has to go out they would wear a mask and uh, were very very careful uh, about handling the, the propagation of the virus and i think that has probably contributed to the uh, to, to the curbing of the of the first wave as well uh, there might be other reasons as well that you know people will be making guesses about those and um, nobody would probably know the exact reason but um, but i think in in this second wave people have probably gotten used to um, that ye chalo 6 mahine se cheez ek chal rahi hai 7 mahine se chal rahi hai bas khatam kar de ab isko ab ye kya karna hai humne isko so people are le much less careful and i think it is visible if you just go outside gaadi mein bahar chale jaye grocery ke liye to jana hi padta hai but uh, if you go outside people are much less careful now so ek to ek to wo wali cheez hai um, ke in general the attitude of um, of being careful is is not there anymore uh, which is very scary because um, typically jo pandemics hoti hain unki second waves jo hain wo agar aap uh, study kare unko those are typically much higher as compared to the first waves and in countries ke andar second waves aayenge wahan pe hum dekh bhi rahe hain ki ye principle apply bhi ho raha hai so i think it, it is very 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 important that uh, people themselves they they tend to be should be careful uske liye Uh, use of social media, um, I think uh, that is something जो गवर्नमेंट ने एक बड़ा अच्छा किया था कि फोन पे कभी कॉल करते हैं तो आपको वो मैसेजेस आना शुरू हो जाते हैं एंड मैसेजेस कीप ऑन चेंजिंग ए ओशन वालों ने इनिशियटिव लॉन्च किया था सो दैट हैज वर्क आउट आई थिंक इट वुड हैव इट इज वेरी हार्ड टू मेजर द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ एनी ऑफ दीज इंटरवेंशन बट बट एनी थिंग दैट यू डू as long as common sense tells us that uh, it would not have any negative impact then uh, we should probably go ahead and do it you know lockdowns jo hain isko smart kahin ya you know it's very hard to come up with a definition of it but is a smart lockdown but you know lockdown curbing the free flow of of individuals wo kisi tarah se agar karni ho wo wo agar aap kar dein to that will help curb the um, the second wave uh, as well um so i think very important from the government standpoint is to to make sure that they use the mass communication medias you know phone ke upar to pehle se cheeze chal rahi hain um uske alawa government of pakistan ki taraf se kabhi kabhi smss bhi aa jate hote the pehle ab to you know it's uh, it's been a while um, so awareness campaigns is tarah ki cheeze definitely ho sakti hain now how can uh, industry and academia collaborate to um to tackle to tackle the problems in the in the second wave uh, i think industry has has uh, naturally come up to the um um uh, you know up to the up, up to the expectations that agar hum hum notice kare ki e-commerce jo hai wo pakistan ke andar bahut zyada uh, proliferate ho gayi hai aur uh, ya yun kahe ki expand ho gayi hai during this time um and i think industry has kept up with the with the pace or uh, uh, what are the needs and the, the challenges which arise the supply chain aapne kaise maintain rakhni hai aapne logo ko uh, uh, items of daily use or uh, necessary use wo kis tarah se deliver karni hai uske liye jo hai wo uh, technology ke point of view se agar dekha jaye to industry has played a, a an interesting role and i think important role as well log jo hain wo unhone apni apne aap ko scale up kiya hai grocery delivery ki applications jo hain unhone apne aap ko scale up kar liya hai jahan pe wo pehle traffic handle karte the traffic has probably increased by an order of magnitude and they are still able to handle that very well um, so that is something that uh, uh, i think has been a very positive contribution from the industry बाकी टेक्नोलॉजी के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से जो है वो अगेन 
जब इस तरह की कोई पैंडेमिक होती है तो एक तो चैलेंज नहीं होता उसके अंदर जो है ना वो मल्टी फैसेटेड टाइप ऑफ प्रॉब्लम होती है सप्लाई चेन की एक चीज होगी तो दूसरे पेशेंट मैनेजमेंट की एक और होगी डेवलपमेंट ऑफ वेंटिलेटर्स लुक आई आई डू नो दैट सेवरल ग्रुप्स हैव हैव बीन वर्किंग ऑन दैट अभी किसी ने मेंशन भी किया एंड दे आर परहैप्स नॉट द ओनली वन जो जिन्होंने वेंटिलेटर पे काम किया और कुछ सक्सेस भी हुई थी फिर वेंटिलेटर्स को यू नो सिंगल वेंटिलेटर को आपने मल्टीपल पेशेंट्स पे किस तरह से यूज करना है उसके ऊपर भी कुछ जो है ना वो लोग काम करते रहे हैं टेस्टिंग जो है वो उसके लिए कोई इनोवेटिव मेथड्स किस तरह से डेवलप किए जा सकते हैं सो आई डू रिमेंबर कपल ऑफ मंथ्स गो यू नो सेल फोन्स को यूज करके किस तरीके से जो है ये वेदर दिस इज ए रेगुलर कफ और दिस इज ए कोविड रिलेटेड कफ सो डिटेक्टिंग कोविड इज इज इम्पोर्टेंट बिकॉज यू डेन वॉन्ट टू आइसोलेट पीपल उनको आप कंटेन कर लेंगे क्वारंटीन कर देंगे सो ये एम आई टी में कहीं पर एप्लीकेशन है किस तरह की डिवेलप हुई थी मोर रिसेंटली अनदर फ्रेंड ऑफ माइंड जो कैनेडा में होते हैं पाकिस्तान से काफी अरसे से नकीब साहब डॉक्टर नकीब यू नो ही इज ए मेडिकल डॉक्टर बट बट ही इज ए यू नो मोर देन एन इंजीनियर तो वो बड़ी मेडिकल की जो है वो शॉप जो डेवलप करते रहते हैं सो वेरी रिसेंटली उन्होंने वो टू प्रोटोन्स के नाम से जो है उनकी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है उन्होंने कोई टेस्ट डेवलप किया है by using photons and by just using the cell phone को measure कर लेते हैं किसी तरह से I I don't know the intricate details क्या कि वो उसके पीछे science क्या वो कैसे काम करती है but you know there is a lot of buzz created for that so so as I said कि multifaceted type of uh, challenges which arise and uh, technology can uh, can contribute into into every one of them data science को use कर सकते हैं to analyze के किस जगह पे जो है वो Uh, you know how the cases are increasing decreasing and then you know uh, provide the feedback according to that um uski uske jo bhi aapne steps lene hai based on the based on the data wale so data driven approach hai kare hum us data ka analysis karne ke liye we can use a lot of tools from uh, computing se hum le sakte hain yeah so i think uh, that's uh, that's perhaps uh, you know a broader kind of a of a picture aapki you know uh, it would be great to hear the opinion of other panelists as, as well so so thank you dr datta so i would like to hear from dr adnan so what is the perspective from the from the clinical uh, point of view ji <laughs> thank you very much uh मैं सर एक ओपिनियन इज कम्प्लीटली डिफरेंट चीजें कुछ कुछ सही की गई सही बातें की गई हैं एंड आई अप्रिशिएट ऑल दोस कन्वर्सेशन बट आई बिलीव इन दिस होल कोविड नाइनटीन की सेकंड वेव की मैनेजमेंट एंड हाउ व्हाट विल हेल्प इन टैकलिंग द प्रॉब्लम्स एंड व्हाट नॉट इसके अंदर आई थिंक देर आर फ्यू पॉइंटर्स जो कि आई थिंक ट्रम्प्स एवरीथिंग वन इज लिटरेसी we have to improve literacy no matter what the stupidity of the people around you cannot imagine i being in, being in the front line of the emergency being uh, already being infected through covid and went through it uh, you know and also seeing how people behave during the whole and managing the covid patient i have seen the worst of the things happening even though their people are being facing the difficult of the difficult things possible but that the community tends to just ignore it so pehli to cheez ye hai ke literacy no matter what books 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 education 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 there is nothing that second and the most important thing is uh tackling the misuse of internet or social media the disinformation which is being spread That needs to be tackled. Uh, I think अगर ये दो काम ही हो जाए ठीक है ना तो आई थिंक अलॉट मोर थिंग्स कैन बी कम अकम्पलिश लिसन अगर देखा जाए तो यू नो वी टॉकिंग अबाउट मास्क वी टॉकिंग अबाउट पीपीज वी टॉकिंग अबाउट के एन नाइनटी फाइव वट एवर एवरी इंडस्ट्री गॉट स्केल्ड अप ठीक है ना इट टुक सम टाइम बट इट स्केल्ड अप ठीक है um, हर इंडस्ट्री ने उसे कोप कर लिया ठीक है वेंट यहाँ पे बहुत काम हुए लेकिन देखें एक 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 सेंस है कि जी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ जो मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ इंफॉर्मेशन है मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ साइंस है ठीक है ना नो मैटर इफ द वेंटिलेटर इज इज बीइंग इवन डेवलप्ड द परसेप्शन वी हैव गॉटन और नो मैटर अदर डिवाइस बींग डिवेलप्ड तो उनके लिए ना एक एक इन्वेसिव ह्यूमन डिवाइस को एक्सेप्ट करना इवन दो इट इज बिन वर्किंग लाइक अ चार्म इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट फॉर दम टू टू जस्ट एक्सेप्ट इट सो अगर देखा भी जाए तो उस डिफिकल्ट टाइम के अंदर 
that there was a shortage of ventilator, but you know those ventilators are being acquired now, and everything is getting back up, uh, in the, into the normal scenario. Lekin wo aista aista karte karte, you know, we are up to the speed in terms of stocking, in terms of having. Ab you know, a simple hospitals can dekhen to do do like panra panra bees bees thousand PPEs jo hain, wo in stock available hain just to tackle emergency. Lekin masla kahan pe aata hai? Masla wohi mindset ka hai, masla wohi literacy ka hai. Ke that you know har banda जो है वो एक अपनी ओपिनियन और अपना गाइडलाइंस क्रिएट करके बैठा हुआ है इज नो सेंट्रलाइज अथॉरिटी टू क्रिएट सर्टेन गाइडलाइंस जब वो गाइडलाइंस अगर क्रिएट की भी जाती है तो उसको इन्फोर्स नहीं किया जाता ठीक है तो ये एक मेजर कंसर्न है फॉर एग्जांपल देखा जाए तो जी रिकमेंड ये किया जाता है जी एक पीपी अगर आपने वेयर कर ली तो दैट पीपी नीड्स टू बी डिस्ट्रॉयड आफ्टर अ सर्टेन पीरियड ऑफ टाइम विद इन दैट हॉस्पिटल जब आप ड्यूटी से क्लियर होते हैं लेकिन वो एनआईएच की गाइडलाइंस भी आ गई लेकिन हॉस्पिटल्स वाले दे डोंट दे डोंट एक्सेप्ट इट दे नहीं 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 हम इसको वॉश करेंगे और दोबारा पहनेंगे क्यों हम जाए नहीं अच्छा जी ठीक है दैट क्रिएट सर्टन माइंड सेट जिसको आप चेंज नहीं कर सकते दैट माइंड सेट कैन ओनली बी चेंज बाय लिटरेसी कैन ओनली बी चेंज बाय यू नो डिस्क्रेडिटिंग डिस इन्फॉर्मेशन विच इज बीइंग स्प्रेड ऑन द ऑन द इंटरनेट और ऑन द सोशल मीडिया एज वेल एज द न्यूज आउटलेट्स और जहां तक रहेगी बात के जी इसको इस वेव को कंट्रोल के संग देखें I think I think these two points actually justify everything. Okay, if we, अब वो देखें लोगों ने एक चीज कहना शुरू कर दी है that six feet दूर रहें and now the science um, uh, recently I've shared some articles. Science have actually proven that that six feet distance would not do anything. ठीक है ना the the particles tend to separate spread on a very veracity of the length and as well as a certain person who's uh, who's a COVID positive patient if he's walking on the street uh, his tra- trail trail marks would carry uh, COVID. स्पॉट्स uh, तो अब लोगों को इस चीज को अंडरस्टैंड करने की जरूरत है देर इज लॉट ऑफ प्रोटेक्शन विच इज नीड टू बी नीडेड एंड दैट कैन ओनली बी बी जिस तरह पहले भी मेरे पहले पैनलिस्ट ने भी यही बात डिस्कस की कि अवेयरनेस द मोर द अवेयरनेस इज ग्रेट देखें मेडिसिन मे बी इसकी मेडिसिन ये जो अब कह रहे हैं वैक्सीन आई एक्सेप्ट हो सकता है कि इसकी वैक्सीन बहुत जल्दी डिवेलप हो जाए एंड आई एम वेरी हैप्पी फॉर इट के एवरीबडी इज वर्किंग ऑन इट लेकिन एट द एंड ऑफ द डे वैक्सीन की डिवेलपमेंट कब होती है दैट शुड नॉट बी दैट प्रायोरिटी डिवेलपमेंट द प्रायोरिटी शुड बी कि हम किस तरह इसको डिफीट कर सकते हैं वैक्सीनेशन आ जाएंगी मेडिसिन आ जाएंगी ओवर द कोर्स पीरियड टाइम आ जाएंगी लेकिन इट इट रिक्वायर्स अ सर्टन विल एंड अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द डिजीज इट जहां तक आ जाती है जी एकेडेमिया की बात और उसके अंदर क्या हो सकता है यस देर आर नो बी एस एल थ्री बी एस एल फोर लैब्स बी एस एल फोर लैब्स के अंदर जहां पे वायरस की स्टडी की जाए नाउ आई थिंक वी आर फेसिंग द थर्ड स्ट्रेन जो कि डेवलप दो स्ट्रेन तो हमें पता थिंक वायरस की पाकिस्तान के अंदर मौजूद है कराची और एक गिलगिस्तान के नाम से गिलगित के नाम से मतलब के डेवलप हुई था एक जो थर्ड स्ट्रेन है वो जो रिसेंटली एंटर हुई है विच इज एक्चुअली कॉजिंग फॉर मोर हैविक इवन के पी के ऊपर डिटेक्शन भी नहीं हो रही सो दैट्स that's a more um, you know concerning thing as well and i think meri puri conversation ka jo crux wo yahi hoga ke learn education learn education and that's it इससे इससे अलावा मैं नहीं समझता कि हम जितनी मर्जी एडवांसमेंट कर लें हम जितनी मर्जी चीजें कर लें एक बंदे के अंदर एक शऊर नहीं क्रिएट होगा ना तो ही वोट बी ही वोट बी एबल टू टैकल ऑल दीज इशूज एट दिस पॉइंट थैंक यू और हमारी यूनिवर्सिटियां बंद है देर इज नॉट इनफ इंफॉर्मेशन गोइंग बैक टू द पॉलिसी मेकर जिसने डॉक्टर अदनान ने अभी एक बात की थर्ड स्ट्रेन आ गई है पूरे पाकिस्तान में दो तो डीएनए सीक्वेंसिंग मशीन है वो डीएनए हो कहाँ है सीक्वेंसिंग चेक कहाँ करें कि हमारी स्ट्रेन है भी कोई डिफरेंट के नहीं कि उसमें म्यूटेशन है भी के नहीं हमने तो आज तक ये चीज देखी ही नहीं है एंड इज एक्चुअली नॉर्मल पार्ट ऑफ अ यूनिवर्सिटी कल्चर के जिसमें आप नई चीज को स्टडी कर रहे हो ठीक है तो वी डोंवन नो वट म्यूटेशन इट इज वेयर इट इज क्या कर सकते हैं उसके साथ वी बिन वेटिंग फॉर वैक्सीन बाहर बना रहे हम क्यों नहीं बना सकते हम वो मेडिसिन क्यों नहीं बना सकते इसमें ऐसा क्या मसला है सो द थिंग द थिंग टू डू इज अगेन आई एम हैप्पी के एच ई सी इज वर्किंग लिटल बिट ऑन दैट बट रिसेंटली जो एच ई सी ने लॉट ऑफ नेशनल सेंटर्स बनाए थे उसमें से ढेर मेडिकल पे काम कर रही है लैब्स 
क्या एच ने किसी को भी कांटेक्ट किया कि आप हेल्प कर सकते हैं इस पे नो no. जो उन्होंने काम किया कि एच ने आज तक किसी हॉस्पिटल में जाके प्रेजेंट किया मेडिसिन उसके अंदर कि भाई ये काम हमने खुद किया है हमने पैसे दे करवाया है नो no. तो देर देर इज अज गैप हम बातें तो बहुत करते हैं लेकिन एक्चुअली काम करना इतना इस तरह नहीं होता जिस तरह हम कर रहे हैं सो वी नीड वी नीड टू थिंक अलॉट मोर वी नीड टू हैव जिस तरह अभी फॉर एग्जांपल जो अभी आते हैं ये तीन चार तो सेंटर्स के साथ आए हैं कि वो फोकस था उसके ऊपर कि भाई ए से रिलेटेड आई है बट ए आई से अच्छा ब्रॉड फील्ड आपको क्या वॉट इज आर नेशनल नीड क्या हमने अपने वाटर रिसोर्स बेहतर करने हैं हमने ऑयल की पंपिंग बेहतर करनी है जहाँ पे ये ग्रांट्स फोकस आती है ना उसके ऊपर वहां से ही काम होते हैं आई सीन इन द मिडल ईस्ट बंदे जो आईओटी पे और वायरलेस नेटवर्क पे काम करते थे वो ऑयल की एफिशिएंसी निकालने ज्यादा एफिशिएंट पे काम निकालने के लिए उस पर काम करना शुरू क्योंकि ग्रांट्स ही उधर अवेलेबल यू डोंट इवन नो आर नेशनल नीड्स उसका इतना ओपन एंडेड ग्रांट आती है कि जिसके पे आप कोई भी बंदा अंडर द सन कोई भी लिख देता है उसके बाद माशाला से जो रिव्यूर्स है हमारे एच के If you are not getting the reviews right, how do you know you are giving the right grant? So uh, academia का तो हालात में बहुत ज़्यादा अभी improvement की ज़रूरत है and there are many many examples that can can be given, but there is there is absolutely no place to give that. आप इसी से किसी को लेके देखें. इन्होंने बड़ी अच्छी बात की है मैं सिर्फ एक छोटी सी एड मेरा ख्याल है ये बात सब उसको एक्सप्लेन करेंगे कि फाइजर इज अ बिगेस्ट फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनी आउट देयर दे स्टूड इन बिहाइंड बायो एंड टेक एंड दे स्टूड बिहाइंड साइनो बायो दे स्टूड बिहाइंड अदर के भाई हम फर्निंग प्रोवाइड करते हैं यू जस्ट डिवेलप द थिंग विच यू आर डिवेलपिंग हमारे पास तो आरएनए को जो जिस जिस टेक्निक के ऊपर काम हुआ है जिस टेक्निक में आरएनए रिवर्स इंजरिंग आरएनए ब्रेकडाउन कैस नाइन प्रोटीन के ऊपर काम हुआ है जिसने जिसकी वजह से ये वैक्सीनेशन क्रिएट किया हमारे पास तो वो सर्विसेज हमारे पास तो ये नहीं पता लग रहा कि वो जो म्यूटेशन क्रिएट हो रही है हम उस म्यूटेशन को सेपरेट किस तरह कर सकते हैं या उसके ऊपर काम किस तरह कर सकते हैं एग्जैक्टली ही इज राइट नॉट गेटिंग एनी फंडिंग स्पेसिफिक टारगेटेड स्पेसिफिक फंडिंग और दूसरा ये हमारा इंडस्ट्रियल सेगमेंट ही इसके अंदर इन्वॉल्व नहीं होता ठीक है ना हमारा अगर इंडस्ट्रियल सेगमेंट है अगर इंजीनियरिंग साइड जिस तरह इंजीनियरिंग जो बहुत बड़ी बड़ी कंपनीज हैं वो इन्वॉल्व हो वो कहें जी हमें इस चीज की हमें इस चीज की मॉडलिंग चाहिए हमें इस चीज की ऑटोमेशन चाहिए एकेडेमिया उसको बिल्ड करके दे और वो उसको बैक एंड पे खड़े होकर उसको फंडिंग करे नहीं हम आई थिंक वी शुड नॉट लुक एट द गवर्नमेंट फॉर द फंडिंग आई थिंक प्राइवेट सेक्टर शुड कम फॉरवर्ड फॉर द फंडिंग ऑफ दी फॉर द फंडिंग ऑफ द यूनिवर्सिटीज फॉर द फंडिंग ऑफ एजुकेशन ताकि वो अपने पेटेंट अपने नाम पर रजिस्टर कराएं वो उस चीज को लेकर फॉरवर्ड हो वो उसके अंदर पैसे डालें चीज सामने आए आई थिंक carry on please i i just wanted to add so bilkul we are getting to the right point lekin private wale pehle hi paisa kama rahe hain to wo kyun aayenge uske liye policy banani padti hai for example canada mein ye policy ab hamare paas pharmaceutical companies yahan se betahasha paisa kama ke ja rahi hain canada ne kya kiya hai yahan pe wo sirf market karti hain apne bechti hain aur wapas le jati hain yahan pe kyun nahi hai research center kisi bhi pharmaceutical company ka उसकी रीजन ये है कि वी आर नॉट फोर्सिंग देम आप कैनेडा के अंदर टैक्सेस तो आपके पास ऑप्शन है यू कैन इन्वेस्ट इन द रिसर्च और यू कैन पे टू द गवर्नमेंट आप जिस भी फार्मास्यूटिकल को कहेंगे कि टैक्स आप दे सकते हैं जितनी जगह रिसर्च करा सकते हैं यहाँ पे रिसर्च सेंटर खुल जाएंगे ये पता नहीं कितने फोरम से हम बात कर चुके हैं एच के सामने एच के चेयरमैन के सामने बट सम हाउ ड गेट थ्रू सर मैं कह रहा हूँ ना यूएसएफ का फंड बनाया था मोबाइल कंपनियां वन परसेंट देती थी अपना इस तरह फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनियों का क्यों नहीं बनता इस तरह ये जो एंग्रो इस तरह की जिस तरह बड़ी बड़ी कंपनियां वो क्यों नहीं अपना एक वन परसेंट बनाती है वो क्यों नहीं एक ऐसा फंड पुल क्रिएट करती है विच कैन बी एक्चुअली डेवर्टेड टू गवर्नमेंट एकेडीमियस टू एक्चुअली क्रिएट सम सोल्यूशन हमारी तो स्किल डेवलपमेंट नहीं एक्टली लेकिन गवर्नमेंट की तरफ से और उसमें भी एक बार जो है वो सर्कुलर डेट में उसको पे करने के लिए इस्तेमाल हो गया पिछले तीन साल से एक लाइट ने कोई फंडिंग नहीं दी है सो इवन दो दैट दैट फंड इज देयर नॉट बीइंग यूज्ड सो देयर हैज टू बी पॉलिसी मेजर्स अ लॉट ऑफ वर्क हैज टू कम फ्रॉम द टॉप ये नहीं कि हमारे पास बहुत अच्छे बंदे नहीं है यहां पे या वो देयर हैज टू बी अ सस्टेनड एफर्ट दैट लीड्स टू और वो कोई नहीं है इस वक्त दैट्स व्हाट एज आई सेड एकेडेमिया इज क्लोज्ड राइट नाउ राइट जी 
So I think the question is, it's a very uh, uh, sort of uh, question that requires a very deep response. Uh, I mean, I've heard some of the panelists. Uh, so I'm going to uh, follow a sequence of thought and I'll come back to your second question regarding what HSC is doing. First of all, my mind is that we have a multi-prong strategy here. And uh, you know, just doing one bit and not doing the other bit is not going to help us. So you know, Dr. Satash very correctly pointed out that we have a huge need to focus on bringing about a behavior change, uh, without which, uh, no matter what we do as far as developing technology, if it's not diffused and used properly by the those who need to use it, it's not going to deliver the end result. So behavior change is critical. But also we need to keep the context of what kind of lifestyle uh, lifestyle challenges we expect in, in, in the wake of COVID and post-COVID world that we'll be living in. You know, uh, doing remote activities is going to be perhaps a new norm that we all need to adjust to. Uh, you know, lots of technologies can be produced to be able to do things that can reduce the exposure of people uh, to this virus. Uh, and uh, a lot of those technologies actually are available in the market, but just the very fact that we are not able to put all those those things together to accelerate those markets and to be able to provide remote solutions uh, to the scale that we need to, that is not happening. Uh, and, and we need to drill down deeper uh, into what could be the role of industry, academia, and most importantly, the policymaker here. Uh, because they have a bit of control over the situation. And, you know, if you look at the scenario in which Chinese government stepped in and, and you know, Pass some uh, decisions. They they had the luxury of not having a democracy in their system, and they could take a decision and implement that solution, uh, you know, uh, uh, policy with ease. We don't have that. We live in a democratic world where we have to bring everyone together. So it is not just the role of HSC or any one particular organization. There are multiple organizations. It's a complex web of uh, policy makers out there that we need to bring together. I mean, for example, I'll tell you when we were working on developing the ventilators and these technologies, making the ventilator and these technologies was the easiest part. But dealing with DRAP, DRAP didn't have any capacity to evaluate and regulate the electromedical devices. They didn't have the acceptance test procedures. So working with them was a nightmare. Uh, in fact, much more difficult than having developing those technologies with all these strategic organizations, X, Y, Z. Ji, so I have just joined HSC, uh, you know, and I, what I've seen in HSC that over the, you know, HSC also lacks serious capacity, as was rightly pointed out by one of the panelists. And, you know, so we need to really work on HSC's capacity and also other policymakers and other departments who are operating in, in this space uh, on their capacity to be able to cope with this situation. Most of the uh, government uh, organizations are lacking serious capacity, including the public sector universities. I recently went on a cross country and visited about over 110 universities physically myself uh, in the last five weeks across six provinces, including Kashmir. And I tell you, I mean, uh, we, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of capability, uh, but the ability to take that knowledge out of the labs and create functional prototypes, industrial grade prototypes, and accelerate those prototypes is is lacking. And and more importantly than that, I mean, uh, when once one of our policymakers was talking about that, we don't know our research priorities. Well, at the government level, the government knows the research priorities, and there are lots of uh, research studies done. I mean, personally, I have carried out about 27 national level assignments uh, as a consultant from the private sector for State Bank, World Bank, and a whole host of other multilateral donors. And I know, I mean, you know, there's a lot of research out there and the national growth policy, provincial growth policies are defined. But when you look at the university level, not a single university in my visit uh, had defined their own research priorities based on their own uh, capabilities, based on their own disciplines in which they're specializing in, the industry that they're linked to, uh, you know, and, you know, create the, the inability of university to create these interdisciplinary teams and defining the research priorities and providing the right incentives to their own staff. Also, you, you have to blame HSC for, for giving, not giving the direction and giving policies that has pushed the research community in a direction where they're all busy in a rat race public, of publications rather than focusing on commercialization and solving the needs of the industry and society. So, we need to look at this complex paradigm, look at the industry, look at the academia, look at the, uh, the policy maker and try to solve these issues. Someone also mentioned one of our team members, Dr. Nakib, uh, who was very um, active member of our team in Ministry of Science that worked on the ventilators and a range of technologies. And I've known Dr. Nakib for the last almost 20, 25 years. He's a phenomenal guy. But you know that he's, and I'm going to talk about his case study as, as, as an example of what is going wrong in Pakistan. 
So this is the guy who comes back to Pakistan every 10 years with his passion to deliver and transfer his knowledge and lots of technologies he's dealing with. And every 10 years he comes back, spends about a year, two years, gets frustrated and leaves, goes back to Canada. He came back again this time around. And this time around, we caught him in, in you know, at a time where we were dealing with COVID and he helped us uh, significantly in dealing with a lot of things that we were doing in the Ministry of Science. He, you know, and... You know, I mean, the point is that, you know, the kind of things that he was doing and, you know, I was basically navigating him across pretty much every government department that you can think of. The people sitting there didn't have the capacity to absorb what he was trying to do. He ultimately left and went back and developed this technology, which is uh, a new technology, uh, APMR. It's, APMR is a nanoparticle. You break down photon into uh, minute uh, uh, nanoparticles which latch onto the virus and through, 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 through the smartphones you are able to detect that virus, not just COVID, you can virtually detect any virus. And this technology can be embedded into, uh, uh, you know, your uh, remote patient care platforms, not telemedicine, those are like very basic functionalities, but they're very advanced remote patient care platforms also developed by a lot of our innovators in, in, in the environment. But, you know, the government, you know, when, when, when you talk to government, when you talk to the policymaker, you know, uh, you know it's, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, if you're dealing with complex solutions and complex technologies, it's very difficult to communicate what you're trying to do. And I tell you, we, we spent about a year, uh, you know, communicating to the government that there's, there's a critical need to protect the frontline health worker. Before, you know, this is, I think, first week of March, we gave a very detailed proposal to the government and multiple departments in the government that they need to adopt this platform that we had originally developed a team um, that basically is currently leading the Gates Foundation project in NIH. Previously, they were doing it privately and they had given a proposal to the government that, you know, you take this proposal and you, you implement this entire solution. What the solution allows you to do is that, you know, you could perhaps monitor patients remotely. Uh, you know, when, when you give ventilator to a patient, uh, the protocol requires the frontline healthcare worker to be around that patient for 24 hours and around the clock. But, you know, putting that frontline health worker in a COVID situation in front of that COVID patient is like, you know, uh, almost, uh, you know, very dangerous. So how can you protect that frontline health worker? So this platform was developed and given to the government on day one. The government uh, could not think beyond telemedicine. Telemedicine is just like a Skype where doctors and patients are interacting. It does not give you functionality to be able to deal with the kind of things that uh, a remote patient care platform allows you to do. Right? I mean, these are you need to comply with all kinds of uh, HIPAA compliance and other compliance. Uh, each medical device has an IoT, and you know you have a dashboard where the administration, the doctor, the frontline healthcare worker, they have all their own dashboards. And they get uh, data on the patient on a real-time basis. And anything goes wrong, the emergency system can sort of uh, put all the things in motion and you know uh, deal with that situation uh, on a very fast track basis. And uh, it doesn't. The idea is bringing healthcare to home, but the government was not able to absorb that technology. Uh, similarly, I mean, when you look at payments in e-commerce, and someone was talking about e-commerce. E I mean, if you look at uh, Pakistan's history over the last 20 years, we've faced several emergency situations. IDP SWAT was one of them. Earthquake was another one of them. We're dealing with one now. But when you look at IDP SWAT, which was 15 years back, even then we were distributing uh, cash in the hands of people. And over the last 20 years, we've developed a range of technologies and a complete policy fragmentation at the state bank level where you initially started transfers banking, 17 licenses were given, then PSO, PSP licensing scheme came in, Asan account scheme came in, recently EMI scheme uh, came in, Bill Gates gave a, gave a little bit of uh, funding to Karandas, and now State Bank has started going in a different direction with micropayment gateway and all kinds of things. But what are you doing with this technology if you are not even able to, you know, uh, to give uh, ISA some uh, cash into the uh, accounts of people in, in, in a... Uh, in a digital, uh, in a cashless manner, then what is the benefit of these uh, technologies? Even 20 years back, we had 80% of our population which was unbanked. Even today, 80% of our population is unbanked. And despite all the efforts of our state banks, the question is, the ideas, the solutions are here. And I'm just going to wrap up, just last, last. The ideas and solutions, and I'm sitting on the national pipeline of proposals and technologies that have been submitted to, to HEC. It is not HSC's role to do everything out there. There are departments and ministries who have their mandates and everyone needs to come together. We live in a complex world where, the, where these problems can only be solved if you take an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and interministerial approach. 
people need to come out of their silos. Even the proposals I'm seeing from the academia coming here, we had about 900 proposals in Grand Challenge Fund. We were supposed to give 25 proposals out and we were criticized that, you know, uh, this is just a small number. But our challenge was we could not even find, find five good proposals. More than 850 proposals were rejected because the ideas were good, but the researchers were not thinking in a multidisciplinary research. I mean, they, you could do a technology, but you don't look at the regulatory environment. You don't look at the commercial aspects of it. You know, you will not be able to take that solution uh, to the last mile and deliver impact. That knowledge will remain in your lab, and that is what has been happening. A lot of funding has been going out to universities. A lot of knowledge has been created, but not a single product solution or impact have, have been delivered in the past. Yes, HEC is to be blamed. Yes, government of Pakistan is to be blamed. But academia, industry, we are all in it. We are all to be blamed. We all need to come together and work together to solve, and we need to get out of this mindset of pointing, pointing fingers on one and the other. Uh, I, I see issues in almost every pillar. So that this is my quick quick nutshell. We're doing a lot of things in HSC, and perhaps if I get a chance, I'll explain. But some people are trying to uh, say a few things. So I'm going to pause. Anybody is laying it completely. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. is laying it. These are all the issues which we actually need uh, solutions to, and you have actually mentioned every one of them in a very absolute detail i've seen the hec working i've seen how things are going on but they can um uh, we sit down with a lot of people so we have this common uh, questions which arises care business ko jo padhane wale hain unhone zindagi mein kabhi business nahi kiya it mein padhane wale unhone kabhi it kabhi it software houses nahi chalaye jin jin jahan pe unhone problems face nahi ki um medicine mein jo aaye hain you know, उन्होंने ने एमफिल कर एमफिल कर लिया एनाटॉमी में तो वाकई एनाटॉमी पढ़ाना शुरू कर दिया जी मैंने कहने का मतलब है कि देखिए जी कन्वेयर बेल्ट होती है आपकी रिले रेस होती है उसमें एक बंदा जाता है बेटे नगले को देता है दूसरा बंदा बेटे नगले को देता है we need to figure out who's doing what, who's specialized in doing what. Pakistan, where people try to be jack of all trades. People think they can do everything. You know, this is a world of specialization. Uh, I mean, researcher can do research, but not necessarily be able to create a product or a prototype. Uh, someone who creates a product perhaps cannot create a business. Uh, so everyone has its own specialization, and we need to see that in that context and create a model, an equity sharing model where everyone gets to take a share of what, what what kind of IP is being created, what kind of wealth is being created. Omar, uh, sorry, in, in, in the interest of time, I have to interrupt you. So, um, unless uh, uh, Dr. Dattash and Dr. Hamad has to say uh, something uh, or has to has a comment, so I will jump to the second question. Ji, please. Please, second question. Right. So, the second question is, uh, uh, I mean, we have been uh, focusing on the first wave, but what what kind of a response we have seen from academia? I mean, we have discussed a lot of these things, so uh, most of the questions that I've made actually been discussed in parts. So, I mean, are there any uh, success stories in terms of the uh, technology for market ready or robust enough to meet the demand at scale that you people have mentioned? So, do we, do we have seen in the first wave any kind of responses from academia? Should I respond to that, or you're asking a specific question from someone? I would like to ask uh, either the Tash or Hamad. So I can I can go first. लेकिन मुझे लगता है कि उमर शायद ज़्यादा अच्छा जवाब दे सकेंगे इसके because he is sitting in HEC. शायद उनको uh, he would have more visibility into what the universities are doing. I would probably know what is happening at LAMS more. And what is happening at few other university where I have friends working. Um, so, मुझे मुझे ये लगता है कि again as we said that uh, uh, you know this uh, issue has uh, many different prongs सबको हमें address करने. Um, so in terms of in terms of technology, we have been talking about you know contact tracing applications and things like that. I don't think that you know any good contact tracing application जो है वो कहीं डेवलप हुई है आई आई सीरियसली डाउट जो कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग की करते भी हैं 
बिकॉज यू नो फॉर कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग आपको ये करना होगा कि यू नो विद इन क्लोज वेसिनिटी आप अगर किसी के आ रहे हैं तो आपके जो सेल फोन लोकेशन टावर से आप जो सेल फोन लोकेशन करते हैं उसका उसके अपना मार्जिन ऑफ एरर इतना ज्यादा होता है कि आपको पता नहीं चलेगा एंड देन इन साइड द बिल्डिंग हाउ यू विल हैंडल दैट सो आई डोंट थिंक कि उस एरिए के अंदर तो कुछ है मुझे जो मेरे नॉलेज के अंदर है एंड माई नॉलेज फॉर्डन माई माई नॉलेज विच माइट बी वेरी लिमिटेड इज के जो बायोलॉजी uh, के कुछ डिपार्टमेंट्स हैं इन पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी में भी कैजम में और लम्स के अंदर जो है वो कुछ लोगों को जो मेरे कलीग्स हैं उनको मैं जानता हूँ you know these people have been working on on analyzing the uh, the the dna the rna is uh, kis tarah se iski propagation kis tarah se hoti hai what are the foundations mujhe nahi pata ke ye wo kitna useful hai in practical sense immediately so maybe uska immediate practical use shall limited hoga but maybe for long term ke liye ho sakte hain similarly jo ventilators ki construction hai uske upar jo hai wo several groups in pakistan are working belonging to academia as well kuch to shayad industry ke log bhi kaam kar rahe hain but academia ke andar bhi jo hai uske upar log kaam kar rahe hain itu mein i i do remember you know some guy itu ke andar wo kaam kar rahe the and we hear about again personally to main nahi shayad sare logon ko janta बट ये है कि उन लोगों ने इसके ऊपर काफी एफर्ट डाली है ये एक एकेडमिया की तरफ से कंट्रीब्यूशन है बाकी ये मेरा ख्याल है कि उमर साहब ने जिन नकीब की बात की है मैं भी उन्हीं नकीब को जानता हूँ वो जो जिन्होंने अभी टू टू फोट टेक्नोलॉजी वो जो डेवलप की है कोविड टेस्टिंग के लिए तो एंड एंड आई आई थिंक द काइंड ऑफ अ गाय वेरी वेरी ऑनेस्ट सिंसियर विद पाकिस्तान के मैं कुछ करता हूँ मेडिकल फील्ड के अंदर और वो मैं मैं भी उससे कुछ तकरीबन 20 साल से जानता हूँ तो लगा रहता है लगा रहता है बेचारा जो है ना मेडिकल डॉक्टर है लेकिन उसको इंजीनियर से ज्यादा इंजीनियरिंग आती है इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स को जो है ना वो शायद हम सबसे अच्छी कर सकता है जो जो हम इंजीनियर है तो आई थिंक दिस गाय हैज डन अ लॉट ऑफ वर्क बहुत सारी चीजें डेवलप करने में मेडिकल की और कोविड से रिलेटेड जो है वो अभी मुझे चंद दिन पहले उसने बताया था कि ये टेस्टिंग डेवलप हुई है और यू नो कनाडा में बड़ी उसको जो है ना वो देर इज लॉट ऑफ अप्रिसिएशन फॉर दैट पाकिस्तान में शायद जो है वो कोई उसको खातिर में नहीं लाएगा या शायद वो कहीं जो है ना वो किताबों में ही फंस जाएगी बट बट रियली एकेडमिया की तरफ से अगर देखा जाए तो कोई बहुत ऐसा ऐसी नहीं है कोई चीज के जिसको मैं कहूँ कि प्रैक्टिकल यूज वाली जो है ना वो फॉरन से सामने आ जाएगी इंडस्ट्री ने थोड़ा कंट्रीब्यूट जरूर किया है बाकी एच सी के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से अगर उमर साहब कुछ अगर ऐड करना चाहे तो बात की थी क्या कहते हैं जहां तक टेक्नोलॉजी की बात आती है कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग की बात आती है गूगल हैज इंटीग्रेटेड इन इट सिस्टम नाउ That every Android phone is contact traceable. लेकिन वो जिस तरह उमर भाई सॉरी गनी भाई कह रहे थे कि उसको कोई यूटिलाइज करे ना उसको ये गवर्नमेंट अंडरस्टैंड करे जो 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 गनी भाई जिन लोगों को लेके आते हैं वो लोग जो बातें करते हैं गवर्नमेंट के वो सर के ऊपर से निकल जाती है I mean, they are not the right people at that spot. Contact tracing is baked into your Androids and iOS right now. ठीक है ना? And every other person is having a phone. So I just don't understand where, where, why does the cell tower tracing is more important than the contact tracing itself? Carry on, Omar. The, I will add. I will add. I will add. That contact tracing, which initially they said that cell tower will be done. Later, if you want to do it in a close vicinity, you. को ब्लूटूथ पे करनी पड़ती है एंड देन ब्लूटूथ के अंदर जो है वो आपको अपना कनेक्शन जो है वो शायद ऑन करना पड़ेगा यू हैव टू बी मेक श्योर फिर सारे लोग वो कैसे करेंगे दिस इज वन ऑफ दोज थिंग्स के जिसके अंदर जो है ना अगर मैं कहूं कि जी मैंने हेल्प करनी है या किसी और ने हेल्प करनी है तो उससे काम नहीं चलेगा द एंटायर कम्युनिटी हैज टू टू डू इट तो उस वक्त कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग जो है वो सक्सेसफुल हो सकती है अदरवाइज अगर कुछ लोग भी नहीं करेंगे ना बिल्कुल उसी तरह की चीज है एक महफिल के अंदर सारे लोग मास्क लगा के बैठे हुए हैं एक बंदा बगैर मास्क के वहां पे आ जाता है और वो कहता है कि यार आई डोंट केयर तो यू नो वो सारों का ही बेड़ा गर्क होगा ना तो सर वही बात आती थी ना इट्स एजुकेशन इट्स वो शूर ऑस्ट्रेलिया आपने बिल्कुल सही कहा बिल्कुल सही कहा फोन करके कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग के थ्रू काम कर सकते हैं तो हमारा मुल्क क्या है लेकिन वो बस वो एक एजुकेशन है You know, every the the bug stop is at Gani's boy. Gani guy, Gani boy, के सामने bug stop का. तो एक एक पहले तो let's talk about talk and keep because यहाँ पे जो मैं तो चीज कहना चाह रहा था पिछले रात में मैं complete नहीं कर पाया कि talk and keep जैसे लोग क्यों पाकिस्तान में नहीं कुछ कर पा रहे और क्यों उनको पाकिस्तान कुछ छोड़ के जाना पड़ता है to deliver something. 
it is a serious problem it is not just a problem for us to uh, think about because we are faced with covid but if we have to transform into a knowledge economy unless we figure out the issues in our ecosystem that's holding back our knowledge from being commercialized knowledge economy ke har koi baat kar raha hai par us knowledge ko economy mein plug kis tarah karna hai wo kisi ko nahi samajh aa rahi top se leke niche tak ye har jagah pe problem hai सो uh, so, अभी कुछ आने वाले दिनों में uh, जो मेरा मकसद था इन यूनिवर्सिटीज को मिलने का मुझे एच में लाने का भी मतलब जो मकसद है मैं देखें आई एम नॉट आई बीन पार्ट ऑफ एकेडेमिया फ्रॉम अ वेरी यंग एज आई वाज इन लम्स बट आई एम नॉट एन एकेडेमिक एंड आई एम नॉट ए रिसर्चर और एकेडेमिया में भी जो मैंने लम्स में आई में पढ़ाया वो एज अ पैशन पढ़ाया एज अ हॉबी पढ़ाया आई बीन प्राइमरली पार्ट ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट बैंकिंग आई अंडरस्टैंड ट्रांजेक्शन और मुझे लाने का मकसद एच में यह है कि जो ट्रांजेक्शन एनवायरनमेंट है हमारी जिसकी जो जो बहुत इस वक्त नीड है यूनिवर्सिटीज में अगर आप देखिए हमारी यूनिवर्सिटीज आर स्ट्रगलिंग टू एग्जीक्यूट द ट्रांजेक्शन और एक का जो वर्ड है ऑफिस ऑफ रिसर्च इनोवेशन कमर्शलाइजेशन रिसर्च भी हो रही है अच्छी नॉलेज भी क्रिएट हो रही है इनोवेटिव आइडियाज भी आ रहे हैं पर नॉट टू द लेवल दैट वी वुड लाइक और मैंने किसी भी यूनिवर्सिटी में नहीं देखा कि नीड ड्रिवन कोई एक फॉर्मल प्रोसेस हो इंडस्ट्री से कोई उनकी डेटा कलेक्ट करने का उनकी रिसर्च एंड टेक्नोलॉजी डेवलपमेंट नीड्स को समझने का कहीं पे नहीं और मैंने अभी एक इंस्ट्रूमेंट बना के सारी यूनिवर्सिटीज को दिया है कि आप एक फॉर्मल प्रोसेस तो शुरू करें ना कम अज कम जो आप प्रपोजल्स देते हैं किसी को पहले अपनी आप इंडस्ट्री की नीड्स को समझे उसके मुताबिक अपने रिसर्च प्रपोजल्स को टॉपिक आप पूरी दुनिया का ला सकते हैं आप जीत सकते हैं फंडिंग और उस पर आप कुछ बना सकते हैं पर जब आप इंडस्ट्री के पास लेके जाते हैं इंडस्ट्री कहती है हमारी नीड ही नहीं है तो उसको कमर्शलाइज करना बड़ा मुश्किल है दूसरी चीज क्या हो रही है वहां पे कि जो एजुकेशन कमर्शलाइजेशन की ट्रांजेक्शन देर मल्टीपल वेज यू कैन कमर्शलाइज अ नॉलेज और अ टेक्नोलॉजी यू कुड लाइसेंस एट यू कुड क्रिएट स्पिन ऑफ कंपनी डू अ जे वी फ्रेंचाइज एट यू आई नॉलेज आई कैन यून ट्रेन सर्टिफाई टू कंसल्टेंसी बट ये सारी ट्रांजेक्शन है इनको एग्जीक्यूट करने के लिए Uh, you know, you need to understand how to develop the licensing agreements. अगर आपने एक spin off company बनानी है, मैं आपको बताऊँ, मैंने जिस भी university में जाके researchers से पूछा कि आप spin off companies क्यों नहीं बना रहे? आपके पास जबरदस्त idea है, तो कहते हैं कि हम company बना ही नहीं सकते. Uh, government, you know, government university में हम काम करते हैं, तो हमें allowed ही नहीं है कि हम एक company बना सकें. और वो majority of those people fail to realize कि एक एक company की share holding में आना और उसकी management में आने में कोई फर्क है. तो ये हमारे फैकल्टी का हाल है सो द प्रॉब्लम ये मैं सारी फैकल्टी की बात नहीं कर रहा मेजोरिटी ऑफ द फैकल्टी आई मेट वाज एक्चुअली सेइंग दैट बट लॉट ऑफ योर यूनिवर्सिटीज हैव क्रिएटेड स्पिन ऑफ कंपनीज बेस्ड ऑन आर एंड डी दैट वाज डन बाय फैकल्टी सो हाउ वर दे एबल टू डू इट आई मीन इफ आई एम अ फैकल्टी एंड आई एम अर्निंग सम मनी कांट आई कीप माय मनी पार्क माय मनी इन शेयर्स एंड लेट्स से कंपनी दैट्स कोटेड ऑन ओज पाकिस्तान स्टॉक एक्सचेंज ओज इफ आई कैन टेक शेयर्स ऑफ ओजीटीसी व्हाई कांट आई इन्वेस्ट इन शेयर्स ऑफ अ स्टार्टअप देखिए बहुत सी तो एच एस सी के लेवल पे हम कुछ आने वाले दिनों में आपको कुछ गाइडलाइंस देंगे इनशाला बहुत सी आपकी जो लीडिंग यूनिवर्सिटीज है उनको तो पता है चीजों का बट बहुत सी बाकी यूनिवर्सिटीज हैं वो स्ट्रगल कर रही है फॉर प्रॉफिट पैलेट स्ट्रक्चर यूनिवर्सिटीज में एग्जिस्ट नहीं करते जिसके तो आप प्राइवेट सेक्टर की कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन ला सके टू डिवेलपिंग फिजिकल इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर और टू बी एबल टू कमर्शलाइज योर नॉन फिजिकल योर इनटेंजिबल इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इन टर्म्स ऑफ आई पी एंड ऑल दैट अच्छा डॉक्टर नकीब की जो मैं आपसे बात कर रहा हूँ ये बात है अभी कल रात को हमारी तीन घंटे की कॉल हुई है जताश हुए डॉक्टर नकीब सो डॉक्टर नकीब इज वेरी क्लोज टू मी एंड आई बिन सोर ऑफ हेल्पिंग हिम यू नो ट्राइंग टू गेट इज रूट इन टू पाकिस्तान एंड वेन दिस है टू ऑल द रेलिवेंट मिनिस्ट्रीज सो वी कॉट डॉक्टर फैसल एंड यू नो द एम्बेसडर एंड डॉक्टर जैन एंड you know every uh, relevant person including general ahmed the ed at nih on the call last night and we were trying to convince uh, uh, dr nakeeb to give us an exclusion he secure he's trying to negotiate his uh, ip rights to his ip with some of the leading ph- pharmaceutical companies globally and he has finally agreed and we are now looking to start the clinical trials in nih for which i need to be leaving very soon because the nih team is waiting but <coughs> अब ये आप देखिए एक ऐसा हमारे पास बंदा है जिसने ऐसी टेक्नोलॉजी बना ली है जिसके ऊपर पूरी दुनिया इस वक्त पागल हो रही है और हम इस वक्त अपनी गवर्नमेंट के साथ लड़ रहे हैं कि जी आप इनको आए इनकी आप इनको फंडिंग दें इनके लिए आप क्लिनिकल ट्रायल्स शुरू करें हमें एक प्राइवेट इन्वेस्टर को लाना पड़ा टू फॉर्म अ कंपनी फॉर दैम अभी वो प्रोसेस कम्प्लीट नहीं हुआ बट वो एक बार चीज हो जाती है तो अपनी एक टेक्नोलॉजी भी मौजूद है हमारे पास पैसे भी मौजूद है और हमने गवर्नमेंट को जाकर कहना चाहिए हमें आपसे पैसे नहीं चाहिए ये टेक्नोलॉजी है आप क्लिनिकल ट्रायल्स शुरू करें हम इसको फंड करेंगे with the with the with the promise that once this clin- these clinical trials uh, have achieved the 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 threshold that you want to achieve then the government will u
you know, use this as the primary test okay. to detect okay. COVID and to respond to COVID. So, ये चीजें government को करनी है और last year जो आपने industry academia की linkage के वाले से पिछले question में कहा था, आपने आपको याद होगा ये budget speech में हमारे जैसे साहब ने एक fund announce किया Pakistan Innovation Fund. So, I have designed that fund. And the whole idea of doing that fund was just now one percent telecom dairy universal services fund को by the way pharmaceutical industry भी दे रही है एक percentage drop को जो कुछ नहीं कह रही उस पैसे से आप लोगों के लिए हमने जो concept मैंने जो government को concept दिया आप developing these technologies and we display these technologies and concept was ये सारी industries अब आपने one percent innovation सेस लेना है diaspora आपको पैसे देने को तैयार है बहुत से multilateral से पैसे देने को तैयार हैं आप एक mother fund बनाएं जिसमें आप ये सारी contributions लेके आए और इस फंड के थ्रू आप अपनी वेंचर कैपिटल इंडस्ट्री को खड़ा करें ये ग्रांट पे ग्रांट जो हम दे रहे हैं जहां पे ग्रांट का प्रोसेस खत्म होता है वहां पे अगर आपके प्राइवेट सेक्टर एंड वेंचर कैपिटल इज नॉट रेडी टेक द दो आइडियाज एंड कमर्शियली सस्टेन एंड स्केल दोस आइडियाज एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट मनी विल कंटिन्यू टू गो डाउन द ट्रेन तो ये सारी चीजें हो रही हैं राइट गुड सो आई यू मेंशन द लाइक पॉलिसीज ऑफ ऑरिक सो आई वुड लाइक टू हियर फ्रॉम द ऑरिक डायरेक्टर इटसेल्फ सो हमार डॉक्टर हमार कैन यू Uh, give the perspective of uh, Oric that uh, what kind of problem do we face when we have uh, like a uh, from the HEC side. Um, so I just actually recently took charge, so uh, probably it was that I elaborate nahi kar paunga. But basically, I'm coming from the private sector. Okay, so um, private sector ki universities ki uh, the thing the thinking right now is that we are teaching. प्लेस ठीक है पहली बात तो ये कि रिसर्च का काम ही अभी जबरदस्ती स्टार्ट किया है वो भी एचईसी के कहने पे सबने थोड़ा बहुत करना शुरू किया है अब द थिंकिंग राइट नाउ इज के टू बी एबल टू जनरेट द मनी यू यू कैन जो जो भी मैनेजमेंट के शेयर में आता है वो फीस बढ़ा दो फी इज द ओनली ऑप्शन ऑफ जनरेटिंग मनी राइट नाउ हियर देयर इज देयर वी नीड टू सॉर्ट ऑफ शो द सक्सेस स्टोरीज जो भी बाकी जगह पे हैं या एचईसी के लेवल पे कि दिस इज नॉट द ओनली वे टू जनरेट रेवेन्यू या गवर्नमेंट से पैसे लेना इज नॉट दी ओनली वे ऑफ जनरेटिंग रेवेन्यू यू नीड टू गो टू वेचर कैपिटल जो भी आप काम कर रहे हैं उसको लेके जाके बाहर लेके जाए सो बेसिक बेसिक इशू राइट नाउ इज की हमारी सारी हायर मैनेजमेंट ने कभी ये मॉडल देखा ही नहीं है पहली बात ये कभी उन्होंने रिसर्च नहीं की और दूसरी बात ये उन्होंने कभी कमर्शलाइज नहीं की सो वी कीप गेटिंग स्टक एट वेरियस एरियाज अगर कोई सपोर्ट भी मिलती है तो फिर बाहर इंडस्ट्री इज नॉट जब रिसर्च हुई हुई है तो ये कि वो कमर्शलाइजेबल वैसे ही नहीं है अगर कोई है तो इंडस्ट्री में वो कैपेबिलिटी नहीं है कि वो उसको रियलाइज कर सके और अपनी स्टेप अप कर सके बहुत सी चीजें हमारी हेल्थ केयर इतनी एक्सपेंसिव सिर्फ इसलिए कि हम सब कुछ बाहर से मंगवाते हैं उसके लाइसेंस फीस देते हैं और सारी चीजें बाहर देते हैं इसमें से कोई ऐसी चीज नहीं है जो हम लोकली नहीं बना सकते जिस तरह अभी हमने कहा कि हमने वेंटिलेटर्स वगैरह फॉरन बना लिए इसी तरह हमारे डिफेंस सेक्टर के अंदर हमने क्योंकि सस्टेन फंडिंग थी हमने हर चीज रिवर्स इंजीनियरिंग कर लें रिवर्स इंजीनियरिंग कर लें अब वो भी बहुत है बाहर से बार बार मंगवाना तो नहीं पड़ेगा आप कोई नई चीज ना भी बनाए आप ये ये जो मशीन है अल्ट्रासाउंड की मशीन है ये सारी क्या हम रिवर्स इंजीनियर नहीं करते तो इश्यू इज कि ये अगेन वही प्रायोरिटीज एक तो देखा नहीं है किसी ने आज तक बाहर के जो हमारी यूनिवर्सिटीज है उनकी हायर मैनेजमेंट में कभी रिसर्च नहीं की कभी कमर्शलाइजेशन नहीं की और वो एक जनरेशन गैप है पूरा तो अभी जो भी बाहर से आते हैं वो उस गैप की वजह से स्टक हो जाते हैं मे बी इट विल टेक अनदर टेन ईयर्स बट जैसे जैसे आपके ऊपर वीसी चेंज हो रहे हैं बेहतर आ रहे हैं इट विल गो टू दिस डायरेक्शन बट इट माइट स्टिल टेक अ फ्यू ईयर्स Right. So uh, let's uh, move to the to our third uh, question. So I think we have already talked on uh, uh, on this. So is there any innovative solution in particular that you would like to mention? Uh, that AI, so Dr. Dasha has mentioned uh, about the Dr. Vicky and AI-based diagnosis of cheap and quick infection detection, prediction hotspots, and trends. So in this regard, and uh, yesterday in one of the talk, Dr. Oliver from Germany, uh, he was presenting that they have a one, a COVID one app. So they uh, developed uh, an app uh, and they deployed all over Germany. They asked people to download it, and that was also doing uh, uh, Bluetooth scanning. And with that, they actually tried to um, uh, see that where are the uh, who they did some contact tracing. So why can't we make the contact tracing app? I mean, uh, I, I I say really it's it's hard to imagine that if Germany can do it. I mean, if we well, why why can't we do that? Or if we have some kind of more innovative solution for that? So could you people can mention? 
सर वाई कांट वी मेक द ब्लूटूथ मतलब ट्रेसिंग एप इज दैट योर क्वेश्चन The question is that people in Germany and in Europe they did the same thing. And uh, ha. So, my idea is like everybody would, everybody would sort of I don't know agree or not agree. Okay, the 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 lack of respect for a privacy is the main cause for all this. हमारी कॉम ने ना किसी की प्राइवेसी को प्रोटेक्ट करना सीखा ही नहीं है. एक बंदा अगर एक बंदे की तबीयत खराब हो गई ना तो डेढ़ सौ बंदा तो उसको पूछने चल पड़ेगा द पॉइंट इज दिस एक तो सबसे बड़ा मसला पूरी कॉम और हमारे जर्नलिस्ट को जो है वो बूटों वालों से होता है कि जी वो पता नहीं हमारा कौन सा डेटा निकाल लेंगे और दूसरा मसला सबसे बड़ा होता है कि जी लोग जो है वो दे यू नो के जिस जो ये डेटा गैदर कर रहा है हाउ दे आर गोइंग टू प्रोटेक्ट दिस दिस थर्ड पार्टी डेटा विच दे आर गेटिंग विच इज एक्चुअली वेरी हाईली सेंसिटिव दे कैन पोल एनी इन्फॉर्मेशन इफ दे वॉन्ट टू बिकॉज हमारी पब्लिक में इलिटरेसी रेट क्योंकि इतना हाई है सो वट एवर दे डिमांड दे जस्ट क्लिक एक्सेप्ट एंड लेट द लेट द एप डू इट्स वर्क आई होप आई होप जो यहाँ पे हमारे आई टी के सीनियर्स बैठे हुए हैं दे कैन सॉर्ट ऑफ एग्री विद होल आइडिया डॉक्टर दत्ताश तो अपार्ट फ्रॉम चैलेंजिंग चैलेंजेस ऑफ लाइट से टर्निंग ऑन ब्लूटूथ ऑफ एवरी डिवाइस आई मीन कैन वी डू सम अनदर इन अनदर वे सो आई आई डोंट नो मुझे मुझे ये लगता है कि दिस इज दिस विल रिक्वायर अ लॉट ऑफ मैनुअल एफर्ट टू 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 डू करेक्ट कांटेक्ट ट्रेसिंग इसीलिए इसीलिए जो ना ये वाइडली पॉपुलर इस तरह से नहीं हुई है और बैक एंड के ऊपर बहुत सारी मैनुअल एफर्ट इसके अंदर जाती है और पाकिस्तान में जो है वो सबका सभी मैनुअल किया जा सकता है कि कहीं किसी ने रिपोर्ट कर दिया कि जाके टेस्ट कराया उसका कोविड पॉजिटिव आ गया तो लैब ने जो है वो गवर्नमेंट को रिपोर्ट कर दिया गवर्नमेंट जाएगी ये पूछेगी उससे कि आपने किस किस से मुलाकात की है वो उसके अंदर थोड़ा टेक्नोलॉजी आप एड कर सकते हैं बट यू नो फुली ऑटोमेटेड काइंड ऑफ थिंग ना मुझे ये मुझे ये लगता है कि वो यार नॉट देयर गेट तो इसके अलावा जो है वो वट आई वुड आल्सो लाइक टू मेंशन इज के सिर्फ ये कॉन्टेक्ट ट्रेसिंग वाली बात नहीं है और भी इसके अलावा जो है ना वो लॉट्स ऑफ डायमेंशन जो टेक्नोलॉजी के पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से लोग देख रहे हैं कोविड की वजह से वो सामने आएंगे एक तो बहुत सारी टाइप ऑफ बिजनेस जो है ना जहाँ एक तरफ कुछ बंद हुए हैं होटलिंग का और यू नो रेस्टोरेंट्स का बिजनेस थोड़ा इम्पैक्ट हुआ था दूसरी तरफ बहुत सारे बिजनेस ने बूम भी किया है ऑनलाइन डिजिटल यू नो ई कॉमर्स के बिजनेस जो हैं उनके रेवेन्यूज अगर आप देखें तो कोविड के जमाने में वो चार चार पांच पांच गुना ऊपर चले गए हैं उसके अलावा अगर एकेडमिक पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से अगर देखें तो देर इज ए नंबर ऑफ कॉन्फ्रेंस विच है एंड एड्रेसिंग डिफरेंट एरियाज विच आर रिलेटेड टू हमने भी काफी सारे यहाँ पे काम लम्स के अंदर भी काम काफी सारे नजर आते हैं विच आर इंस्पायर्ड बाय 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 द न्यू एनवायरमेंट और द न्यू नॉर्म And uh, that might include के ये कोविड के अंदर जो है वो लोगों के इम्प्रेशन किस तरह होते हैं फेक न्यूज का बीच में शुरू में जिक्र हुआ था मेरे ख्याल डॉक्टर दान ने जिक्र किया था कि लोग जो है वो uh, उनके बिलीफ सिस्टम जो है वो किस तरीके से इम्पैक्ट होता है और यू नो हाउ पीपल टेक दीज दीज न्यूज के बाकी वजू करने से कोविड जो है वो खत्म हो जाएगा पाकिस्तान में इसलिए खत्म हो गया है या uh, या कोविड जो है वो ये ये यहूदियों की साजिश है ये यू नो दीज काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स ये तो खैर ये ये तो इनका वो सोशल टाइप ऑफ यू नो एनालिसिस है ना लेकिन यू कैन डू ए सॉर्ट ऑफ वेरी टेक्निकल काइंड ऑफ सेंटीमेंट एनालिसिस के जो लोग पोस्टिंग कर रहे हैं फेसबुक के ऊपर ट्विटर के ऊपर इंस्टाग्राम के ऊपर उसके ऊपर जो है लोगों के रिस्पॉन्सिस किस तरह से आते हैं वट पीपल टेक आउट ऑफ दैट लोग अपने जो है बिलीफ सिस्टम को कैसे करते हैं उसके अलावा देर इज ए लॉट ऑफ अदर टेक्नोलॉजीज जो न्यू एंड अपकमिंग कॉन्फ्रेंसिस वर्कशॉप के अंदर जो है वो लोग इसके ऊपर देख रही हैं मिसाल के तौर पे ट्रांसपोर्टेशन नेविगेशन के अंदर जो है वो अगर आप देखें यू नो ट्राई टू ट्राई टू आइडेंटिफाई द पॉकेट्स हॉटस्पॉट पॉकेट्स जिसको हम कह रहे हैं उनको आइडेंटिफाई करें एंड यू नो पाथ पॉइंट ए से पॉइंट बी के दरमियान पाथ एवरी वन यूज गूगल मैप्स या एपल मैप्स या जो भी मैप्स आप इस्तेमाल करते हैं हाउ टू गो फ्रॉम पॉइंट ए टू पॉइंट बी बाई अवॉइडिंग दीज हॉट बिजनेस स्केजुलिंग के अंदर विजिट स्केजुलिंग के अंदर आप किस तरीके से जो है वो लोगों को आपने स्केजुल करने डॉक्टर की अपॉइंटमेंट बहुत सारी ऑनलाइन होती है देर इज सर्विस इन पाकिस्तान बट यू जस्ट जस्ट वॉन्ट टू मेक श्योर की ओवरलैप बिटवीन द पेशेंट जो है वो मिनिमम हो जाए इट रिक्वायर्स अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी बट 
थोड़ा सा थोड़ी सी एफर्ट होती है वो लोग कर रहे हैं उस तरह का काम भी कर रहे हैं सोशल डिस्टेंसिंग के सोल्यूशन को अगर आप देख लें कोविड कोविड की ट्रांसमिशन के लिए लोगों ने मशीन लर्निंग मॉडल्स तक डेवलप कर लिए हुए हैं उसके ऊपर कितने वो अच्छे हैं कितने नहीं है इट इज वेरी हार्ड टू से बिकॉज देखिए यहाँ पे ग्राउंड ट्रूथ हमारे पास लेना जो है ना बड़ा डिफिकल्ट है एंड द रीजन फॉर दैट इज के आपको जहाँ पे भी ह्यूमन सब्जेक्ट आते हैं आपको उसके अंदर जो है यू नो इंस्टीट्यूशनल रिव्यू बोर्ड्स की अप्रूवल लेनी पड़ती है किसी भी तरह की रिसर्च करने के लिए कई दफा जो है ना वो ग्रे एरिया के अंदर चीज होती है तो लोग कर भी जाते हैं कंप्यूटर विजन को कैसे यूज कर सकते हैं डायग्नोसिस ऑफ कोविड 19 डॉक्टर नकीब का भी पहले जिक्र आया वहां उस तरह का एफर्ट्स फॉर द फॉर द डिटेक्शन ऑफ 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 कोविड वो एम वाली एक एप्लीकेशन का मैंने जिक्र किया था पहले um, उसके अलावा सिक्योरिटी प्राइवेसी का जो है अभी डॉक्टर अदान ने जिक्र किया कि सिक्योरिटी और प्राइवेसी के इशूज होते हैं हेल्थ केयर डेटा जो है इट इज कंसिडर टू बी यू नो हिपा कंप्लाइंस जो अमरीका के अंदर तो खैर बहुत ज्यादा ही यू नो इट इज कंसिडर टू बी वेरी वेरी रिलीजियस थिंग कि आप लोगों का हेल्थ केयर डेटा जो है उसको प्रोटेक्ट करके रखें पाकिस्तान में इतना ज्यादा नहीं होता लेकिन uh, अगर किसी को कोविड है तो यू नो सोशल स्टिग्मा बन जाता है शुड दिस बी रिलीज दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन बी रिलीज टू समी एल्स और समी नॉट सो प्राइवेसी के इसके अंदर काफी सारे इशूज आ जाते हैं uh, ये ये सारी की सारी चीजें जो है ना मुख्तलिफ वर्कशॉप कॉन्फ्रेंसिस के अंदर जो है ना लोग पिछले चंद महीनों के अंदर न्यू कॉन्फ्रेंसेस डेवलप हो गई वर्कशॉप्स डेवलप हो गई एंड आई गेट सरप्राइज कि इतनी सारी चीजों के ऊपर ना लोग काम कर रहे हैं इनफैक्ट um, ये मिस इंफॉर्मेशन जर्नल एक हार्वर्ड वाले पब्लिश करते हैं उन्होंने अभी रिसेंटली अपनी एक कॉल क्लोज की है कि जिसके ऊपर जो है ना मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन अबाउट कोविड नाइनटीन जो है वो कि किस तरह से प्रोपिकेट हुई है um, to send something there. हमारा काम खत्म नहीं हुआ था तो हम नहीं भेज सके वहां पर um but uh, but really i mean these are these are all the issues which can be um at least main ye nahi keh sakta kehna chahta ke solve karenge unko using technology but you know by using technology you can get more awareness about that issues thode se deep deep down usko aur ja sakte hain aur maybe you will learn something new something interesting um kuch fayde wali cheez bhi mil jaye ho sakta hai bahut sari cheeze fayde wali na bhi ho sirf wo ek pleasant exercise ho वेरी एकेडेमिक एक्सरसाइज हो सकता है कोई चीज उसमें से काम की भी मिल जाए आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू हाईलाइट ये एक ए आई बेस्ड कॉवरेट के नाम से नाइकॉप वालों ने नीकॉप वालों ने किया था जस्ट एक्सरे से उन्होंने अभी डी रैप ने फर्स्ट ए आई बेस्ड डायग्नोस्टिक अप्रूव कराया सो देर आर सक्सेस स्टोरीज जो कि हाईलाइट करनी चाहिए हमें तो इट्स इट्स नॉट इम्पॉसिबल टू एक्चुअली गेट दिस थिंग्स डन थ्रू टेक्नोलॉजी वो और वो लोकल डेटा पे भी उन्होंने हैज बीन डन टेस्टेड बाय पीसी जो कि आई डोंट नो व्हाई पीसी का इससे क्या ताल्लुक था बट पीसी के थ्रू पहले गया और फिर डी रैप ने उन्हें तीन जगह पे इंडिपेंडेंट क्लिनिकल टेस्ट करवाए हैं अब ये थोड़ी सी तो वो जो मेडिकल डेटा की बात हो रही है कि अब वो एक्सरे इंफेक्शन के कितने दिन बाद लिया गया है दैट इज स्टिल अ लिटिल सॉर्ट ऑफ क्वेश्चन मार्क क्योंकि वो हमारे हमारे पास कांटेक्ट ट्रेसिंग इतनी अच्छी नहीं है हमें नहीं पता चलता कितने दिन पहले हुआ था um or actually to, but but still there are things that is good progress cake for for now jis tarah ka tha pehle policy hi nahi thi ai wali now mm-hmm. we have at least a policy uh, how to make biomedical devices uh, using technology jo ke mm-hmm. you just follow those 14 steps i believe umar might remember mere pas purani draft padi hai uski um and you 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 have a way to commercialize that which is a good first step and i think everybody should at, or usko widely uh, दिखाना चाहिए यूनिवर्सिटी में भेजना चाहिए कि कैसे आपने किसी बायोमेडिकल डिवाइस को कमर्शलाइज uh, कराना है वो सारे स्टेप्स फॉलो करें सो दैट्स अ गुड थिंग दैट हैपेंड बिकॉज ऑफ दिस इमरजेंसी सो थैंक यू वेरी मच लेट मी समराइज डिस्कशन वो डॉक्टर Uh, if we should have a respect for the disease, and if we should take serious measures. Uh, if we all uh, take care of this, then only then we can actually succeed. And Dr. Adnan, he mentioned that we should uh, uh, the need to tackle disinformation, and then the literacy is also uh, uh, a problem in that. And industry should scale up, and we need our mindset. Uh, we need a new mindset to tackle this uh, pandemic. and uh, umar has uh, pointed out that, uh, that there were some good news coming from umar that uh, they will be giving some policies so that the 
universities they have uh, some uh, spin off mechanism and related uh, and the university should uh, define their own uh, research priority so i would like to thank all of you uh, and and uh, only one thing that i missed that dr hamad also mentioned that we should uh, do some at least reverse engineering to at least save uh, for next decade and we can do it quite easily so thank you i would like to thank all of the panelists uh, so we have a nice discussion uh, i will initiate the design for one hour we have a discussion of one hour and uh, 10 minutes so i really thank all of you so now i will pass uh, the mic to rehan uh, for further activity thank you janab thank you sir Uh, Rehan, are you there in the session? Uh, sir, he is here. He is trying to connect in one minute. Dr. Amir, are we free to go? This is Dr. Zatash. Sure, sir. You will just he have can... to close the remarks from uh, Dr. Vakar. Okay, Vakar sahab, se, Vakar sahab, ka sun lete hai, wo kya kehti hai. Uh, Dr. Amir, I want to request you to please present the virtual shields to the panel panelists. Okay, now we will present a virtual shield to our panelists. So, Dr. Datash. Thank you. Dr. Adnan, uh, Umar, and Dr. Hamad. This is my own sheet. This is great. Thank you very much, Dr. Amir. Hello and Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I warmly welcome you all to a very short closing ceremony of two days international conference on open source systems and technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope it was a wonderful experience. It was a huge learning experience indeed for our team and uh, for everybody here. And uh, obviously, we have so much to learn. Uh, this is a very short closing ceremony of the two days international conference. So before we move on, I would uh, humbly request Mr. Shahzeb Rato, he, if he's with us, he's chair IEEE Lahore section. So, uh, house uh, floor is yours, sir. Uh, if you'd like to say a few words. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच अस्सलाम वालेकुम बिस्मिल्लाह अस्सलाम रहीम आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू सी ऑल ऑफ यू हियर एंड यू हैव डन मैग्निफिसेंट जॉब ऑफ ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस एंड मेनी टॉपिक्स वर वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग ऑल दो अवर आई थिंक दैट आई बी सर्विसेज एंड इंटरनेट सर्विसेज आर नॉट वेरी गुड सो दैट एवरी वन इज एबल टू सी एवरी वन and sometimes sound uh, quality was not good uh, i tripuri lahor section is very um, uh, happy to uh, uh, sponsor this conference uh, and uh, we want to see more and more research activities going on in our section and i especially thank dr bakar um, dr uh, bashir uh, Uh, Kashif Bashir for their hard work, Hamza, and yourself uh, for providing wonderful services uh, to uh, this session um, uh, to our section. And I encourage everyone to join I Triple E. Um, uh, students are also encouraged to join, and I want to see more and more people uh, becoming senior members and fellows uh, from our section. right now in pakistan there are very few fellows uh, ieee fellow also uh, whenever i looked at ieee transactions i see very few papers coming out of universities from pakistan and uh, i encourage the students and our uh, research community to perform research so that more and more pakistanis participate in ieee uh, research activities and their papers are published and i was listening that certain people were discussing i forgot the name and apologize for that uh, about that uh, research activities in pakistan are limited and there are no funding uh, let me tell you i can tell you very briefly my story i used to work in usa uh, for a company in uh, cyber and communication security i came to this country started my own company and alhamdulillah Uh, our equipment is being widely used all across Pakistan, and there were no doubt it was doing research was slightly more difficult than it would have been in US. Uh, but again, there are a lot of people who uh, are willing to support you, uh, and uh, there are certain uh, whenever you go to some company or go to some organization and explain them what you are doing in this. Uh, country uh, they are more sympathetic than that would be uh, in us to any other entrepreneur so i uh, once again the, the your conference job was uh, very well organized and i thank you all and uh, with these words i let you go and inshallah we want to see more and more conferences uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thank you very much, Mr. Shahzeb Brato. So, ladies and gentlemen, we had uh, uh, Chairman uh, I Triple E Lahore Section, Mr. Shahzeb Brato, with us. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us. It was lovely having you here. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, uh, tried to prepare a short uh, video of what has happened in this two days activity. Uh, let's have a glimpse of uh, what has happened in the two days conference. Uh, so, many of uh, faces we have here are photogenic, but let's see. uh whose faces are captured by the camera so ladies and gentlemen let's have a look at the video
It looks as if there is a technical issue, but we are trying to fix it. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you all to Forty's IEEE iCost. The institute is known for its applied research and development activities in the area of information and communication technologies. AI technologies are considered to be most demanding technologies of the current century. I think it will be an excellent opportunity for students, researchers, academia. iCast 2020 provides a unique opportunity for researchers. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm really delighted that our team really did a great job, especially team ICOST, who is here in the control room. Um, I, I would uh, like to appreciate the team. And before any further delay, I would request, I would humbly request the man who is behind uh, organizing international conference on open source systems and technologies, and the man who is an inspiration for all of us. I would humbly request Director of Cosby Institute of Computer Science, Dr. Vakar Mahmood, to say a few words. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rehan, can you hear us? So very loud and clear. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, I have shared uh, some slides. Uh, can you also see them? Okay, so Thank you very much for the uh, for the uh, efforts, uh, especially the organizing committee. Uh, there has been tireless efforts going on uh, uh, for the last, uh, I would say, three months. Uh, but very intensive uh, during the last two weeks, three weeks time frame uh, when the organization was picking pace. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Amir for uh, wonderfully hosting the sessions, especially the uh, invited sessions, uh, and very skillfully, of course, uh, managing the requirements that were uh, that were due to uh, to have a successful event. Uh, this was the first. This was the first. Uh, ever uh, effort by uh, XUAT to host a, a virtual conference of this size. We did uh, uh, with, uh, in the past uh, host some uh, uh, single day seminars uh, with uh, very few presentations, but this was a full conference uh, with a full detailed activity. And of course, the uh, uh, you, in the video you probably have seen uh, very quickly uh, the uh, exposition, which was also uh, managed virtually. This was done through the VR, uh, VR, AR uh, research team and uh, Rehan's uh, SMS team together. So I think these these are all efforts which are put together, making it it's such a nice event. Uh, from the perspective of uh, going through the uh, closing activity uh, today, uh, I have been asked to also talk about a little bit on Al Khwarizmi Institute for the uh, for the listeners, some of the speakers who are available to us with us at this time. Um, and also uh, summarize a little bit on, on what has happened in the past uh, today and yesterday in these two days. Uh, from the Institute perspective, uh, uh, this was established uh, in 2002, so it has now grown up uh, to a level we, we have uh, now almost uh, uh, 300 plus researchers. So this has been a journey which uh, 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 which we have uh, followed through uh, with uh, efforts from all participants, especially uh, the managers uh, in different labs. They have really contributed uh, in the growth of the institute. Uh, this was established uh, some in 2002 for 
conducting research uh, in the practical applied domain working with industry. So the idea was to, to, to work as an interface to the uh, industrial sector in, in Pakistan, especially in the ICT's domain. And then uh, and do uh, re research in collaboration with uh, projects in collaboration with industry and also work with the international research organizations. So the uh, institute has uh, been able to uh, conduct those projects over the years. So the growth has been phenomenal in, in the perspective that we have uh, we have uh, experienced some 10 percent uh, year over year growth over the past uh, decade. Uh, in terms of our research funding, in terms of our research labs, in terms of our HR strength, in terms of our publications, in, and in terms of our research areas and expertise. Uh, the Institute uh, has the strength uh, in, from, in the perspective of working on local problems. So we have tried to focus on more local problems and, and find solutions, technological solutions, while collaborating with international partners. So this has been our main strength, and we have been able to uh, sustained growth uh, even during this year, uh, which was uh, hard hit by the, the COVID issue. Uh, we had to uh, move uh, in an online mode uh, and uh, uh, away from campus mode for almost uh, two to two and a half months straight. Uh, and that really uh, caused issues in terms of delivering some of the projects, but uh, still uh, we are on track. Uh, uh, we did face some uh, financial difficulty, but we are, uh, we are kind of recovering. So the institute has uh, has done well, um, and recently, uh, yesterday also, we were uh, given the opportunity to present the institute uh, at a ceremony where the uh, study conducted by Islamic Development Bank uh, was uh, 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 was presented, and the and the book was inaugurated. Uh, the Islamic Development Bank, to, together with Higher Education Commission, conducted a study last year. And then they, uh, they mapped resources from Pakistan uh, to work with other resources in the Islamic world. And they, uh, they, uh, they had selected four areas in, uh, in from Pakistan. They included agricultural technologies, industries related to agricultural technologies, uh, plus uh, biotechnology and uh, information and communication technologies. So in all these four areas, they, uh, they selected a few institutes and organizations, both in public and private sector. Uh, those have done uh, significant work uh, over the past years and are uh, capable of providing help to other uh, fellow institutes within uh, Islamic world and also uh, maybe gain uh, from the advanced uh, part of the Islamic world countries. So out of the uh, four selected ICT centers, uh, they selected KICS to present the, the Pakistan uh, position in terms of IT research at the Islamic Development Bank level. So I'm very uh, glad to share that uh, the institute was presented there. And we are now asked to uh, uh, to locate uh, uh, similar institutes in, uh, in the Islamic world, especially in Malaysia, Turkey, Indonesia, and then also in, in, in the Gulf. And then uh, there may be opportunities of uh, funding from Islamic Development Bank uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of joint projects which can help uh, these countries so this 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 has been a good news to share and it came on the first day of our conference uh, and the ceremony was uh, chaired by the president of islamic development bank himself uh, dr bandar hajar uh, and um, and then it was also participated uh, by the uh, by the minister of economic affairs divisions and higher education uh, commission's uh, executive director was also there uh, and then there was another study that was conducted by uh, HEC uh, in collaboration with Knowledge Platform. In fact, it was conducted by Knowledge Platform, and, and then it was endorsed by HEC uh, and British Council. And in that study, this was also conducted a year, uh, year and a half ago, uh, they selected uh, KICS again as a pioneer research organization in, in Pakistan, which is, uh, which is providing a paradigm change uh, in terms of research output from universities. Uh, so the main thing that we are uh, kind of able to uh, bring to the table uh, from the perspective of research uh, from the Institute is, is that we focus on, on local problems. Uh, we do publish, of course, we love to publish because that gives the recognition. Uh, but our main uh, strength has been to uh, find solutions of our local problem and then uh, on the way uh, we find opportunities to publish and also uh, get that kind of recognition as well. So that has really helped us uh, take a position in 
uh, as a pioneer research organization uh, in the study by British Council and Knowledge Platform. Uh, these are a, a number of research uh, labs that are at this time uh, uh, available, vibrant research labs uh, which are operating. Uh, they are uh, they are headed by individual managers who look after the uh, activities of the lab. They are responsible for also bringing in funding uh, from research, from consultation, from training, and so on. Uh, and then you probably you see that there's there's a big focus on AI technologies. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, recently uh, conducted industrial automation, uh, inducted industrial automation in our, in our domain. So three, four labs are in that area. Communication technologies is, are coming along. And then we have also uh, uh, various centers of expertise uh, which are operating, uh, and then specialized centers for training. So this is about uh, Al Khwarizmi. I think I, I'll just uh, move on from from here. Uh, looking at the conference in terms of statistics, uh, we had this year about 176 submissions, uh, which is a very good number uh, to to ICAST. And we uh, we were uh, receiving papers from uh, US, Europe. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, Africa, uh, China, uh, South, A uh, South Asia, uh, specific, uh, Asia specific region. So we uh, we did receive a variety of papers, especially from international uh, countries. There were a large submission this time. Uh, in the uh, evaluation committee, which uh, consisted of 129 members, uh, the technical uh, committee, uh, which had 50 international experts and 79 from Pakistan, they selected only 20%. Uh, so this makes us very, uh, very selective conference. So 35 papers were selected and they are, they are presented today and yesterday. They were presented in, in addition to the invited talks, uh, which came from uh, many uh, countries like the, include US, Germany, Netherlands, and then so on. And then we also had some national invited talks. Uh, as far as the exhibition, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we went uh, virtual this time uh, for the conference. So we also arranged in uh, 3D, 3D virtual exhibition. Uh, we, 16 of the labs from al uh, uh they demonstrated their projects. Uh, you could actually have a live chat with the manager of the lab. If you had questions, there were, uh, there were demos, there were videos available. Uh, so this was a nice platform that was uh, made available. Then we had industrial showcasing, about 18 industries showcased their uh, products with us. Uh, we have been having very good uh, viewership. Uh, social media statistics show about 6,000 plus views, uh, including Facebook and YouTube. And, uh, and they are uh, the traffic, top traffic countries regions in the last 24 hours, about 84,000 uh, views that came from uh, for, the, uh, for the conference. So this is, I think, uh, a significant presence. Uh, opening ceremony, as have you seen in the, uh, in the video, uh, we had uh, Governor of Punjab, message, uh, message from uh, Charlie Mohammed Sarwar. So he was the chief guest, and we also had a message from Brother Yasser Humayun uh, the Minister for Punjab Higher Education, uh, Provincial Minister, the Chairman for uh, Punjab Higher Education Commission, Dr. Sayyid Mansur Sarwar, uh, Vice Chancellor UVT Lahore, uh, also from uh, from Dr. Nasheen Hamid, uh, who is MNA and Parliamentary Secretary of our Ministry of National Health Services. Uh, she uh, gave her message. Uh, in our day one, we had uh, track one where uh, we uh, we had invited talks and chaired by Dr. Amir. Uh, first talk was from Dr. Mazum, uh, who's at the Watson Research uh, in USA. Uh, he talked about applying uh, machine learning to cybersecurity data, a case study for behavior analysis. Uh, and then we had a talk from uh, Claudio uh, from Italy, advances in uh, deep uh, randomized neural networks. Uh, Dr. Abdul Wayed, who's, who's also worked with us in the high performance lab, uh, we had a talk from him in monitoring the clouds using open source components. Uh, then the session 1B, which was a parallel session, uh, uh, had the papers uh, uh, from uh, researchers presented, about 10. And this session was uh, managed by, uh, chaired by Dr. Ghalib. Uh, and the title was Artificial Intelligence and Cybersecurity. Uh, on the day one in the afternoon, uh, the, uh, the track to a cybersecurity and COVID. 19, Dr. Ahmed chaired the session. We had a presentation from Dr. Melanie from uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands. Uh, she's a CEO of a uh, radically open security company. Uh, she talked about pen testing chat ops. And then we had a uh, talk uh, from uh, Professor Oliver Holfield uh, on the internet user behavior during COVID-19. Uh, he is from Germany. Uh, in the parallel session, uh, papers were submitted, uh, presented about six. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Tahir, 
uh, chaired the session, and the title was Communication Systems, Networks, and Deep Learning. Uh, today, uh, in the morning, uh, the first session, uh, which is track 3A, uh, was on computer vision, uh, and it was uh, chaired by Dr. Oswan Hari. Uh, we had three invited talks. Uh, first one was from uh, Dr. From Dr. Giorgio Coe, uh, who is uh, who is a DA at DLP, which is a distinguished lecturer uh, in, uh, from IEEE. He talked about uh, the uh, variable sensor data to predict COVID-19. Uh, and he's affiliated in, uh, uh, with the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, California. Uh, then we had a talk from Mr. Seiler, uh, who is the uh, AI expert strategist in, uh, in the Middle Eastern uh, operations of Huawei technologies. He talked about the SN to progressive intelligence. He talked about the, uh, the hardware uh, specializations that are coming out uh, at the edge computing and at, at, as well as at the core uh, computing for AI-specific uh, architectures. Uh, then we had a talk from Dr. Junaid Kaudir from ITU. Uh, he did a talk on ethics of art artificial intelligence. Uh, and in the parallel session, uh, we had 10 papers uh, presented on computer vision and health informatics. By, and, and the session was chaired by Dr. Sheikh Faisal. And in the afternoon today, uh, fourth session, Dr. Swan Gini, uh, there were two invited talks. Uh, first one was from Professor Ying Liu. Bridging the gap between lab grade technologies and the practical challenges. Uh, she's with the Center for Image and Information Processing, Ministry of Public Security, China. Uh, and then we conducted a panel, uh, which, which just got concluded and moderated, uh, very tactfully moderated by Dr. Ahmed Mabul. And I really thank all the panelists for uh, bringing up their, uh, uh, their thoughts, their ideas, and, and their concerns uh, on, the, on the very important topic that was discussed. And in parallel, uh, we were having the session uh, of paper presentation. About nine papers were presented, uh, chaired by Dr. Aliyah Madhagar. And the session uh, title was Software and System in Machine Learning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are a few snapshots of the 3D uh, visuals that was uh, created for the uh, exposition. Uh, there were booths got set up by different labs in the virtual environment uh, in a 3D mode. And you could really talk, walk and talk to uh, the manager over there, um, and then also view different uh, uh, different videos and, uh, uh, and other displays that were made available. So this was the first attempt, and it was a wonderful attempt. I really thank and congratulate the uh, the teams which worked on it, the ARVR team and, and Rehan's team. And this is the control room uh, where the conference is being uh, managed, and they have worked uh, really very hard. Uh, during the past few days, they have been uh, leaving after midnight, uh, taking care of everything. Uh, we have volunteers uh, from IEEE, especially Hansa, who helped us out with the WebEx. And then uh, there are so many uh, individuals who made a tremendous contribution in uh, making the conference uh, uh, at this level, which, which was a technological challenge as well as organizational challenge for us. And it, it went through very well, and especially congratulations to Dr. Ahmed for uh, managing a, a, a very wonderful uh, program yesterday and today. Uh, and uh, it all went very well. The technical team, uh, especially the IT team, which kept the uh, systems running all around. Uh, and before that, uh, the, uh, the, the technical program committee, headed by Dr. Ghalib, uh, they did very hard work in terms of uh, sorting out the, the best paper, working with uh, the reviewers all, all, around, all over the world, and then trying to get the reviews in time. And then the management team uh, uh, in, from the decision side, uh, Kashif uh, Bashir has worked hard in, in uh, putting everything together from coordination perspective. Akil Babar and his team, uh, they really worked very well in terms of helping out the technical uh, team to make all uh, the uh, uh, the events and also all of the tasks uh, completed on time. So with, with these words, uh, I would like to uh, say thank to all the participants and the organizers especially. Uh, who worked hard to uh, very hard to make this uh, event a very successful event. Uh, Vice Chancellor asked me that uh, you can hold more conferences if you are uh, not going to spend money in a, on on when you hold a conference in, in virtual mode. So maybe we uh, we save money in terms of the expenses that we uh, we we incur while we bring in individuals from across the world uh, as invited speakers or. And we also uh, host, uh, host dinners and uh, and also play travel and and, and 
uh, other expenses. But the, on the other hand, uh, we save those expenses, but the the amount of work that is required to conduct a conference like this has actually increased manifold. Uh, so there are some technical challenges that are handled. Uh, uh, it is uh, maybe feeling comfortable that we, from our offices, we are attending this conference. But on the other hand, there's a lot of hard work that has went, uh, gone into it from the technical perspective. So I really like to thank all those who have uh, uh, made this conference a success uh, from the perspective of uh, technology, from the perspective of uh, having uh, a, a very good view of uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, stalls and the uh, exposition that we that we manage in the uh, 3D exposition, and also uh, working hard to bring in the messages from uh, from the dignitaries uh, who participated in our open opening uh, ceremony. So, with all these, I thank you all and and God bless. Thank you very much, Dr. Vakar Mahmood, for an, ins an insightful brief of the conference and a thanking note. I would like to thank you and congratulate you indeed for a, a dynamic leadership that you provided and this conference happened just because of your leadership. Um, uh, this formally concludes the two days conference on open source systems and technologies, but I have a few announcements to make. Uh, certificates, e-certificates indeed, will be uh, sent to the respective email IDs of uh, the participants. Uh, moreover, recorded sessions of uh, this two days conference are available on uh, Facebook pages and YouTube channels of uh, Al Khwarizmi Institute of Computer Science, uh, iCost pages, and UET News. So, uh, all I wish is this uh, that the pandemic will be over soon and this isolation will be over soon. I'll be gathered, we'll be gathered uh, under one roof, inshallah, in next year. Uh, so, I would request the organizing committee, Dr. Ahmed Mahmood, uh, Mr. Kasim Bashir, all, all the management committee here to please gather right in front of uh, Al-Khwarizmi Institute of Computer Science main building so that we can have a group photo. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being very patient. Thank you.